knows that of all the different sciences, it probably takes the longest to prepare because there's so many different components that go into it, especially that if you are speaking uh, uh, in, in English because you have the additional that factor of translation and that sometimes you have to look at several translations to uh, get the wording that you want. You also have to look then at the basic meanings of the words, you have to look at the grammar, and then you have to go and look at what the various scholars have said uh, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book. So this is our attempt to just to provide some brief reflections upon uh, this, this great surah and in hopes of in the blessed month of Ramadan it will be a means of us to connect to the revelation that was sent to our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book and there's no better time to do so. And one of the great du'as that our Prophet made about the Quran is that he asked Allah to make it the spring of our hearts. And so, that inshallah, Allah Ta'ala will attach our hearts that to His book, bless us to be able to read it, bless us to be able to strive to understand it, and bless us to be able to put it into practice, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. So, Surah Yaseen, this is the 36th chapter of the Qur'an. And the scholars first begin by, when they speak about any chapter of the Qur'an, determining whether it is that a surah that is Makkiya or Madaniya. And that distinction is one of whether it was revealed that after the Hijrah or before the Hijrah. So the migration of the Prophet ﷺ, which was done in the 13th year of the Hijrah, that a surah that is Makkiya was revealed that before the Hijrah. And a surah that is Madaniya was revealed after the Hijrah. And sometimes that you have a chapter in the Quran that will have verses that are um, Madaniya and verses that are Makkiya. And generally speaking, the scholars are in agreement that Surah Yasin is a Surah that is Makkiya. And the only exception that they potentially make to that is the 12th verse. Uh, some of them say that that particular verse is Madani because it relates to Bani Salima and that we will talk about this when we get to this verse but they were a the tribe of the Ansar, a clan of the Ansar that lived quite far from the Prophet's Masjid and they wanted to abandon their homes and move closer to the Masjid and the Prophet that told them to remain where they were because that they were getting immense reward for all of the steps that they took in order to that get to the Masjid. But other than that, that the scholars in agreement that it is a that surah that is Makkiya. And there are clear themes in the Meccan surahs just as there's clear themes in the Medinan surahs. And when you get into the more advanced books of Ulum al-Quran is that you can start to find signs that if you find that particular sign it's a sign that it is a Meccan surah or it is a Medinan surah. And that generally speaking surah Yasin is along the lines of the themes of the Meccan Surahs. It speaks a lot about the power of Allah. It speaks about Tawheed. It speaks about Allah Jalla Jalalu. It speaks about prophethood. It speaks about the hereafter. All of which are common themes of the early Surahs that were revealed to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam. Surah Yasin has a total of 83 verses. As for its name, that it takes its name simply from the very first verse, which is Yasin. And we will get into that more about what that means when we actually get to the tafsir part. So it takes its name from the very first verse, which are these two letters in the Arabic language, the Ya and the Sin, and then combined, Yasin. And then when it comes to Tajweed, there's two different ways the scholars mention that that can be recited. As for the various narrations of the Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, about this blessed chapter, there are many. And some of the narrations, there's weakness in them, other narrations are stronger. But we know collectively, because there is so many narrations, is that it is a sign that this is a chapter that has great merit. And there's no doubt about that. And we'll look at a few of them when you get into some of the later works that compile that all of the early narrations. There's actually that quite a few. And so the first one is a hadith narrated by Imam al-Darimi. And the Prophet ﷺ has said, "Inni li kulli shayin qalba." 
Indeed, everything has a heart. وَإِنَّ قَلْبِ الْقُرْآنِ yasin. And indeed, the heart of the Qur'an is Yaseen. And this hadith finishes by saying, مَنْ قَرَأَهَا فَكَأَنَّمَا قَرَأَ الْقُرْآنَ عَشْرَ مرات. Whoever recites this chapter is as if that they have completed the Qur'an ten times in terms of its reward. So focusing upon this idea, and there's multiple narrations even about this idea of the Qur'an, uh, Yaseen being the qalb of the Qur'an, the heart of the Qur'an. Generally speaking, the scholars say, is because Yasin addresses the central themes of the Qur'an, the central teachings of the Qur'an, which is that Allah, prophethood, and the hereafter. When we get into a more drawn-out understanding of the themes of the Qur'an that proposed by Ibn Juzay, he adds a few more categories. He says that there are seven overarching themes of the Qur'an. Is that the first is the uluhiyah, that which pertains to Allah, the verses that pertain to Allah, and including His essence, His attributes, and His actions. The verses that pertain to nubuwa, prophethood. And then the verses that pertain to the ma'ad, which is the hereafter. Literally, the return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he adds a few more categories as well. He talks about the wa'ad and the wa'id, and the ahkam and the qisas that the verses is verses where in which there are some form of promise, whether that's a promise in this world or the next, a verse in which there is some type of warning, whether again that is in this world or the next, and then the verses of the ahkam, of the legal rulings, and then the final category is the qasas, is the stories. And so, according to Ibn Juzay, that all of the different verses in the Qur'an will fit into one of these categories. And again, that is a... Uh, that topic in and of itself that you could go into great detail. But if you were to present the meanings of the Qur'an to a Muslim who doesn't really know, or someone who wants to learn more about our faith, this is one of the greatest ways to do it, is that you speak about the themes of the Qur'an. And once you speak about these overarching themes, it really helps then for people to understand that what the Book of Allah Ta'ala is really all about. And um, I've done this in an interfaith gathering, uh, or actually it wasn't really an interfaith gathering, there was a group of people that came to attend a khutbah, and I spoke about these seven themes, and the response was, was great, not because of me, but because of the ingenuity of that Ibn Juzay and his classification of the themes. It, it was for the first time those that listened to it that they said that they felt that they could understand what the Qur'an was really all about by talking about its themes. But here, when we talk about Yasin being the heart of the Qur'an, generally speaking, the scholars say, as was mentioned, it's because that it addresses the central teachings. And that there are that clusters of verses in this chapter that deal with that Allah, prophethood, and the hereafter, and other topics as well. And there are others who offered a more uh, mystical, if you will, explanation of it, and that they say that if Yasin is the qalb of the Qur'an, if Yasin is the heart of the Qur'an, what then is the qalb of Yasin? What then is the heart of Yasin? They say it's the verse, Salamun qawlin man rabbin rahim. That peace, a word from a merciful Lord. Salamun qawlin man rabbin rahim. And that this is mentioned in the tafsir of uh, Ibn Ajiba. He says that this is an indication of what he calls the sirr qurba the secret of proximity to Allah, which is what the Qur'an calls to, وَعَلَيْهِ مَدَارُ And this is the whole purpose of it. It's ultimately for us to draw near to Him. And we should remind ourselves of this. Every time that we read the Qur'an, every time that we study the Qur'an, every time we learn the Qur'an, the whole purpose of the Qur'an is for you and I to come to know our Lord. And the Qur'an is there to teach us exactly how to do that. Everything that we need, were we to be alone on an island and only have the Book of Allah in the Sunnah of the Messenger وسلم, that would be 100% sufficient for us to have everything that it is that we need to draw near to our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if Yasin is the heart of the Qur'an, that this verse, Salamun Qawlum and Rabban Rahim, is the heart of Yasin. And you can only imagine that when the believers that receive this, because is that Allah Taala will address them on Yom Qiyamah, 
and that once he addresses them, and that as the verse states, Salamun Kaulam and Rabban Rahim, is that the overwhelming bliss that comes to their heart as a result of receiving the divine address is really what this whole affair is about. In this meaning of Bokaruha Ala Motakum. And this hadith comes as well in a in its solitary form in the collection of Abu Dawood, where it says, Iqra'u Yasin ala motakum, recite Yasin upon your deceased. And then we have another hadith in Adarimi that says, Man qara Yasin fi sadrin nahari qudiyat hawa'ijuh. Whoever recites Yasin in the beginning of the day, all of his needs will be taken care of. So in the school that I studied in, every single day Yasin is recited as part of your morning invocations. This is a part of this is a staple part of the day that Yasin is recited. And then as we will see here, when we look into some of these narrations, some of them that we won't have time to mention, but there are those that, that realize the merit of Yasin and wanted to recite it even more than once a day. Imam al Haddad used to recite Yasin. In every rak'ah, every cycle of prayer of the four sunnah rak'ahs before Salat al-Dhuhr. So he'd recite it four times. I remember visiting some of the shuyukh in, um, in Morocco. And when you visited them, they recited Yasin several times during the day. I don't even know how many times. Is that whenever they would start their invocations, they would start by reciting Yasin. So it was recited several times. And so it's good to recite Yasin. As, as a, a daily invocation, and in addition to other parts of the Quran that you recite, just as it's good to recite Yasin for something specific. And this is in another narration that, uh, that Imam Munawi mentions in his Fayd al Qadir. He says, al Harith ibn Abi Usama fi Musnadah, Marfu'an, that whoever recites Surah Yasin, and he's fearful, that will be granted security. وَهُوَ السَّقِيمِ And he's sick, is that he will be cured. Oh, he's ja'a. If he's hungry, is that he will be satiated. Until that he mentioned a number of other that different traits. And so whether we are fearful, whether we are hungry, whether we are thirsty, that whatever it might be, and that in other narrations that they go on to mention, if we don't have clothes, that we'll be given clothes. If we are in prison, that we will be freed. Is if we are unmarried, that we will then get married, and so forth and so on. If you're traveling, that you will be assisted. If you've lost something, that you will find it. So for all of these different states. So just as you can recite Yasin on a daily basis, you can also recite it for something specific. And this is why Ibn Kathir mentions in his tafsir, is that some of the scholars have said that من خصائص هذه الصورة from the special properties of this chapter is is that أنها لا تقرأ عند أمر عسير إلا يسره الله It will never be recited when you go through some type of difficult matter except that Allah will facilitate that matter. So in other words, that why are we learning this? We're learning the merit of Yasin so we can make it a part of our life. And this is why the Hadith in Bazaar states that our Prophet said, لَوَجِدْتُ أَنَّهَا فِي قَلْبِ كُلِّ إِنسَانٍ مِنْ أُمَّتِي That I wish that it was in the heart of every person from my Ummah. So this is a chapter we should all strive to memorize. We should all strive to memorize. Even if we've only memorized some of the short surahs that we use for prayer, Yasin is one of those surahs, is that if we can want to strive to memorize a chapter in the Qur'an, Beyond what we need for prayer, this is one of the great chapters that we should that memorize. So that relates to its merit. And then the scholars mention uh, in some of the tafasir that what is called the munasaba, lima qablaha. What is the relation of this chapter? So again, 36, yes, seen to the chapter that comes before, chapter 35, Surah Fatir. And they find that all of the chapters in the Qur'an that are related one to another. Not only are all of the chapters that put in a perfect place one in relation to another, is that every verse is put in a perfect place inside of every chapter. Every word is put in a perfect place inside of every verse of every chapter. And every single letter is put 
in that a perfect place in relation to that every single verse inside of every single chapter and that this ultimately is all of knowledge the Quran is all of knowledge and this is why Mulana Rumi took an ishara from the Quran beginning with Aba Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim and ending Min al-jinnati wa nas with a scene he said all of knowledge bas it's just complete bas, ba, scene and everything that is in between is all of knowledge. This is everything that you need. It is ultimately in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book. The key is how can you and I extract what we need? Imam al-Haddad used to say is that a murid, someone who is seeking closest to Allah, is not really considered to be a murid unless he finds in the Quran everything who will yurid, everything he wants. And so learning to find in the Quran what it is that we need. Learning that to that benefit that from the meanings in the various chapters of the Qur'an or if we're going through a specific situation is that not just I'm talking about just opening it up randomly I'm talking about reading with reflection and trying to find what it is that we need and one of the greatest blessings of the Qur'an is that it eliminates deception it eliminates deception so if you are that you have a skewed way of thinking, you're deceived by something, your passions have overtaken you, you have a strong desire for something, but it's a desire and you could actually go straight through that particular thing. If you read the Quran carefully and you open up your heart to absorb its meanings, even through translation of its of its of, of the Arabic meanings, is that one of the greatest fruits is that you will be given clarity. You will that be able to get out of that state of illusion or deception, and you'll be protected, because the Quran is, it's these are realities that are in the Quran, and that when you open your heart to them, is that the desires are about things here in this world, and that when all of a sudden that you wake up and you realize what was I thinking, that it comes from that having husnul tadabburin, reflecting well upon the meanings in Allah Ta'ala's book. So one of the several relations that the scholars point out of Surah Yasin to Surah Fatah is the following, is that uh, after Allah Ta'ala mentioned in Surah Fatah his, his words, وَجَاءَكُمْ النَّذِيرُ A warner has come to you. And then Allah Ta'ala says, وَأَقْسَمُ بِاللَّهِ جَهْدِ إِيمَانِينَ لَإِنْ جَاءَهُمْ نَذِيرٌ لَيَكُنُنَّ أَهْدَى مِنْ إِحْدَى الْأُمَمْ Allah speaks of a warner coming to them. And what is meant uh, by the warner in these verses is the Prophet Muhammad But then you have people that denied his prophethood and that turned against him And so this is why that this chapter begins with Yasin. And again, we'll talk about those meanings. Some say refers to the Prophet And then that Allah Ta'ala says right after that, that he swears an oath by the Quran al Hakim that indeed that the Prophet ﷺ is from the messengers. Okay. Um, as for what this, uh, the, the the details of what this surah contains, um, the first twelve verses um, that begin with an address uh, of the Prophet ﷺ, and it speaks of his prophetic mission. It speaks of that him being a prophet. It talks about revelation. And then we have that in verses 13 to 30, where there is more details about those who reject the prophets and that what happens to them the way that we can understand that. In verses 31 to 44, that Allah Ta'ala speaks of the resurrection and that gives us signs of it in the world that we live in now. In verses 45 to 52, Allah Ta'ala treats the various responses to um, those that have denied that prophecy and that what are the consequences of the positions that they've taken. And then in verses 53 to 68, we find that Allah Ta'ala juxtaposes the ends of the believers to the ends of the disbelievers. What happens to both groups that respond in a diametrically opposed fashion to the prophets. 
And then in 69-70, Allah Ta'ala that speaks again in these two verses about the uh, prophethood of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then verses 71-81 to 81, that Allah Ta'ala discusses uh, the signs in His creation that indicate to us that His that omnipotence Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and his the ability to resurrect just as he first gave life to everything uh, that is that in creation and that as one of them said the khulasa the essence of this whole matter is and the surah to kulla iqadun shadidun is that this chapter that is a means to wake us up in a very intense matter so that we can that recognize that life is serious and it is opening up our hearts to what we really need to know in order to be safe from the human predicament that we are all in collectively. And that relates to having faith in the oneness of Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, following the guidance of the Prophets, and preparing for the hereafter. And this is why that Yasin is that the heart of the Quran. So having said that, inshallah ta'ala. We will now start with the uh, first part of Yasin, which begins with the Yasin. Yasin is one of the uh, 29 chapters in the Quran that begins with what are called the Huruf al muqatta You could say the unconnected letters, the separated letters. And just as the second that chapter in the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, also begins with these letters. But here there are different letters, and that there's three. Adaf Lam Mim. In Yasin, we have Ya and we have Sin. And that the separated letters, um, the vast majority of scholars say, is that the knowledge of them we leave to Allah Ta'ala. Allahu A'lam bil Murad. Allah only knows what they truly mean. So someone might ask, why then would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that include that these huruf al maqata these separate or unconnected letters, in his book? One of the wisdoms, and there are many, is that first and foremost, the Qur'an to prove its authenticity is a challenge to the Arabs of the time who knew the Arabic language. It had reached its pinnacle at this particular juncture in human history. And so they all knew what these letters were. But they didn't know exactly what was meant by them because this was not something that was customary to the Arabs to have just letters out of Lamim. And this is why one of the wisdoms the scholars mention immediately after Surah Al Fatiha, we have Adaf Lamim and Surah Al Baqarah. It's so that if you're going to come to the Qur'an, is that you have to be very careful to come into the Qur'an with preconceived notions. And so that you can put aside your preconceived notions, and you have to come to the Qur'an with humility. And to understand is that there's a lot that you can understand from the Qur'an, but at first, that there are things that you might not be able to understand like these letters that are right at the beginning of the chapters. And some meanings might be opened up to the hearts of the righteous about what they actually mean, but at first glance, you might not know that what they mean. And so just as that this is a lesson to the Arab of the time of the Prophet Wasallam, after it is a lesson for all of us, is that when we come to the Book of Allah Ta'ala, we have to come with utter humility. And unfortunately, people that come with preconceived notions and they come with arrogance or haughtiness or pride, and they come with this state of a heart that is stained with all different types of diseases, they might have what confirm for them what it is that they're looking for. Unfortunately, this is the way things are. And it's no different than the book of creation. So you have the book of Revelation, you have the book of creation. Is the people that look out in creation with preconceived notions, looking for something that they've already come to believe is the case, they oftentimes will have confirmed for them exactly what it is that they were looking for. And this is the way things are. 
So what it really is, is it, it gets back to your own self. If you really think about it, how could there ever be an individual that didn't believe in the Prophet Muhammad Have you ever thought about that? Like there were actually people that saw the Messenger of Allah right before their eyes. Some of them might have even witnessed miracles and still didn't believe or took a long time to believe. How could that even happen? It's actually a proof of Allah. It's actually a proof of Allah. But when we understand it from the standpoint of the means, we understand that this relates to the human condition. And this is the way that the inheritors of the prophets are as well. Yes, they are mercy. Yes, they are there to help you. But you have to want their help. You have to do your part. You can't rely upon them only. If you embrace your part and you do what it is that you can, they will of course help you. And they will pollinate your soul. And they will they plant a seed in your soul. And they will help you along the way as you till the earth of your heart. And that you strive and cultivate the meanings of this deen. So that it grows into a very strong and beautiful fruit giving tree. But it takes time. But you have to be involved in the process. And so in other words, they are a type of mirror for you. And to let you know where you really are. So those that deny them are those that reject them or speak ill of them. Whether we're referring to a prophet and those that live in the time of a prophet or those that are referring to the inheritors of the, that live in the time of the inheritors of the prophet. So uh, that ultimately you, they will ha- you will have confirmed for your own self where you're at. And so this is the way with the human representatives, this is the way with the Qur'an, and this is the way with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. Whereas that if you strive, that there's no one that strives except that Allah ta'ala opens up a door for them. So this is a very deep meaning, a very deep meaning. Learning to come to the Qur'an with humility. And this is why um, I believe I heard Sheikh Nuh Keller say, and this is a good piece of advice we should all take, Every time that you go to read the Qur'an, the very first thing that you should do is make istighfar. Ask the forgiveness of Allah before you open up the Mus'haf. That, close your eyes and ask Allah to forgive you of all of your sins, so that you wipe your slate clean when you then open up the book of Allah wa ta'ala. But coming to the Qur'an with humility, coming to the Qur'an with an intention to seek guidance, coming with the Qur'an with an intention of wanting your heart to be colored with the meanings of revelation and all of the other intentions that you can make, these are the people that are going to benefit from the book of Allah Taala. So there are 29 surahs that begin with these separated letters and that Generally speaking, the scholars say, Allahu A'lam, Allah only knows what they truly mean. And having said that, some, some of the scholars still do offer meanings of that they've been inspired with that they could potentially mean. And so, that when it comes to Yasin, although there are multiple opinions, that a few are, one say, is that Yasin here is that short for that two words, Ya, which is the vocative, saying, Oh, calling upon someone, and then that the word insan in the diminutive form, that is, i.e. a tasghir. And so that the, uh, if you take insan, just as you say, for instance, that a rajul, and you have a rujail, a man or a little man, or you say that, um, that you have like kelb or kuleib, a dog or a little dog, or something of that nature. Um, you, there's a form of turning it into the, the diminutive uh, morphological form that you use. And then there's rhetorical purposes of them. So you could say, Ibni, my son. But you could also say, Bunay, which is the diminutive of Ibni. And that, that's a one of the meanings of the diminutive is that speaking to someone, using as a term of endearment. So, insan is a little bit more complicated because there is an extra alif. So when you put that into the diminutive, it's unaisin, unaisin. And so some of the scholars say is that the scene it represents this word unaisin, which is the diminutive of that uh, man, which here would means that our human being, the little human being. Um, and that they say this is a term of endearment. Oh, little human being. 
and that primarily that they say that this would refer to the Prophet Muhammad So little in this sense, normally you'd think that that would be rude to say something like that, but not in this case, of course. This is Allah Ta'ala addressing His Prophet. And that others say something similar, um, that the, the opinion of Abu Bakr al-Waraq was, it means, Ya Sayyid al-Bashar, that, O oh, preeminent among creation, and that, Ya, referring to the Ya, which is the O, and then the S here referring to Sayyid. And so there's difference of opinions there, but that there are those that say that this refers to the Prophet ﷺ, and thus has become one of his names. And this is why it's found in a hadith narrated by Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib that he says that I heard the Prophet say that indeed that Allah Ta'ala that gave me seven names in the Quran Muhammad, Ahmad, Taha, Yasin, Al Muzammil, Al Mudathir, Wa Abdullah. So you find people that are named Yasin, and that this is one of the names that in that the uh, various salawat that we have in praise of the Prophet ﷺ, like those of Imam al-Jazuli, is that you will find this is one of the names that is mentioned, that both Taha and Yasin. Taha is also a chapter in the Qur'an. So some of them say that this refers to the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, and that there are a number of other opinions as well uh, that are mentioned in the various tafasir. Um, some of them that uh, assign a more um, eschatological meaning to it is that they say it's a reference to the Yom al Mithaq, which is the day of the covenant, and um, that this indicates that the that secret of what takes place between the lover and the beloved that on that this very special day. Anyhow, whatever the meaning really is, is that um, that we know that. There is a reason that why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a deep wisdom, why He began that the, his, uh, his, this chapter with Yasin, either with some of the wisdoms that we had already mentioned, or is that now that it's going to that set up to that speak about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which those that say it's potentially one of the Prophet's names <laughs> that indicate because if you look at verse 3, what says, that truly you are one of the messengers in the second person, in Naka, truly you are one of the messengers. This would seem to indicate that this first Yasin is a reference to the Prophet Muhammad. So, Yasin. And then, Wal Quran al Hakim. By the wise Quran. And this is amazing when you get into the depths of the Arabic language, is that you find that one letter can have multiple meanings. Wow can have multiple meanings in the Arabic language. It can be used in its most basic form as a conjunction. Ja Zaydun wa Amrun. That Zaid and Amr came. It's just a simple conjunction. And we differentiate it, differentiate it that using that wow as opposed to a fa or a thumma, for instance. But the wow can also be a qasm. It can also be a way of swearing an oath. So like what we would say um, in, in English, like by Allah or by God, something. Is that that wow has strong rhetorical value. Because when you swear by something, there is a degree of seriousness about what it is that you are swearing. So if someone is pressing you on a particular matter, did you do this? It seems to me that you actually did this. What happened? This is something I'm very upset about. And this person realizes the situation is serious. And they know they can't just say, no, I didn't do it. Is that they have to emphasize to that person, Wallahi, I did not do that. Wallahi, I did not do that. Swearing an oath by Allah. Now you have to be very careful in swearing an oath by Allah. Some people just say it all the time, Wallah, Wallah, Wallah. You really should not do that. Because the name of Allah right, is special and you should only swear an oath by Allah if needed, if you must emphasize. But this is one of the that greatest ways of emphasis is to swear an oath. And then that all of the oaths in the Quran, Allah Ta'ala swears by the greatest things of all. And that Allah Ta'ala, because He is the Khaliq, can swear by whatever it is that He wants to swear by. 
when it comes to a human being is that we are only permitted to swear by Allah. Or you could use some type of that uh, combination like Rabb al Kaaba, the Lord of the Kaaba. But we only swear by Allah or using the Idafa construct. But Allah Ta'ala swears by what He will. What He will, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But here, Wal Quran al Hakim. He is swearing an oath by the Quran, and then he is describing the Quran as Al Hakim. Al Hakim. And this is something that we all know. But the Quran is the epitome of wisdom. Everything in the Quran is filled with wisdom. Every act that happens in creation, which ultimately is an act of Allah, is filled with wisdom. And even though we do not understand what that wisdom is, it is upon us to do two things. To submit at first and then that explore what the wisdom actually might be. And this is why that if you trust in Allah Ta'ala as you go through life, there'll be certain things that happen to you at one juncture of your life, you don't understand why that happened to me. And you think that maybe that, you know, I did something wrong, maybe this is some form of punishment, I don't know. And maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But as life progresses, you start to realize the wisdom of why certain things happen to you. And then what made you feel at first a little bit bitter, such that you had to fight yourself in the beginning to submit to the divine decree in relation to what happened, over time when you realized that it was something necessary for you, and there's something great blessings that you actually receive from it, you have a very different perspective. And that comes from understanding the wisdom in that particular thing. But the Qur'an is Hakim. And it is the wise Qur'an. Now, that this is one of two meanings that this could actually mean. The others say is that Al-Hakim could mean Al-Muhkam. And here you would translate this as um, like determined or perfected. And so that the Qur'an is Al-Hakim, yes, in terms of the wisdom that it gives creation, but it is also muhkam, it is also perfected. As Allah Taala says, Alaf Namra, Kitabun Uhkimat Ayatuhu, Thumma Fusilat min Nadun Hakim and Khabir. This is a scripture, a book whose verses are perfected. The Quran is perfect. It's exactly as it's supposed to be. That again, every letter, every word, Every ayah, every chapter, the entire Qur'an collectively, in relation to which it is perfect. The Qur'an is perfect. And that even academics speak about this idea of the internal coherence of the Qur'an, and we don't need them to do this for us. But this is that something very interesting to note, is that despite their attempts in their, to critique the Qur'an and to poke holes that in that Allah Ta'ala's book, is that this is something that they pretty much agree upon. Is that this idea that there is the internal coherence in the Qur'an that indicates that one speaker. And that this is not the case in what remains from the other scriptures that we still have here with us. And this is something that even comes across in the translation of the meanings. When you that read what is being said, and I've spoken to people that have converted that this is what they said, is that when they read the Qur'an, it's like, human beings don't speak like that. Human beings don't speak like that. That's not how we speak. And that there's a majesty, there is a grandeur that comes across even in the translation of its meanings. It's like, human beings simply do not speak like that. And then there's all these things that are really amazing. That why that the Prophet Moses السلام, is mentioned more than the Prophet Muhammad, many more times than the Prophet Muhammad If the Prophet was calling to himself, do you really think that he would mention Moses more than his own self? Right? If the Prophet السلام, was really calling to himself, do you think that he would mention the verses where outwardly that Allah Ta'ala is rebuking him? Of course, we have Adab and say the rebuke of the lover of his beloved, because he's the Habib of Allah, right? Abbas wa Tawalla. Right? But point is, is that 
that do you think the Prophet's going to mention something where outwardly he's being rebuked? That no one would do that. That you would put it in a way that you wanted to make sure that people that had belief in you and whatever it is that you're trying to pull on others. Anyhow, the Quran is both wise and that it is muhkam, it is perfected. And again, that what is Allah Ta'ala, He's swearing by the Quran al Hakim that for a particular purpose. In Naka Naman al Mursaleen in verse 3. Truly, you are one of the messengers. Innaka lamin al mursaleen. And so Allah Ta'ala further emphasizes this point, not only by swearing an oath by the Quran, but also using inna, innaka, which means truly. And then we have another lamb, lamin al mursaleen. Allah Ta'ala is emphasizing this. In other words, is that for those who do not believe in you, O Muhammad, is that those that said, like we find in that that sort of uh, verse 43 of Surah Al Ra'd, where they said, Lesta Mursalan, is that you have not been sent as a messenger. Allah Ta'ala is saying, Inna kana Mursaleen. And this is why, if you look very carefully at the khitab of the Quran, as that it is a khitab from the standpoint of certainty. Allah is stating the reality of things. And it's really interesting to look at the Qur'an in that sense. One of the great verses that I'm reminded of when I think of that particular point is when Allah Ta'ala says that is there any doubt of Allahi shak? Is there any doubt about Allah? Faltar al-Simawati wal the originator of the heavens and the earth. In other words, is that normally when someone is not certain about something, is that they go around in a roundabout type of way to explain something to someone in a very distant type fashion. But when you have absolutely absolute certainty about something, that you're going to explain that thing in the very clearest of ways. You're not going to go some roundabout way and yes, that I was outside and I was just in the right spot and so I finally reached the point where the sun is shining. No, no one doubts that there's sun, well not today, but in general when it's actually shining, you just simply say, the sun is shining. And you declare in a very simple, that direct manner. And that when it comes to the, the Quran, it clarifies to us what reality is. Innaka lamin al mursaleen. And just think about the sharaf and the honor that is involved in that. Allah Jalla Jalalu is saying this about that Sayyidina Muhammad. He is being addressed. Innaka, Ya Rasulullah. You can imagine that the Prophet, what is taking place in his heart when he receives revelation in the Lord of the heavens and the earth is addressing him and by extension that others. But first and foremost, in Naka. Allah is dressing, addressing the Prophet that directly. In Naka, Lamun al Truly, you are one of the messengers. Think about that the magnitude of that and the way that the Prophet embraced it. And if we speak about awliya reaching a point where that they don't have a thought other than the remembrance of Allah come to your heart, what about Sayyidina Muhammad? What about the Imam of the Imbiyan the Mursaleen? And that the SubhanAllah, what was his state of heart when Allah Ta'ala is addressing him like this? And then also, the responsibility that is on the shoulders. Because he has been sent, and he's been sent for that a specific purpose. And this is why it's the same word for that Rasul comes from Mursal, the one who's been sent, and the Risala is the message. And all of these other meanings, they get back to this idea of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending the prophets with a message right to his creation. And this is why it absolutely must be emphasized and affirmed that this is a reality in Nika Lamin al Mursaleen. And to do this, Allah Ta'ala swears by the Quran al Hakim. And inshallah ta'ala, we will just take that for today and continue on uh Bidnilahi Ta'ala tomorrow. 
May Allah Ta'ala open up our heart to the meanings of revelation, open up our heart to the meanings of Surah Yasin specifically, and may it be a means for us to connect to our Lord and connect, connect to Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we ask Allah to give us an opening in His book and to give us further understanding of His book. And as we read and study these meanings, we ask you, Ya Allah, solely from your bounty and your generosity, from the blessings of this blessed month of Ramadan, is that these meanings are absorbed at the very depth of our being and that this Quran impacts us and it brings our heart to life and it's a means for the lifting of the veil and a means for that our that souls to become unshackled that from that our lower selves may Allah Ta'ala bless us in all of our different states except our fasting except that everything that is that we're doing in this blessed month solely for his sake wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammad and wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam alhamdulillahi rabbil this is their particular way but they're masters of not only memorization in general, but specifically Quran and other sciences as well, and that the uh, they are one of the great means in all throughout the world in the Muslim world that you find this as well means for the preservation of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's book. So it is a that recited Quran and it is a written Quran, and Allah Taala swearing by it is to emphasize inna kalamun al mursaleen that truly. You are one of the messengers, O oh Muhammad. And that here, and we actually know that our Prophet ﷺ is the greatest of the prophets and the messengers. But there are other messengers as well. And that, that our Prophet is a part of a long prophetic legacy in which he is the seal. He is the Khatam and Inbiya wa Mursaleen. And if we really think about that, I've oftentimes reflected on the fact that before this idea of a globalized world, it was, if you rewind in history a thousand years, inconceivable that people would have this feeling somehow, and now we know it's through modern applied technology, but you would be knowing what's happening on the other side of the earth instantaneously. People would have thought that that was virtually impossible, outwardly speaking, unless Allah Ta'ala intervenes. So the idea of a globalized world was that not something that human beings could even have imagined in the pre-modern world. And it just so happens that at the time we actually have what people are referring to as a globalized world, we have the universal prophet. So we know that our prophet is a universal prophet. He's different from all of the other prophets and messengers who came before him, who were specifically sent to that their people. But our Prophet was sent to everyone, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it's just amazing to think about that, that he has a universal that deen, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and it just so corresponds to the time that as time went on, 1400 plus years later, that we moved into this idea that people are now talking about the global village, because that we are so aware of other people's experience throughout the world. And this is just something to think about. And the amazing thing is, in part of the reason there's so much tension between certain people in the modern world and the religion of Islam is because is that we refuse as Muslims ultimately to only see our religion through the lens of the modern world. Is that no, we root ourselves in this religion and we understand that the modern world is just our context and that Dr. Jackson mentioned on as a blurb for one of the public, recent publications of Sheikh Abdul Hakim Marad, and that essentially he was Sheikh Abdul Hakim was commenting on his own contentions. I think it was the eleventh contentions, and included his commentary. And Dr. Jackson says on the back a very beautiful statement. He says that it, this can still be done. It can still be done, meaning that people that are connected to the tradition, living the meanings of that tradition and doing what the previous people did in our time. And this is what he said, the modern world is just our context. He said, we should never make it our excuse. The modern world is just our context. We shouldn't make it our excuse. In other words, the whole point of speaking about this idea of tradition is so that you can attach yourself to it and you can benefit from it and you can train yourself through it or become trained through it so that you can then do in your time, in our time, what they, those who came before us did in their time. It's not to speak of some static thing that's gone and in the past. Yes, that there are 
that certain people that you're never going to reach their ranks. But that doesn't mean that you still don't try to do what it is that they do, but it requires not only love and respect and attachment to that tradition, but a deep study and appreciation of it so that we can that live it in our that particular moment in which we live and do what it is that they did, or at least that approximate and at least die trying. And so that this is very important for us to that really think about the implications of our Prophet being the final Prophet and Messenger. Is that Allah says, truly you are one of the Messengers, and we know that He is the Khatam and Nabiyin. Now, moving on to verse number 4. Allah Ta'ala then says, Ala siratin mustaqim, On a straight path. So by the wise Qur'an, truly you are one of the Messengers, on a straight path. And some of the scholars say this is a khabar ba'da khabar. In other words, is that he is one of the messengers and he is on a straight path. And that others say that you would translate this is that indeed that you are from among the messengers whom they are on a straight whom are on a straight path. And this is where it gets very detailed when you start to look at the different grammatical possibilities and it would change the way that you translate the verses and you translate the meaning of them and this is why it's so important to really be a good translator especially when it comes to the Quran you have to understand the grammatical the nuances of the Quran and that sometimes there's multiple that ways there's multiple uh, that there, there's multiple possibilities of the grammar, which gives a diverse set of meanings. So, but if we just look at this gen in general, is that Allah is describing our Prophet as being upon a suratan mustaqim, and really, the more that you look into the depth of the Quran, you could just keep going deeper, and you could keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. Because here we have a word, sirat, but then it brings up the question, is that how many times does Allah use the word sirat in the Qur'an? What are the various other verses where He uses it? Does He describe the sirat with any the other adjectives? So it's one thing just to know that sirat translates as path, but it's another thing to understand the concept of sirat in the Qur'an. To understand the concept of the Mursaleen, the Rasul in the Qur'an. To, un to understand the concept of wisdom in the Qur'an. This is what's really important. And there's obviously only so much that you can do in a, that short class. But we start to think in this way. And then as we read the Qur'an, we start to pick up. Okay, Allah is using this word here and this word there. And sometimes words have multiple meanings. And so that what we want to do though is, is to bring the meanings of these words into our life. So Allah described our Prophet as being upon a suratan mustaqim. And this straight path is generally that said to be the path of Tawheed and Huda. It is the path of monotheism and guidance. This is the foundational meaning that all of the prophets that who came before us brought. That if Tawheed, the oneness of Allah Jalla Jalalu. So for us, our reading of history will always see polytheism as a perversion. We don't accept the fact that human beings that were polytheistic for most of their history and eventually that came to believe that in one God as they evolved. We reject that. We believe the foundation, the first man, Adam السلام, of course was a monotheist. And then that polytheism was a diversion. In monotheism, belief in one God, belief in the divine unity of, of Allah is the most powerful concept in existence. It is the most powerful concept in existence. And what we need to do is to that not only have an understanding of that, theologically speaking, but to have that also translate into everything that it is that you and I do. And one of the du'as that I've heard my teacher say, I believe every time, every single prayer I believe he says it. If not, 
the vast majority of prayers that I've definitely that been with him that I and, I, and I've heard him say is that Allahumma aj'alna min ahli haqiqat al-tawheed. Oh Allah, make us from the people of the reality of tawheed. The ahl haqiqat al-tawheed. The ahl is the people. The haqiqah is the reality of. And then tawheed is divine unity. And so you have the oneness of Allah, but then you have your witnessing of that in your heart. And as you move up in the degrees of faith, you move up to a higher degree of certainty. And a higher degree of certainty is that the more that you will affirm the oneness of Allah. Think about that. If that you have the strongest, highest level of faith and all of a sudden you lose your job. You realize, لا مانع لما أعطيت ولا معتنا لا ولا معتيا لما منعت. Is that there is no preventing what you have given, and there is no giving what you have prevented. The person before you is nothing other than a means. Nothing other than a means. Now, doesn't mean that we're rude to those people, but we see them for what they are. No one. Or no thing can prevent you from anything Allah wants to give you. If Allah Ta'ala wants to take you to the highest level of wilaya, even if you have that everyone in creation is a hater to the nth degree, there's nothing that they can do to prevent it. لا مانع لما أعطيت ولا معتيا لما منعت. Period. But we have to have that level of faith where we don't flinch. You weren't the one giving me in the first place. And especially when we start to wiggle because we feel that we have to compromise our principles to be able to receive the favor of that person still or to maintain that job or whatever. Especially in those circumstances, we have to remember is that Allah Jalla Jalalu is in control of everything. What we have to do is be aware of that. And that when that happens in the moment, that person is only that an outward manifestation, a means. The reality is Allah wa ta'ala is completely in control. And so the foundational message is one of Tawheed and Huda. Guidance would include all of the individual that aspects of not only the law but of character and so forth. So when we talk about the Sirat that is Mustaqeen, the straight path, it includes everything that our Prophet brought وسلم, from correct belief to correct practice to that morality and having good character and everything of this nature that relates to the individual, that relates to the family, that relates to society and so forth and so on. All of this ultimately is the, what we would call the Sirat al-Mustaqeen. And what is Allah Ta'ala saying about our Prophet وسلم, that after just telling us that truly you are one of the messengers, that he is ala siratin mustaqim. And so they point out, why did Allah use the word ala? They say because the ala in the Arabic language is a particle that is used, it's a harf al isti'la, when you put something on top of something. So I put my cup upon the table. And when it's used in this sense, is that if you are on top of something or you are on top of someone, it really has that sense of being able to control that person or that thing. If you're grappling with someone and you're on top of them and you've, you're pinning them to the ground, you're in more control in that particular, in that sense. And so what Allah Ta'ala is saying, is that our Prophet sent him that everything that is considered to be a part of the Surat al Mustaqim, he is ala, he is on top of it. In other words, is that not only has he implemented and embodied it, is that he وسلم, is the epitome of its manifestation. And this is why some of the scholars, and back to the early Salaf, Imam al Hassan al Basri, said one of the meanings of the Surat al Mustaqim when we pray. Uh, every day in the Quran, guide us to the path, the straight path, is that that straight path is the Prophet ﷺ. He is the Surat al Mustaqim. And that Allah Ta'ala says in another verse, <laughs> And indeed, this is 
that my sirat that is straight, my straight path. And hadha here is an ism al ishara. As so you say, hadhihi al this piece of paper, that hadha al qalam, this pen. And so that some say is that that verse refers to the Prophet. Allah is directing this to the Prophet. And this is, he is, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, my straight path. And it makes sense. Because he is the human version of the perfect manifestation of the straight path. All of the meanings of the straight path, of which that the Quran explains in great detail. Because we say, إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطِ mustaqim, Guide us to the straight path. And Allah is not going to leave us bereft of guidance. The entire Quran is an explanation of the straight path. And how it is that we can maintain that, that perfect alignment so that we can get closer and closer to Allah and avoid all of the different diversions in one direction or another. This is what the Qur'an came to explain to us, but that is embodied ultimately in the person of our Prophet wasallam, and in his life, and in his words, and in his actions, and even in his tacit approval wasallam. And so, that after mentioning that he's one of the messengers, ala sirat al-mustaqeem, on a straight path. It's also interesting to note that this is what Allah Ta'ala mentions. There's something about the manifestations of this straight path in relation to what we say and do that matters so much. This matters so much. And we have to always be careful when we take a path of seeking knowledge to not fall into the trap of seeking knowledge for the sake of seeking knowledge. We seek knowledge first and foremost because we've been commanded to by Allah to do so. We also seek knowledge to learn how to become an abd. How can we become servants of Allah? We seek knowledge to put knowledge into practice. And it's not just merely about the theory. And that in our experience here in the, in the United States of America and wherever else one might be, and our desire to want to share our faith with people, our desire to want to even help Muslims that strengthen their own faith, it's essential that we understand that it begins with our own selves. It begins with our own implementation and living up to what it is that we are studying and learning. It can't just be that there's a disconnect between the cerebral level of religion and that how it is that we actually live. And this is the greatest thing that pushes away people from religion in general and that comes between even Muslims among themselves. If people talk about things and they're not living up to it, then we ask Allah Ta'ala to forgive us because all of us do it. If you would actually sit down and think about how much do you know? We actually know quite a bit. Even those of us that haven't studied that much, we actually know quite a bit. And if we would actually list all of the things that we know, the things that could potentially be put into practice on one side of the column, well, in one column, and in the next column, am I implementing that thing? Am I implementing that thing? And am I implementing that thing? What percent of our knowledge do we actually put into practice? Nasallallah. As-salama wa afiyah So, is that when we look at the example of the Prophet Sallallahu I want to that remind ourselves of this blessed statement of Sayyidah Khadija, which really is incredible. And that it's incredible that this was that how she viewed things in that time, that when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam first comes back after receiving revelation, and that her words are so powerful, is that they are a minhaj, a methodology for all future generations in terms of their conveying the essential message of the Prophet to their people. In other words, is that if we focus on this and root ourselves in this and live like this, it's only then will they learn from us the details of our religion. So what did our Prophet do when he came back after having that extremely powerful experience of revelation and he says that laqad khashitu ala nafsi is that i am worried about myself and then what did sayyida khadija eventually say to those who kalla wallah no by allah ma yukhzika allah abada allah would never disgrace you he would never let you down and what kind of woman is that allahu akbar this is the Prophet of God. And that he is coming back to her. 
and the one of the most the most powerful experience of his life sallallahu alaihi wasallam and that this is how firm she is this is how firm she is this is what who was sayyida khadija subhanallah and then not only that she went on to mention five things about the prophet sallallahu that proves that allah ta'ala would never disgrace him the first says, "Innaka la tasir al-raham." You maintain family ties. Wa tahmil al-kal. You bear the burden of others. Wa taksib al-madum. You give to the needy. Wa taqr al-dayf. You receive guests hospitably. Wa tuain ala nawaib al-haq. And you assist during times of calamity. Those five things: family ties, bearing the burden of others, giving to the needy. Treating, uh, receiving guests hospitably, and assisting during times of calamity. That is the minhaj. That is our focus. If every Muslim minority, wherever they would be on the face of this earth, would focus upon this and speak that language, which is the essence of what our deen is teaching us, and secondarily speak actually you in, 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 with words that are, that are that, uh, to use religious terminology, what would come from that would develop a sense of trust and a sense of love and that a number of other that feelings and attachments at the heart level. Then when you did say something in the name of the religion, is that people would take it seriously. Not that everyone necessarily believed, but this is, this is it. In, in other words, is that this is who our Prophet was. And it was because of these traits and how he was that many of his people, not all, but many of his people accepted what he is that he said after that, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Some took longer than others, and there's no doubt that there were some who that never saw it and were blinded from the truth. And that archetype was and always will remain until the end of time. But Allah describes our Prophet as being upon a siratan mustaqim. And that we also have interestingly in the Quran is that on the tongue of the Prophet Hud, that Allah Ta'ala, He describes His Lord as being upon a Sarat and Mustaqeen, that Allah's way is straight. And so the fact that then Allah, that mentions that the Prophet is upon a Sarat and Mustaqeen, is that it indicates the greatness of who the Prophet is, because this is something that was attributed to Allah, and then Allah attributes it to the Prophet. And these verses come in Surah Al Hud, where that Allah Ta'ala says, قَالَ إِنِّي أُشْهِدُ اللَّهَ وَشْهَدُ أَنِّي بَرِيءٌ مِمَّا تُشْرِكُونَ He said, I call God to witness, and you too are my witnesses, that I disown those who set up as partners, those you set up as partners with God. So Hud alayhi salam is speaking to his people. And he said, أَنَا بَرِيءٌ I disown, I have nothing to do with that your that practice of shirk, associating partners with Allah. And he says, مِن دُونِهِ فَكِي دُونِي جَمِيعًا ثُمَّ لَا تُنْذِرُونَ So then he says that, مِمَّا تُشْرِكُونَ مِن دُونِهِ فَكِي دُونِي جَمِيعًا ثُمَّ لَا تُنْذِرُونَ So plot against me, all of you, and give me no respite. إِنِّي تَوَكَّلْتُ عَلَى اللَّهِ Indeed, that I have placed my trust in Allah. رَبِّي وَرَبِّكُمْ My Lord and your Lord. مَا مِنْ دَابَّةً إِلَّا هُوَ آخِذُ مِنْ أَصِيَتِهَا There is no moving creature which he does not control. إِنَّ رَبِّهَا لَصَلَاتِ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ My Lord's way is straight. But look at, the, look at how the prophets were. You can imagine him standing up to his people. The vast majority of them disbelieved in him. And he's saying that after having that giving them da'wah, trying to call them to the truth, he says that I disown those that you set up as partners with Allah. And then fakiduni jami'an. So plot against me all of you. And grant me no respite. Oh. La ilaha illallah. That he's speaking to people that could really harm him. But why is he saying that? Inni tawakkamtu ala Allah. I put my trust in Allah. Rabbi, wa rabbikum. My, he's my Lord and he's your Lord. Allahu Akbar. This is how the prophets were. And that these are inspiring stories. 
that we shouldn't think that in this age of Islamophobia that this is the first time that people have had that antagonistical that things to say about religion. This is a part of that the story of all prophets. Every person that has stood for truth that will have someone that stand up against him into that say something bad to him or do something to him or her. This is a part of living the truth. This is it. And that we should really put our tribulations in the proper context. How hard are they really? Now there's no doubt as we speak right now, there's people going through immense tribulations. But how hard are our tribulations really? If being a Muslim means that we get a few stares, if being a Muslim means that we have to go through secondary checks, that we get mistreated sometimes, that we wait a little bit longer, that when we get back from our international flights, from our international travels, then let that be. Then let it be. If we have Islam as opposed to SubhanAllah, I remember that uh, when they first started those uh, new scanners that they're still using, uh, we were trying to, when uh, one of our teachers was visiting, to avoid them. Um, for his dignity and that when you opt for when you opt out then they have to do that a hand search and um, it was that um, for those of you that have done that it's not really the nicest thing and it's unfortunately um, that really encroaches that on areas that are sensitive and as I was watching this I was thinking in my mind La hawla wa billah, that this is that subhanAllah, our blessed teachers having to go through this and as I was watching him get searched and, and then that when that we uh, were uh, then when we were walking away that I, I apologized to him I'm, per- I'm terribly sorry that you have to go through that and he said simply he said what did the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu have to do what did he have to go through in order for him to convey the message what did he have to go through in other words, his meshad, how he viewed that particular moment was, this is nothing compared to what the Prophet said that he himself went through. So, ala siratan mustaqim, on a straight path. Now, I want to that share and translate this passage from the tafsir of Imam Fakhr al Razi because he explains the siratan mustaqim. He said, when mustaqim, this idea of being straight, أقرب الطرق الموصلة إلى المقصود. It is the closest of paths that will cause you to reach what it is that you are seeking. <clears throat> and so we know is that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So whenever you have a straight line, if you want to get to any that particular destination, that you go directly from point A to point B. And so that this is this idea of, of all paths that the, the mustaqim means it's the quickest path to take you to what it is that you are seeking. And he says, what deen kadarik, this understanding also applies to the deen. فَإِنَّهُ تَوَجَّهَ إِلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى فَإِنَّهُ تَوَجَّهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى وَتَوَلِّ أَنْ غَيْرِهِ because is that the reality of the deen is directing yourself towards Allah and turning away from that everything other than Him. Wal maqsad hu Allah. What you're seeking is Allah. Wal mutawajjah ila al maqsad akrabu ilayhi min al muwalli anhu wal mutaharraf minhu. And those that are that trying to draw near to Him and turning towards Him, obviously that are going to that become closer to Him than those that are diverting. And so when we speak about the Sadat al Mustaqeen, oftentimes we don't associate it with that meaning in our mind. And this is why that when we pray in the Fatiha, may Allah Ta'ala that inspire us to remind and remind us to, to make this intention. When we say Ihdina Sadat al guide us to the straight path, at least 17 times a day, if in the Fard prayers, let alone if we're praying sunnas. Then what do we say? Sirat al Ladina and Amta Ali. The path of those that you have bestowed your favor upon. What are we intending? What are we intending? Just a very general intention? Are we intending that we want to be from the category of the Salihin? Are we intending that we want to be from the category of the Shuhada? Are we intending that we want to be from the category of the Siddiqeen? 
prophecy, prophethood is closed, that door is closed. But we should make an intention from the bounty of Allah Ta'ala that we that become from the elect of the Siddiqeen. In other words, is that Sirat al ladhina namta alayhim is that we want to be guided to the path of those that reach the highest degree of closest to you, Ya Rabb. And the way that manifests is in following the Surat al Mustaqim in the world. Is that the more that we can that live the meanings of the Surat al Mustaqim in this world, is that the closer we are to attaining that reality. And again, is that the epitome of the Sarat is manifested in the way of our Prophet وسلم, and to the degree that we follow the Sarat al-Mustaqim in this world is to the degree that we will attain what we desire from the bounty of Allah Ta'ala and it is the degree to which is that we will actually physically cross the Sirat in the next world which is a bridge over hell. The more that we follow it here in this world, the quicker that we will pass and we will traverse in the next world. Ada siratan mustaqeen. And so this is the whole purpose of the deen. This is the whole purpose of the Quran. This is the whole purpose of the straight path and following the Prophet وسلم, and all of these lofty meanings that we talk about. It's ultimately to take us to Allah. And what is meant by taking us to Allah is for you and I to be able to attain ma'rifah of Allah. And we know this is a possibility. And even though we don't necessarily know exactly what that means, is that we know it's a possibility. We know there are people in our time. And there's, we know that there are people who came before us who attain this. And that by loving them, attaching our hearts to them, striving to follow them, is that, inshallah, Allah wa ta'ala will allow us to taste the sweetness of that knowledge of Him before it is that we pass. So then Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala says, Tanzil al Aziz al Rahim. And so truly you are one of the messengers on a straight path. And then Allah says, Tanzil al Aziz al Rahim. A revelation of the mighty, the compassionate. So Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala that has given us the Quran. And the word used here is tanzil. Nazali naziru is to send down. And so you think of that something coming down upon you. And here, that not in a physical sense, that we don't that uh, and we don't think of this in the physical sense, that Allah Ta'ala, that when we talk about him being Al Ali, the most high, is not in a physical sense in terms of rank to wa Ta'ala. But he speaks of this idea of sending down. Send, it's a sending down, and this is why we translate it as revelation. So, Tanzil al Aziz al Rahim, a revelation of the mighty, the compassionate. And whether it's the word Tanzil or whether it's the word Inzal, which are similar in meaning, in meaning is that all gifts that come to Allah, that come from Allah rather, we talk about them as that coming down or being sent down. Whether that is a physical gift, whether that is a spiritual gift, whether that is a gift that we perceive, or whether those are, those are gifts that we never even truly know. And so that Allah is Al-Ali, He is the Most High in relation to His that rank over all of creation, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and He sends down blessings upon His creation. And this is why that he talks about in the book, sending down of Al-Kitab. He talks about sending down a sakina tranquility. He talks about sending down Al-Man wa Salwa, Al-Libas wa Rish, Al-Hadid, iron. So various gifts that they're being sent down. So Tanzil Al-Aziz Al-Rahim. And that also that brings about this idea of us receiving those gifts with humility. Because when something comes down to you, it's not something that you deserve. That which one of us deserves rain? It's something that we just receive. It comes down physically from the sky. And it is a great blessing. So we're not deserving of this and so we see it as a blessing. So the Quran is a revelation that of the mighty and the compassionate. Allah Ta'ala is Al-Aziz and He is Al-Rahim. 
And why does he mention both of these names, subhanahu wa ta'ala? He is Al-Aziz, in other words, he is the one that will do whatever it is that he wants to do. And he is the Ghalib and the Qahir. He will overcome all opponents and that he will that force his will. When he wants something to happen, it happens. In other words, is that he has revealed his book in the way that he wanted to, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that he has that revealed the Quran as he's wanted to reveal it, that despite whatever happens to anyone in relation to their acceptance of it or not, Allah has revealed his book. And he is Ar-Rahim, and he is the one, subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is merciful, so that he allows that certain people to understand his book, accept it, and believe in it, such that they are exposing themselves to be able to receive his mercy. And that when you think of it as such, is that in relation to the tanzil, which is revelation, you find people fall into one or two categories. Those that accept and those that deny. And those that deny in relation to the way that they will experience the name of Allah Al-Aziz is not going to be that too pretty. But those that accept in the way that they experience the name of Allah Ta'ala Ar-Rahim is something beautiful. First and foremost in this world, let alone in the next world. And so is that the, both, of these, both of these names relate to that people's acceptance or denial respectively of Tanzil. And so like one of the scholars has said that if you look at Surah Yasin, is that you will find that these two names have a relation to the themes that happen throughout the Surah. In relation to that people's acceptance or denial of prophecy and so forth and so on, you find these meanings pervade this particular chapter. And in other words, is that depending upon how we respond to revelation, we'll be depending upon that what it is that we experience from our Lord to Barakawa Ta'ala. But if you look at what Allah Ta'ala says, He first spoke of the Qur'an as being Al-Hakim, so there's wisdom. And now there's this, that now Allah Ta'ala is that speaking about Him being Al-Aziz, so Izza, that He is the Mighty. And then He's also the Rahim. All three of these go together. Because Rahma without Izza is Da'af. Mercy without honor and might is weakness. And even though we're supposed to have mercy, there's no doubt. But there's times where you have to be that firm. You have to be firm. If someone is trying to trick you, if someone is trying to that get you to do something wrong, if someone is trying to, to get you to believe falsely, you have to be firm. If certain people need to be put in their place, you have to be firm. So in general, the way that we understand these words, and it applies in, in that that a way that is befitting to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is very different than how we experience these words, we understand mercy without izza is, is weakness. And that just as that izza without hikmah is naqs. And so to have that might without wisdom, it's deficient. Because you won't know what to do or how to do it. And you will mix things up. You will put things outside, outside of their appropriate place. So this is why all of these virtues, they're actually all combined and interwoven. And they have different ways that they manifest. And even though oftentimes we speak of them individually, so we speak of rahma, mercy, we speak of having izza, we speak of having hikmah, our goal really then is to learn how to apply all of them in their appropriate context. But we have to be reminded of that greater context because just because you speak about Rahmah, that it doesn't mean in a particular situation where someone's trying to take your life, Rahmah, Rahmah. No, you're supposed to defend yourself. And yes, there might still be Rahmah 
underline everything that it is that you do, or in doing certain things, but, or after the fact or whatever, but the whole point is, is that there's times where you have to be strong and you have to be firm. And so we want to have a balance of all of them. And that wisdom, putting things in its proper place, doing things at the right time, and not going to astray in any of these manifestations. Again, the idea of Salat Mustaqim. It's the hardest thing to do of all. Being balanced is the hardest thing to do of all. Doing everything properly in its particular time, in the way that it's supposed to be done, with all of the details and all of the nuances, this is the hardest thing of all. But we keep taking ourselves to task. We keep trying. We keep learning. We learn from our experiences, so forth and so on, and then we get better and better and better. And this is why if we have this idea of what some have recently called the growth mindset, is that the difficulties that you go through, the challenges that you face, will be turned into opportunities for you to grow. For you to then learn, okay, that I've tried this and that, and that doesn't work, and I've made this particular mistake, so that next time that you do it, you can do it in a more perfect manner. Tanzil al-Aziz al-Rahim, a revelation of the mighty and the compassionate. And so, that Allah Ta'ala in the past, that three verses has that described or in the in, 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 in the previous verses including this has that showed that we have to have ta'zim of the Quran in a number of ways. First by swearing by it, because Allah only swears by something that is great. Second by describing it as being Hakim, as being wise. That and then so that relates to that uh, verse two, not the previous verses, just verse two rather. Um, and then in this verse is that this idea of tanzil and that he is being lofty in rank al ali al muta'al tabarak wa ta'ala and that us then receiving it and then that Allah tabarak wa ta'ala attributing the Quran to himself tanzil al aziz al rahim so this tanzil this revelation comes from Allah who is al aziz al rahim there are so many different nuances in Allah Ta'ala's book. And once you start to really look carefully at the words themselves and the placement of that the various words and particles and the grammar and how it's all read and what comes before it and what comes after and then that the verses one in relation to another and then you trace different that themes of the Quran and why that when Allah Ta'ala talks about the Surat and the Surat and Mustaqeen here does he speak of it in this particular way and what about in other chapters Oh my, this is why that the that meanings of the Quran that are like waves of the ocean, they're incessant. Mm -hmm. And the more and more that you think that you learn, the more and more that you realize that there is to know. And we will die not even exhausting the tiniest bit of the, a fraction of what mm -hmm. this blessed Quran contains. But we have to try. And we, this is what we ask Allah Ta'ala for, openings in His book. And every year we want to have an increased understanding. We want to have an increased but in better implementation. May Allah Ta'ala bring our hearts to life through the, the words of the Qur'an. Bless our heart to be attached to it. May Allah Ta'ala bless these meanings to penetrate the depths of our being. Give us tawfiq in all of our different affairs. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadan wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. لتنذر قوما ما أنذر آباؤهم فهم غافلون. That you might warn a people whose ancestors were not warned, so they are heedless. So here, that this verse starts with لتنذر. And so, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that given the Quran to the Prophet and it is, of course, revelation. And the purpose of that is so that our Prophet would warn a people whose ancestors were not warned. And so that we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has that sent the Prophet as both a Nadir and a Bashir. He is a warner and he is also a giver of glad tidings. And again, similar to that what we spoke about last time, Allah Ta'ala is Al Aziz and He is Al Rahim. Depending upon how we respond to the message will depending upon what it is that we face. 
And so that if we respond to the message with acceptance and that we hasten to put it into practice, is that we will experience the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that it will be a bishara, it will be a great glad tidings for us. And the opposite is also the case if someone obstinately refuses to accept the truth, is that they will face one of the rigorous names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that then they will relate to the Prophet in so far as that he is a nadir, that he is a warner. And so, لِتُنْذِرَ In order that you may warn. And there are other verses as well that include this idea of warning. Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Al-Sajda, لِتُنْذِرَكُمْ مِنْ مَا أَتَاهُمْ مِنْ نَذِيرٍ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ In order that you may warn a people who have not had a warner that like you, that uh, who have not had a warner uh, that come before, before you. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهِمْ قَبْلَكَ مِنْ نَذِيرٍ and we have not seen to them before you a warner. So there's other words, there's other times in the Quran that this word warning, uh, this idea of warning comes in. And really what is this, what is it, what does it mean to be in Nadir? What is this process of indar, of giving a warning? It's to inform someone about something very painful that was going to happen in the future some type of that harm that is going to come. And really, if you think of that, even in the Prophet and being a nadir, it is also a mercy. Because if someone is trying to ward off harm from you, ward off pain from you, that there, that's a, there's a mercy in that. And some of the tafasir go into great detail of looking when Allah Ta'ala says, لِتُنْذِرَ that you might warn. They say that the, what is included in that particle and that verb is a lot of things that are implicitly indicated, that are implicit in that expression. And so, for instance, they say that if I were to give you money and say that I am giving you this money so that you can perform hajj, mm -hmm. what do I really mean by that? Well, here's money, now you're able to go to Hajj. But I'm also really indicating by that, okay, that you need to get your pictures in the modern day and that you need to get your visa and you need to make your provisions and you need to get your flights and you need to figure out which group that you're going with. You need to learn the fiqh of Hajj. You need to do everything that you need to prepare for the Hajj. Go on it, fulfill it completely so that you can actually that fulfill what it is that I gave you money for in the first place. So there's a lot included in just litundira. Yes, in the end, for those that don't accept it, it is a warning of something that is going to happen in the future that is going to be bad for those people. But it also includes all of these other things that relate to conveying the deen. So litundira, for our Prophet Sallallahu to be a warner, what is implicit behind that is he's doing all of these other things to convey the deen. In other words, is that he وسلم, was commanded to call to the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bil hikmah wal mawaitat al hasana wa jadil hum billati hi ahsan. He was commanded to call to Allah with wisdom and a good admonition into that converse with them in the best of ways. وسلم. So all of that is included that in the, this idea of the of warning because these are all that. These are, these are parts of the greater whole. لِتُنْذِرَ قَوْمًا مَا أُنْذِرَ آبَاءُهُمْ فَهُمْ غَافِلُونَ And specifically that here is related to warning a people that Allah Ta'ala says whose ancestors were not warned. And there's actually a lot of debate about this ma, what it really means. We're going to just focus on a single meaning and that translated as such, that those whose ancestors were not warned. And so who is the Qawm? Who are these people that are being referred to? Is that this relates to the Arab first and foremost because the Prophet was that sent first and foremost to them because he was Arab and the vast majority of people around him were Arab. But then by extension, because he was a universal Prophet, all people. So the Qawm here relates to the Arabs, but also that everyone else. 
whose ancestors were not warned. And so this is, is what refers to what is called fetra. Not fitra when we talk about the natural disposition of the human being, what is called a fetra. And that a fetra is a gap in messengers. Okay? And so the zaman al fetra is the gaps between the certain messengers. And so in relation to the to the Arab, it was the gap from the time of Sayyidina Ismail to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In relation to other peoples, it was the gap, for instance, between that Sayyidina Isa until the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we know that our Prophet is a universal prophet. So once he, he was sent, is that it is now binding upon everyone who reaches them the da'wah of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to believe in him and to follow his teachings. And so that gap of fetra will differ according to where that someone was geographically located on the earth. And so that it will differ according to who was their last prophet that was sent to them. So there'll be different that and there'll be a different amount of time for different peoples. But for the Arab, that it gets back to Sayyidina Ismail. Ma'undira Abahum, whose ancestors were not warned. And then we see what is the result when people have not received that access to prophetic truth. What is the result? So they are heedless. And this is what happens. You can only imagine what life would be like without the teachings of our Prophet In fact, you can't imagine that how dismal that life would be, how terrible things would be. That it actually is unimaginable to think about how horrible things would be were we not to have the teachings of our Prophet our state would be one of ghafla, a state of complete heedlessness. And the scholars say that ghafla is sahun ya'talil insan min qillat al-tahafudi wa tayqad. It is a state of forgetfulness that overtakes the human being as a result of lack of wakefulness, tayqad, and the half of which maybe here you could say um, it's this process of preparedness and of, of that being ready to do the things that need to be done. In other words, is that as a result, is that for them everything is the same. Their heart's not alive. Their heart is that not move to do something that of good. Their heart is not moved to think about the truth or reflect upon the truth. And that this trait of ghafla goes hand in hand increasingly as we get closer and closer to the end of time and we move even within the realm of the believers from less quality, more quantity and less quality is that this is the state that overtakes the heart. In other words, is that to the degree that we're in a state of ghafla is to the degree that we will lack true quality as a believer. And on the contrary, to the degree that we are wakeful and that we are aware and that we are conscious and that we are that doing everything that we do with intention will be to the degree that we are that distant from this ever so reprehensible trait. But this is the result. If we do not have prophetic guidance, people will remain in a state of complete heedlessness. And once you open up the door for heedlessness, that you could speak a lot in great detail about what that would cause you to do in relation to your behavior. And in fact, that all acts of disobedience, all mistakes that we make, ultimately get back to heedlessness. If you are aware, how could you do something that is wrong? That if it wasn't that you fell into a deep state of heedlessness, how could you sin? Recognizing that Allah Ta'ala sees you at all times. Is that this is one of the that root diseases of the heart that absolutely must be treated. And that one of the great blessings of the prophetic teachings is that it treats this that epidemic disease of ghafla, heedlessness. Now, 
This also applies to the inheritors of the Prophet that want to remind the Ummah of the Prophet and those in his time or her time is that the importance of the prophetic teachings and that just as you have that these gaps in the sense of the prophets and messengers is that you also have these gaps in relation to the righteous amongst the prophets ummah and so there are times where that there people have more access to scholars and righteous people than others and there are particular particular geographical locations where at one juncture in history there's not much access and then increasingly they'll have more and more access and this is the way that things work and that the same thing is said to them in the sense is that anyone that exists in any particular location were not to be representatives of the Prophet Sallallahu who have embodied his teachings and then teaching them is that people will remain in heedlessness and this is why they say if you want to find if you want to determine rather the life of a community, you ask yourself two simple questions. Are there any gatherings of knowledge in that place? And are there any gatherings of remembrance? Are people making dhikr and are people learning? And if you go to a place and you find that there are no gatherings of knowledge and no gatherings of remembrance, it's a sign that that city or that community or that village or town is dead. And if that town is dead, it doesn't mean that you can't find a righteous person in that place. You might, but it will be dead. And that what will usually happen when that there are a lack of gatherings like the ones mentioned is that heedlessness will overtake the people. Whereas if you go to a place and you find that there's actually a lot of gatherings of knowledge, a lot of gatherings of remembrance, it's a sign that it is alive. And I remember that feeling as I was visiting Syria uh, before the war in the year 2008 on a trip, uh, the now, one of the Nawi trips that Dr. Omar used to do, and Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad was there. And we started in Halab in Syria, and we eventually made our way down to Damascus. And it was such an amazing feeling. Just how many gatherings were taking place in one city. And of course, Damascus is big. But how many gatherings were taking place on the same day, at the same time, and literally from morning to evening, seven days a week, there are multiple gatherings of remembrance and learning. And when you step into that environment, without you even knowing what is taking place, you feel your heart alive. <clears throat> you feel your heart alive. And you see after Salat al Maghrib, and the mosque that you just prayed in, you might have been there for another purpose, and all of a sudden people are that just funneling in to attend the class that is going to take place between Maghrib and Isha. That does something to you. It brings your heart to life. Mm -hmm. But the key here is, without gatherings, there is no way for us to be reminded, there's no way for us to that attain what it is that the deen has that commanded us to attain. And so, this is something that we hope to see in that the places that we live, we are in the United States of America and wherever everyone else is tuning in from, is that we want there to be gatherings of knowledge. We want there to be gatherings of remembrance. And unfortunately, we are still at a stage where we actually have to convince people, maybe not so much with knowledge, but gatherings of remembrance, definitely, that this is something that we should even be doing. And we tend to forget the importance of these gatherings. And these majalis are the ways whereby which the prophetic inheritance of Rasulullah is transmitted and disseminated. It's done by way of the gatherings. Yes, that it also is done by way of suhbah, taking the companionship of righteous men and women and seeing them in their everyday life. And you could benefit from them immensely outside of a formal setting of a gathering. But these, one of the Part, one of the foundational ways that this is transmitted is through these gatherings. And this is why, again, to this day, when we speak of, in the positive sense of traditional Islam, in the traditional Muslim world, the remnants of which still are very much alive, wherever you go in the Muslim world that you will find this, that there are gatherings that take place at different times. And this is, again, something that we hope to see in a culture that we hope develops 
where every Muslim, every Muslim, now we're not talking about a scholar, we're talking about every Muslim should attend a gathering of knowledge and a gathering of remembrance once a week, every Muslim. And that is a very basic level. And every Muslim as well must have teachers, at least one, that they can ask their questions to when an issue arises that they don't know the answer for. That is a religious requirement. We're not talking about now what is better or even best. That is a religious requirement that we have trustworthy people who have learned their deen that can clarify that to us our questions and give us good answers and so that we can worship Allah Ta'ala upon insight, that we can conduct our affairs upon insight and to make sure what it is that we're doing, that whatever it is that we do, we're well informed and we're not doing something that goes against our deen. But all of this is in, all of these meanings are in this verse. That you might warn a people whose ancestors were not warned, so they are heedless. Because this is what happens, is that when we leave that people to be as they are, is that they will naturally, because by virtue of entropy, because it applies to human beings as well, that move towards a state of heedlessness. This is the way human beings are. They will naturally move towards a state of heedlessness, just as if you have hot water or very cold water, it will move towards room temperature water is that you have a that center if you don't clean it and we all know very well here if you don't clean things regularly what happens it will get very dirty and i heard that cups start to mold and all these other types of things very quickly in other words if you don't put energy in quickly to combat entropy the natural state is to be in disarray the natural state of the nafs is to be in disarray to be in a state of lafla and this is why we have to open up our heart to prophetic teachings. And this is why it's such a blessing <coughs> to have people that actually warn us. And people get very uncomfortable with this type of language. But the very fact that they're uncomfortable is even a bigger problem because they're not going to be in a state where they're even going to benefit when someone is actually that's guiding them or advising them in a way that they actually should be. So, it's very simple. Without the prophetic teachings, people will remain in a state of heedlessness. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse 7, he says, لَقَدْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ عَلَىٰ أَكْثَرِهِمْ فَهُمْ لَا يؤمنون. The word has indeed come due for or proved true against most of them, for they do not believe. لَقَدْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ And The meaning of this verse is, one of the meanings, is the qawl here is referring to that other times in the Qur'an where Allah Tabarak wa ta'ala says, for instance in Surah Al-Sajda, وَلَكَنْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ مِنِّي لَمْ نَأَنَّ جَهَنَّمَ مِنْ الْجِنَّةِ وَالنَّاسِ يَجْمَعِينَ Is that what happens when people, after being told the truth, obstinately refuse to accept it and deny it? Is that What's going to happen is that this word is going to come true. What word is it? When Allah Ta'ala says that indeed that I shall fill Jahannam from human beings and jinn together. Mm -hmm. That's Allah Ta'ala, mm -hmm. And that this is the necessary state for a person who dies in a state of disbelief. After having had the da'wah reach them and refuses to accept it. We ask Allah Ta'ala to protect us and to preserve us. Mm -hmm. And this type of understanding, again, a lot of people in the modern world feel very uncomfortable talking about these things. But we have to get beyond that feeling of discomfort. This is not about me, this is not about you. This is about truth and this is about the way that Allah Ta'ala has chosen things to be. We do not have what it is that we desire. Am lil insani ma tamanna. Will the human being have all of what he wants or desires. It's not about what we want. And Allah Ta'ala has decreed that things are going to be a certain way. And the only thing that we can do in relation to that decree 
is to accept and to submit and to do what it is that we know that we should do to save our own necks and to help as many other people as possible. And that's all we can do. And that before this is that our response is one of humility, is one of brokenness, and of one of taking heed that this is haq. And we know that as that we are taught to say is that and that ma ja'abihi Muhammadun haq everything our Prophet came with is truth. One the jannata haq and paradise is true. One in nara haq and the fire is true. One in the sa'ata atiyatun la riba fi la riba fiha and that the hour is coming. There is no doubt in it. Wa an Allah yabathu min fi al-qubur and Allah will resurrect all people in their grave from their graves. And this is again that we have to respond to this with the response of iman. Lakal haq al qulu ala akthariyum. The word has indeed come due for or proved true against most of them. And this is the state. And even if you look even to this day, even though the number of Muslims has doubled pretty much percentage-wise, if you compare the turn of uh, the 14th Islamic century to the that turn of the 15th Islamic century, we jump from roughly 12% to about 25%. It roughly doubled. But still, that if you compare to the majority of people that live on the face of this earth, only one in four is Muslim. Mm. And so, part of this is to come to terms with reality and how it really is. We should have an unshakable faith such that were we the only believer on the face of this earth, we wouldn't waver. And our faith is not going to come complete until that's how we are. And that we have to that reach that level of spiritual and religious maturity where we know truth for what truth is and then we find the people of truth as opposed to that determining what truth is by men and women, other people. If that is our way, that oftentimes that we will that fall short in the process and mix up and conflate the two. And once we find the truth though, part of maturity really is, is that we dedicate ourselves to it and then we disassociate ourselves <coughs> from other people in relation to their own particular search of truth or belief in what truth is. Now, that's very easy to say, very difficult to actually do. Because when we're exposed to people, especially people that speak in very crafty ways and that are trained in almost a magical type way to that delude other people, and to frame a certain way of speaking about something in such a powerful way that they draw people into their world very easily, as that this is something we have to be aware of. And the rhetoric of the modern world, no doubt, from a Muslim perspective, the closer and closer that we get to the end of time, will also be Dajjalic in that sense. And there will be a lot of illusions that in what it is, in deception, there will be a lot of deception in what people are saying. And this is one of the traits of the end of the time, of end of time is that there will be khiyana, that there will be deception. And so, that لَقَدْ حَقَّ الْقَوْرَ عَلَىٰ كَثَرِهِمْ فَهُمْ لَا يؤمنون. And that this call here, as we mentioned, is that Allah Ta'ala is what He said in other places in the Qur'an about the punishment for people who deny. And some of them say that it also relates to the Qur'an. In other words, as we've mentioned before, is that just as people's response to the messenger is indicative of who you are as a person. Likewise, the Quran, it is a hujjatun naka or alayk. It is a proof for you or it is a proof against you. And this is why is that this has to be our approach to the Quran. As that when we go to it, that we look at our own selves, to what degree am I thinking Qur'anically? To what degree am I behaving Qur'anically? To what degree is my heart acting Qur'anically? In other words, all of the teachings of the Qur'an that pertain to belief, that pertain to different things that we do outwardly, or <clears throat> pertain to that states of heart and how we should be internally, is it to what degree does that my behavior and everything that was mentioned, belief and so forth, correspond to the Book of Allah Ta'ala. And if there was some way to measure that, 
is that we would find some people it's 2%, other people it's 4%, some people it's 10%, other people it's 15%. But again, the further that we get from the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu the lower the percentage. And this is something that simultaneously we have to recognize where we're at, but also to help people move forward to increase. And so it gets a bit tricky because there is no doubt a serious problem in continuing to water down the religion. Because what happens in the next generation? What happens in the generation after that? And personally, as someone who was a Protestant Christian growing up and then became Muslim, I'm not interested in a Protestant version of Islam. That is very uninteresting to me. A watered down that version of the truth. No, that what brought me to Islam was believing that this is true and that this is haq. And that at the level of belief, at the level of practice, I remember from the bounty of Allah Ta'ala when I found out that there are all of the individual rulings in Islam, that we had a, that there was a sharia, that there was a law. That was something that attracted me to this religion. Whereas people oftentimes speak of it as, oh, there's so many rules, oh, I have to do this, I have to do that. That was something that actually attracted me. Because to me, that's a manifestation of guidance. And as someone who believed in God before I converted, part of the disconnect for me was not having a law that would regulate my behavior. Because there was a disconnect between my belief and the things that I was doing outwardly. But when you have a law, you can have guidance manifest at every that level of your being and in all of your interactions and all of your different states. What a blessing. The Sharia is an immense blessing of our Prophet. So it's, it's an immense blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why we need to embrace it and to love it and to implement it in our lives. And by doing so, that it will, that draws nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, فَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Is that they won't have faith. If they refuse to accept these teachings, there will be a lack of faith. And the reality of these people that لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Allah Ta'ala is going to give us a the way of thinking about this. And even though there's difference of opinion, is that this is that part of the rhetoric of the Qur'an, is that we can picture that what is the metaphor or the parable for people who don't believe, and how can we actually visualize what that really is? So then, in verse number eight, Allah Jalla Jalla says, "Inna ja'alna fi anafim aghalalin, fahiya ilad khani, fahum mukmahum." So Allah Taala, salama wa afiyah. We have put yokes on their necks, reaching their chins, so that their heads are raised. So there are some scholars that say that this will actually be the state of the disbelievers in the next world. And so that there is a reality to this. That others say that it relates to a specific incident where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that protected the Prophet from people that were trying to harm him. But first and foremost, is a metaphor for the reality of people of disbelief. Is that they are incapacitated and unable to do anything ultimately that as a result of their disbelief. And this is why that we're also taught in the Quran, لا يغرنه تقلب الدين كفروا في البلاد Do not deceive you the moving about of people of disbelief amongst the different places on earth. So we should never be deceived by that just because someone has some type of material or technological prowess and the things that they're able to do and so forth and so on, is that the more that you root yourself in a Quranic worldview, the more that you will realize is that there is so much deception that lies in so many of the things that people are able to do here on earth. We need to remind ourselves is that power ultimately belongs to Allah, Jalla Jalala. So we have put yokes on their necks, reaching their chins. And one of the, if you want to visual, visualize this, is that you can imagine that something like the way that would be like on an ox, mm -hmm. that going around the neck of an ox. And that it's such that 
it's pushing the chin up and you can't put the chin down. And then on top of that is that the hands are chained. And so that when this is obviously a very uncomfortable position and it's a type of torture, is that as a result for whom look for whom is that their heads are raised. And some of them say is that this is specifically mentioned because is that arrogant people are known to kind of keep their heads up. And so now that as a result, as a type of punishment, is that they're not able to do what it is that they should actually be doing, which is we are people that should love ourselves before Allah Jalla Jalla. But this is a form of punishment for them. Now that what is really meant by this is, is that they are unable to do anything as a result of their disbelief, but also is that this state that they're in is representative, just as they in of themselves never incline towards or turn towards the truth, never directed their gaze towards it. This is likewise the requisite that punishment that, that happens to them. Is that so they will physically be in that state where they're not able to do what they wanted, were able to do that they, they, they ref, refused to do that religiously or spiritually. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَعْنَا مَنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِهِمْ سَدًّا وَمَنْ خَلْفِهِمْ سَدًّا فَأَلْشَيْنَاهُمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُبْسِرُونَ So they're already chained and they have a yoke upon their neck and that either in the actual sense or that metaphorically speaking this is that what their state is in relation to the truth but not just that and we have set a barrier before them and a barrier behind them and thus have covered them so that they cannot see a said is a barrier and so that if you have a barrier before you you're not going to be able to see what's before you and if you have a barrier behind you you're not going to see what's behind you and some say that this means is that they won't understand what it is that they should do or believe here in the world. They're blinded from what's before them and they're blinded by what's behind them. In other words, is that let alone what they should be believing or they're preparing to do for the hereafter. So there is a barrier before them and the barrier is a barrier behind them. In other words, is that they are blind from the signs of Allah. The signs are there, but there's a barrier on both sides and they're unable to see them. شَيْنَاهُمْ And thus we have covered them. And then the result of that is, فَهُمْ لَا يُبْسِرُونَ They are unable to see. Why is it so important that we as Muslims study this? Because it's only in recognizing these realities is that when we look out and we actually listen to what people are saying, or you interact with people, we will understand what's behind what it is that they say and do. So in reality, this should strengthen our faith because we see this right before our eyes. There are people like this in existence. No matter what you tell them, they're not going to listen. And this is why, that in relation to our Prophet, his job was to do balad, was to convey the message. His job was to just warn. In the end of the day, you can't do anything for anyone. Unless that person wants to help their own self. You can't. All you can do is to do everything you can possibly do to point people in the right direction, to speak to them in the right way, to take the right means, to start with gen gentleness and then not move to that toughness or firmness until you've exhausted all of the opportunities to do things with the utmost gentleness. But then after that, is it, it's not up to you. Guidance is not in our hands. We cannot force people to do anything. And even if we did force them to do something, is that it wouldn't benefit them anyway if the only reason they did it was because someone else forced them to do it. So, all we can do is to live how it is that we should live, and then to do our best to help other people to the extent possible. And that's it. And if you do that, you will meet a lot to add in a good state. And in relation to the other person, Allah Ta'ala A'la, what will happen to them, what is written for them, will reach them, period. If Allah Ta'ala wants good for them, they will be guided to the truth, that they will then that better themselves, and if they've already accepted the truth, they'll have higher degrees of practice that goes along with it. So this is all we can really do. 
But the reality is that there are certain people, as a result of them going astray inside, it was their choice not to accept. But this is what happens. Is that it's as if not only are they chained up, but they're blocked from the front and from the back, and they're covered. In other words, there's no way for them to see the light of truth. They're going to be blinded to it as a result of what it is that they did to their own selves. And that for those that it's written for, this is what will happen. And it's not to say that someone can't be in a bad state and then better themselves. It's possible someone could be in a bad state. So it doesn't mean that anyone in that state right now is necessarily going to die in that state. No, the people that Allah Ta'ala only knows who is going to die in that state, this is who he's referring to. Because he knows that these particular individuals are going to die in that state. As for the people who are in a bad state, whether they be disbelievers or whether they be believers who are falling short, is that there's still hope for them as long as they're alive. And the greatest thing that we can do is take the movement of the heart to that want to embrace the truth or after we've embraced the truth to want to better ourselves and to draw near to Allah Ta'ala. And this, this slightest movement of the heart is that Allah Ta'ala open up a door for you. And then the more that you do, the more doors that will open up for you. And the more energy you put in, the more that you will get back. And anyone who makes the, the slightest movement of the heart will ultimately be guided. And we should know that with absolute certainty. Anyone who that makes the slightest movement of the heart. And what is meant by the slightest movement of the heart is to do something, even if you don't know what to do. To search for something, even if you don't know what to search for. To make a movement in the heart. And if you can't even do that, you at least make the intention. And if you don't even if you can't even do that, you make the intention to make the intention. And if you can't even do that, you make the intention to make the intention to make the intention. But you have to take that first step and make that first movement of the heart to get yourself out of this particular situation. As for people that never accept truth, this is really their state. Is that they are chained up and that they are that blocked from ever that having the truth that enter into their hearts and that if they don't repent or change their state before that, it's likely that this is going to be their reality in the next world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Mm-hmm. And the final story that I wanted to mention today that relates to this verse is our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and um, when that during his lifetime when a number of the disbelievers uh, wanted to take his life and they plotted against him and that they surrounded his home Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and their plan was is to choose that different people, young men from different tribes, so they could all collectively take his life. And that way, there was no way for that the Prophet's clan to seek retribution from the Lai Sendam. So we've all heard that story where they surrounded the house in Jibreel before that night that he informed the Prophet Sendam, about what was going to happen. And he said that don't sleep in your bed tonight that you normally sleep in. And that the Prophet Sallallahu arranged for Sayyidina Ali to sleep that in the place where he normally slept. And so that they even go into great detail about the, uh, the, the garment that was placed over Sayyidina Ali is that he had a, a green burda placed over him that he slept in. And um, then the Prophet Sallallahu had that, so when they surrounded the house, um, and uh, they were wanting to kill the Prophet is that the Prophet went out. And that he went out, and there's different narrations, and one narration is that they were they had actually slept, in one narration they didn't see the Prophet But he was reciting these verses of Yasin, but as he left his house. And um, that beginning with Yasin, and then ending, la yusirun. And and so that and thus we have covered them so that they cannot see. And they actually uh, mention that, that this these are verses that you can recite uh, if there is a good reason for you to recite them. And um, I, I know someone who was on his way to Hajj and he lost all of his papers. 
and they were going through the checkpoints and the papers were completely lost. And as they came to the checkpoint, as it one of the shiuk that was written said, start reciting the beginning of Yasin and just keep reciting. And they came to the checkpoint and they asked for the passport of every other person in the car. It was as if that they didn't even see this person. And then that they proceeded beyond the checkpoint and that they were never asked about anything or where's their paperwork or where's their passport or anything like that. And that this is from the blessing of recitation of Surat Yasin. Our Prophet was reciting the Salai Seven as he went out. And that it says in the narration is that you would normally think that if someone is fleeing a group of people that are coming to take their lives, is that you would hurry off quickly. But to show his absolute trust in Allah, is that he went to every single one of them that, and took a little bit of dirt and put it on their head. Took a little bit of dirt and put it on their head. Went person by person by person, that putting a little bit of dirt right on all of their heads. And in that narration where that they were sleeping, they woke up, and it found that there was dirt on their head. And in the morning that they realized that it was actually Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib who was in the bed and not the Prophet And the other narration where that they were still awake is that the Prophet left and none of them saw him. And then that they asked, where did Muhammad go? And someone later said that, oh, he passed this way. Anyhow, that he did recite these verses, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Allah Ta'ala that through them protected him from uh, those and likewise is that these are that a, a protection for his ummah that when it is that there's something that you need to be protected from but also it also is a warning is that we be people who are blinded from the truth and that we protect ourselves from having a way of being or that can carry ourselves in a way whereby which that we that don't have the proper humility and every all the other qualities of heart that we need to have to be able to have truth penetrate into our hearts. May Allah Ta'ala bless us with these ayat mubarakat and to give us tawfiq in all of our different affairs and open up our hearts to their means. And may Allah Ta'ala bless us with absolute certainty and believe in everything that is that we're supposed to believe in and live and die upon that faith as unpopular as it is in the time in which we live. May we be from those who are raised to the highest degrees of closeness to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, by remaining firm in these teachings and by, remain, by doing what it is that Allah Ta'ala has commanded us to do. May we receive the greatest rewards in this world and the next. Wa sallallahu ala seyyidina Muhammadan wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi wa barakatuh. The terms with reality. And the reality is, there are people of iman and there are people of kufr. There are people of belief and there are people of disbelief. And this is important for us to know the way things really are. Because if we don't approach life understanding that things are a certain way, you're going to get burnt and you're going to get yourself in trouble. It's like someone who naively enters into the corporate world and starts a job and thinking that everyone's going to be very nice and friendly and just help them out and all these types of things until that coworker of theirs was vying for the same position, <laughs> stabs them when they can in order to get that position. This is just one little example, but the archetypal person, the vast, a good portion of people, sometimes <clears throat> even family members, <laughs> will do the most unimaginable things. And it could be out of jealousy, it could be out of envy, it could be for a number of reasons, it could be out of greed. But it's important for us to understand the world in the way that it really is, is that there is evil out there. There are archetypal people out there that will harm us. There are people out there, no matter what happens, is that they are not going to believe. There's always going to be disbelievers. At the same time, Allah Ta'ala has made it a way of our showing servitude to Him to want guidance from everyone, for everyone. We should want guidance for everyone and do everything we can in those meanings of litundira in order that you may warn is that first and foremost we live up to the reality of these teachings and we take all of those steps starting with mercy and gentleness and that moving up in all of the different degrees until that there's a degree of firmness at the end. And so even though Allah Ta'ala mentions here about warning it doesn't negate that whole process that you go through with each individual. But again, most importantly, how we carry our own selves. And the secret of the general wilaya that's in the heart of every believer 
and the specific wilayah, if someone reaches that rank, is that this is what unlocks people's hearts. And yes, it could be from a book for some people. Yes, it could be without even a means outwardly. But the vast majority of people, this is how it works, is that they're affected by people that they come across. And as a result of that interactions, it unlocks the heart as a means to open them up for hidayah. وَالسَّوَاءٌ عَلِيهِمْ أَأَنذَرْتَهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تُنْظِرُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Whether you warn them or you warn them not, it is the saying to them, they do not believe. And that there is a that narration in the Dala'al of Abu Nu'aym on Ibn, the authority of Ibn Abbas is that the Prophet وسلم, is that he was reciting the Quran near a, and he, he was reciting the Quran and then he went into sajda. And when he would that recite the Quran that in the early stages of Islam is that um, many of those who would hear him amongst the disbelievers of Quraysh would get bothered by this. And that one of them at one point uh, that was so bothered that he came to that harm the Prophet وسلم, and that when he was coming to do this is that this what was mentioned in the previous verse of his that hands being that chained to his neck this happened to him where his hands were miraculously that drawn to his neck and he was unable to move and that then they realized that, that this was his state and that he that remained like that until another person tried to do something and then that he couldn't see the Prophet وسلم, so the barrier before and the barrier behind and then that they realized that something had happened so they came to the Prophet وسلم, and that وراحم, basically we are petitioning you that by virtue of your kin that can you do something or just pray so this does this that his condition is removed from these people and the Prophet وسلم, did and then that the person's hands came free and then the person was able to see properly and then that Allah Ta'ala that revealed the first verses of Surah Yasin up until this verse أَمْ لَمْ تُنْذِرْهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ that and even though these people witnessed a miracle even though they set out to harm the Prophet وسلم, and one of them his hands were changed the other was blinded so that he could hear the Prophet but he couldn't see him is that they never actually came to believe and that's really if you think about that subhanallah someone could actually witness a miracle right before their eyes but they don't believe. Other people, is that even without a miracle, is that Allah Ta'ala casts faith into their heart. And so we ask Allah Ta'ala that any situation that we're put in is that we respond to that situation in a way that is pleasing to Him. And that this is the danger because it's very easy to become veiled from people. And that especially when people have a humanity. And it is even that the uh, elect of the elect of the elect of the inheritors of the Prophet وسلم, is that they're still human beings. They still have a human side to them, and that sometimes people have expectations of people that they expect them to almost be like an angel. Where we're human beings. There was one of our teachers, teachers, whom uh, he had a number of students, and one time one of his students saw him walking out of the washroom and he said that Habib Ibrahim uses the washroom? He said, I can't believe Habib Ibrahim uses the washroom? <laughs> and he saw him walk out of a washroom and he just he couldn't believe that Habib Ibrahim used the washroom. Of course Habib Ibrahim right, uses a washroom. That all human beings right, use a washroom. But sometimes that happens where that you have such a high opinion of someone that you forget that they're actually a human being. And then on the other hand is that sometimes is that people are blinded by the other people's humanity. Is it where they're so preoccupied with their humanity or a mistake or a fault that they have is that they don't allow themselves to benefit from that person. So these are two extremes. One of them is excessive in this way, the other is excessive in the other way. And what we want is balance. The way we view prophets and messengers is different than the way we view other people.
The way we view the Sahaba is different than the way we view other people. The way that we view the elect Imams of this deen and the extremely pious people across the centuries is different than the way that we view people that aren't at that degree of knowledge or at that degree of piety. It differs. And even in our time, is it part of religious maturity? And this is something that we have to talk about time and time again because there's so many problems about this, especially in the present time, is that we have to recognize where people are in the hierarchy of knowledge because there is a hierarchy. And we can't put things in their improper places. Because what that does is it harms us in one way or another. If we think too highly or take, think that we can take more than we can really take from someone, we can get ourselves in trouble. And then we'll block ourselves from good if we become so preoccupied with a, the human side of them or even some of their faults. And what happens is when people have these extremely high expectations in people, and then somehow they get burned or something happens where they lose their trust or confidence in that person, it really harms their deen. It really harms their deen. And that could, you could protect yourself from that to begin with by having a degree of religious and spiritual maturity where you put things in their proper place and you know what to take from whom. So you have realistic expectations. And unfortunately, we live in a time where just because someone knows how to speak a little bit of Arabic, they can quote a verse of the Quran or a hadith of the Prophet and have basic oratory skills, people think that that's the Shaykh of Islam. And while I'm the first person to say that everyone should be involved in the da'wah, everyone should do what they can to serve and to help, and we want to have a type of community whereby which we empower individuals, but part of that requires is that the individual himself or herself knows his or her limits, and the community has the maturity of knows to what to take from each particular person. And that what you might take a general point of the of some general understanding of the deen from one person, right? Doesn't mean that you're going to take a fatwa from them. Doesn't mean that you're going to be able to ask them about a verse in the Quran and what it means. Doesn't mean that you're going to be able to ask them one of these extremely difficult, what you could call civilization or generational questions that would require that teams of the greatest ulama right, in the world to get together and really deliberate for an extended period of time. And sometimes people want microwavable answers for these huge issues. And it's one of the ways that you actually really determine that the true people of knowledge, what do they talk about and what do they not talk about? And that a true person of knowledge is very comfortable in knowing where they're at in the hierarchy. Are they just in the very beginning stages of learning? Or are they that a seasoned student of knowledge? Or have they studied such that they've reached a basic level of scholarship? Or are they a seasoned scholar who has years of teaching experience and has researched and has that read a lot of that different books on different topics in both Islamic sciences and others? Or are they scholar scholars? All of them are different. And we have to put everything in its proper place into all of them, or in relation to someone's piety. What we take in relation to someone's piety doesn't mean that we necessarily take in relation to some outward definition of the deen. Is that you could benefit from someone's piety, but if they give you advice, it might actually not best be the best advice. And they might or might not be a person of keshf and unveiling that, no, you have to put everything in its proper place. And generally speaking, is that safety is in the outward. And you'd be surprised how many people that base important life decisions off of a dream. One dream, and they base all of the life decisions off of a dream. Not that it can't happen, it can. But you have to put a dream in its proper place and understand what that dream potentially means and how to that, that relates to other things that you do when you go about making decisions. And in general, is that the vast majority of istikharas even that are answered are not through dreams. It's actually through another process of divine facilitation where you see what doors Allah is opening for you and what doors are closing for you. Anyhow, this is a very detailed topic. We went on a little bit of a tangent, but it's important. And that we went on the tangent because 
is that we were talking about the importance of understanding that the time in which we live specifically, but understanding that the same human tendencies that have been there from the beginning of time will always remain through every time. Tashabahat qulubuhum is that their hearts are similar. The same archetypes will repeat themselves over the course of history. And they're repeating themselves as we speak to this very day all around us. And for us not to think that there are different archetypes out there. You have disbelievers, you have munafiqeen, that you have believers, you have various degrees within that. Very righteous people, but then you have people who want good but then harm you without realizing all of these different archetypes. And when Allah loves you, He'll put you in a situation where you're around other people where you start to learn about them. And even though sometimes it's bitter and sometimes it hurts, as we experience these archetypes through our interactions with other people, is that you learn. And that's really key. And that there's something that I've been introduced to recently that I think is very beautiful and very, very important. There's actually a book about it called Mindset by her name is Carol Dweck. And that she talks about what is called a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And the idea of the growth mindset is, is that every experience that you go through in life, you turn it into a learning opportunity. Instead of the fixed mindset where you really don't believe that you can actually grow and you use your experiences in life, whatever they may be, whether it be a job or a test, to confirm what it is that you already feel about yourself. You're going to limit yourself by having this perspective. It doesn't mean that people like that can't have some relative degree of success, primarily worldly, but the growth mindset is much closer to the teachings of our deen is that every situation that you go through is that you approach it from the standpoint of what can I learn from that? Because as we go through tribulation that will respond in different ways. But if we approach it as such, is that it will strengthen us. And part of maturity is reaching the point where you know how to deal with the people and you know the way that people really are or the way that people could potentially be. And then it's a balance ultimately of knowing how to understand reality, but also maintain your husnul dhan. Because normally we only speak about husnul dhan, having a good opinion, and we don't speak about any of this. And that you're conflating two different religious concepts. You're conflating the two. We absolutely have to have husnul dhan. But husnul dhan relates to judging an individual's intentions. It doesn't mean that you don't protect yourself. It doesn't mean that you don't understand potential harm that could come to you from a particular individual or persons or people. No, you put everything in its proper place. And the classic example that they mention of that is, you don't walk out to the store and see some shady people on the side of the road and be like, I'm going to have a good opinion of them. They're not going to take anything in my car. I'm going to leave my car open. No, whether there's people there or not, is that those interactions are based upon su'avlan, and what is meant is that you actually assume the worst. You always lock your car. And so that you can protect yourself from people that would potentially, that want to, that take something from your car or whatever else. So we put everything in its proper place. But we have to understand is that in every time there's always going to be disbelievers. This is part of the qada and the qadr. This is a part of the divine decree and divine destiny. There will always be disbelievers in every time. And at the same time, when you know that, and this is confirmed obviously by the world in which we live, which is roughly 75% non-Muslim, is that you understand we have a job. And the job that we have as believers is to share our faith and to live its realities that so that the people that we interact with can experience the beauty of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah just as we do. And in that regard, there will be different ways people respond. There will be some people like, that's great, I'm so happy for you, but I'm not interested. There will be people that are saying like a little bit more firmer that, okay, that, you know, I don't think what you're doing is a really good thing. And then there will be people who, that will demonize you. And then there will be people that want to physically harm you. And then you will have the worst shayateen that want to completely eradicate you from the face of this earth because they think that you are that the quintessential disease to humanity. There's degrees. And all of them exist. 
And sometimes you don't know where even your next door neighbor is or the people who is working with you at work. And sometimes people that say one thing to your face but behind your back is something different. In other words, there's a whole bunch of different archetypes. What Allah is teaching us and that what Allah is also that teaching the Prophet first and foremost and by extension us is that no matter what it is that you do, these people are not going to believe. But one, it doesn't mean that you don't still try. What it means is, is that you don't that force yourself to be in a way that you shouldn't. And we should remind ourselves that Allah described in two places in the Quran our Prophet as almost killing himself out of grief. Perhaps that you are about to kill yourself out of grief. And so that for our Prophet ﷺ, he was so concerned about people, is that it was weighed very heavy on him when people didn't believe. And that that's the ideal way that all of us should be, is that we realize the repercussions of disbelief, but we are doing our job. And then, so for the Prophet, these verses become a type of teslia, a type of bringing solace to him because he's reminded وسلم, is that he doesn't guide whom he pleases. As we know in Surah Al-Qasas, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتْ Indeed, that you do not guide whom you want, وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءَ But Allah guides whom He wants, وَهُوَ أَعْنَمُ بِالْمُهْتَدِينَ He has more knowledge of who truly is rightly guided. So these verses remind the Prophet ﷺ that he cannot guide those who Allah has not guided, and by extension us. We cannot guide anyone, even our own children. All we can do is do what our part and to show them the right way and the right direction. And that we hope is that they will be like the children of Abraham and that we fear that they will be like the children of the child of Noah. The child of, of Noah is that he wanted to work it on himself. Is that I'm going to go to the top of the mountain and it's going to protect me. And that subhanAllah, that he disbelieved. And so that the archetypes are all there. And what we have to do then is to do our part and to hope for the best. So, is that what Allah Ta'ala is, uh, He's addressing our Prophet Sallallahu telling us about those who are persisting in the state of disbelief, is that no warning will benefit them. And why? Because in and of themselves is that they are not ready, they're not prepared are they not going through a process whereby which they are trying to accept truth? They are not people that are willing to that have humility before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't have a desire to reflect upon the signs in creation or that the message of the Prophet وسلم, and to that look in what is happening around them and all these signs that indicate the existence and oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you don't have that desire or make that movement that we've described in the heart, nothing that anyone can ever do will ever benefit you. And there are other verses where that speak of uh, that where warnings and guidance are of that no benefit to the believers. Allah ta'ala that says in Surah Al-A'raf, وَإِن تَدْعُهُمْ إِلَى الْهُدَىٰ لَا يَتَّبِعُكُمْ And that even were you to call them to guidance, is that they would never follow you. سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْكُمْ أَدْعَوْتَمُوهُمْ أَمْ أَنْتُمْ صَامِتُونَ It is the same, whether you call them or whether you remain silent. And then Surah Al-Shu'ara, قَالُوا سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْنَا أَوَعَذْتَ أَمْ لَمْ تَكُمْ مِنَ الْوَعِذِينَ It is the same for you, it is the same for us, whether is that we admonish them or that we admonish them not. Khair, inshaAllah. So, وَالسَّوَاءٌ عَلِهِمْ أَنْ ذَرْدُهُمْ أَنْ لَمْ تُنْذِرْهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ And then, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He says in, in the 11th verse, إِنَّمَا تُنْذِرُ مَنَ اتَّبَعَ ذَكْرًا وَخَشْيَ الرَّحْمَانَ بِالْغَيْبِ فَبَشِّرْهُ بِمَغْفِرَةٍ وَأَجْرٍ كَرِيمٍ you can only warn those who follow the reminder, i.e. the Qur'an, 
in fear of the All-Merciful, in the unseen. To Him, bear good news of forgiveness and a generous reward. And so now that Allah Ta'ala is telling us who are going to be the people that benefit from the Qur'an. Innama, and this is Adat al-Hasr, it restricts the meaning to that, in this case, those that are that being referred to here. Innama tundiru man al-dhikra. You can only warn those who follow the reminder. Who follow the reminder. In other words, is that these are people that are that actively trying to put this knowledge into practice and everything that following entails and the attachment of the heart that is there and that everything that we do also inwardly and even outwardly this idea of following a dhikr the reminder and that the reminder is one of the names of the quran the Quran's name is a dhikr one of its names. And then in, surah, in chapter, uh, verse 69 of Surah Yasin is that وَمَعَلَّمْنَا شَعْرَ مَا يَنْبَغِي لَا إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا ذِكْرٌ وَقُرْآنٌ مُبِينٌ So even in Surah Yasin, there's another reference to the Quran as being dhikr. And here, when we speak about the Quran as a reminder, there are three primary meanings to the Quran being a reminder. First, as it is a reminder of the pre-earthly covenant that every single one of us took with Allah Jalla Jalalu. Second, it is a reminder of our purpose here on earth. Third, it is a reminder of what's going, what's going to happen in the next world, the hereafter, and the reality of the two final abodes. And that one important point here is that all of these meanings, that then we have this idea also of dhikr in the sense of invocation. So the word dhakar yadkuru can simultaneously mean to remember and to invoke. And the two go hand in hand. And the way they go hand in hand is, is that the more that we remember Allah, the more that we invoke Allah, the more is that we will be reminded of all of those meanings of being reminded, our pre-earthly covenant and the purpose here on earth and where it is that we, what are, it is that we are returning to. So in other words, is that of all the forms of worship, it is dhikr that allows us ultimately to live a purposeful life here on earth. So when you say that what is the purpose of life, that if you go a little bit deeper and get beyond just a sloganized response to that, that it's actually that gets back to dhikr and about being in a state where you are living meaning in every single moment, which comes from a simultaneous process of seeing everything as being from Allah and remembering Him. Ta'ala. That is the person. So you could have someone that believes there's meaning in life, and you could say that there's someone that conducts their life to a certain degree, such that you could say that they have meaning in their life, but it's only the people that are constantly in the remembrance of Allah Ta'ala, could you say is that that is a person who is leading a meaningful life in all of his or her states. So, a dhikr is one of the names of the book of Allah Ta'ala. Innama tundiru. You can only warn man ittaba'a dhikr. This is the first thing, is that there's ittiba'a. A conscious intention to follow, to put into practice, to learn, to make a reality in your life of what is in the reminder, i.e. the Qur'an. And then secondly, وَخَشْيَ rahmana bil ghaib. These are the two straits, straits. Is that they fear the all-merciful in the unseen. Now, again, if you look very carefully, that every word in the Qur'an is perfectly placed. Khasha is roughly translated as fear, but it is a fear that is that accompanied by deep reverence and awe. And this is why that it requires knowledge of Allah who He is, because Allah says, "Innama yakhshallaha min ibadi al-ulama." It is only the learned that will truly have fear of Allah, because it's only when you truly know Allah is that you will fear Him, and that 
you will have you will be in awe of him and you will tremble that when you mention his name and our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that even though he was the most beloved of all of creation to Allah had the most fear of Allah why because he knew Allah better than anyone else no one knew Allah jalla jalalu like our prophet and once you understand what that means the implications of that the implications of the jalali attributes of our lord jalla jalalu of his majesty and his rigor and these names and you're really aware to the extent humanly possible of those names and you're witnessing them at the heart level how could you have anything else other than that how could you have anything else other than how else would you have explained say no one a khattab who was one of the ten in mubashirin the paradise who was one of the closest companions to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and you could go on and on and on he was granted he was given glad tidings by the prophet himself that he was going to paradise at the same time he would say things like were the mother of umar never to have given birth to umar like how do you understand that how could you possibly explain that that he could have that degree of fear when he was guaranteed on the tongue of the prophet whom he believed in his that glad tidings was going to paradise this is the way these people are with their lord because they understand that the implications of the majestic attributes of Allah Ta'ala so fear is something that is important why because fear is a protection fear is a protection it is a it's biologically been placed in us to ward off harm from us just as desire also is a protection if you had no desire to eat food and you didn't like certain types of food it would be hard to sustain yourself so fear and desire are two tools whereby which and you can even call them faculties that we simultaneously ward off harm and bring about benefit but here the discussion is one of fear and fear the all merciful now allah ta'ala is mentioning ar-rahman subhanallah that he could have said here allah he could have said any one of his other names normally when you think of fear you don't think of mercy but it was put there on purpose of course and imam al uh, Fakhr al-Din Razi that he says here wa khashya rahman fihi latifa there's a subtle meaning that when you look at this he says wa hiya anna rahma turith al-ittikal wal raja is that mercy could lead someone to rely upon their actions and to have excessive hope fa qala ma annahu rahmanun rahim so he said even though he is the rahman and the rahim fa al-aqal la yanbaghi an yatruk al khashya فإن كل من كانت من كانت نعمته بسبب رحمته أكثر في الخوف منه أتم مخافة أن يقطع عنه النعم المتواترة. He said so that he mentioned here fear, and then he mentioned the name of Allah Taala Rahman. Is that so that we can know? Is that anyone whose blessings come to them as a result of mercy, that is that uh, that his his fear of those blessings. is that more complete because it will preserve him that from having those blessings being taken away from him so you have hope but you also when you receive blessings having a little bit of fear that you've received blessing is an important thing because you might do something to have that blessing taken away so you have to have hope and you have to have fear in all of your different states and you have to give thanks of course all of these virtues are intertwined and they go one with another but the vast majority of people who receive blessings don't have a component of fear there if we have blessings we should have a bit of fear not a type of fear that is related to a dunyawi that plenary worldly type thing of losing it merely but that being having the divine favor taken from us is really what what is he's mentioning here so it's to indicate is that even though that Allah Ta'ala is Ar-Rahman is that we still have to have fear of the Rahman because we can't have so much hope such that we think that oh there's nothing that I have to do we balance the two so there's fear and there is hope and that 
There's fear in understanding that the majestic attributes of Allah, and there is hope in understanding the merciful attributes of Allah. Wa khashya rahmana bil ghaib. And so that uh, that he says here, the Allah Taala says, is that in the fear the all merciful in the unseen. And what is meant by that is, is that when we worship Allah Taala, that we don't see Allah Taala with our physical eye. Is that He is so apparent that He is hidden, Subhanahu Wa Taala. However, is that we don't see Allah with the physical eye, but we know that He exists because of everything He's brought into existence. It is fitrah that. It is for us to come to the conclusion that it is impossible for any of this to be here in and of itself without having a cause. It's so obvious is that for someone to deny that, there's no other explanation than sheer kufr, sheer disbelief. And then when it gets into compound ignorance, and people try all of these crafty ways where even now that they have found a way to that even prove this scientifically because of the Big Bang, it's very simple that this was that a means for all of this to happen if that's really how it did happen. And that all of these very crafty ways that they're trying to go back into talk about parallel universes and all these other types of things that are that very difficult to even understand to somehow get out of what everybody knows is wired into their basic fitra that every effect has a cause. And it gets into very complicated forms of compound ignorance. Well, that's the amazing thing is that some of these people have been trained in the world's best institutions and that you have a child that has a higher degree of intellect than they do from this standpoint. Because if that someone doesn't come to believe in the existence of Allah with their intellect, no matter what it is that they know by way of knowledge, is that they've missed the most important thing that they're supposed to use their intellect for, which is to take you to the existence of God and to believe in His oneness. And then leads you to treading the path of actually that following up on the dictates of that belief, which is to have practice that leads to that and knowledge of Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala. Wa khashya rahmana bil ghayb is that we worship Allah even though that we do not see Him. And so we should always remember that the ghayb is what is in the unseen. And it is a station to believe what is in the unseen. And what does Allah Ta'ala say about the muttaqeen? Alladheena yu'minuna bil ghayb. There are those who believe in the unseen. So some people will present this as, oh, this person this believes in something that he can't see. But this is precisely a station to believe in something you can't see. And that how do we affirm the realities of what we can't see? It's through who? Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that much of our belief that is all of our belief that comes through him وسلم, he is the one who teaches us how to believe but one third of aqidah relates to the sam'iyat which literally means the things heard you could translate it as eschatology but it's everything that will happen towards the end of time in the grave and everything in the afterlife we believe in that simply because our prophet told us to believe in that because the human mind has no access to the knowledge because it is beyond the realm of the intellect. So we establish that by our belief in the truthfulness of our Prophet So how could the Prophet not be central to this deen? If so many things are important in relation to what we believe are established only through him. Understanding who our Prophet is and our connection to him is central to this deen. It's central to it. Is that all of the details that we learn about it that stem from our connection to Him. And it's only when we follow His way and we follow His Sunnah are we even preparing ourselves to begin with to be able to that know Allah wa ta'ala. And when you see it as such, is that you understand why in so many places in the Muslim world throughout the centuries there is such a focus 
on Sayyidina Muhammad وسلم, and loving him and singing praise praises and learning about his life and all of these different ways that have developed historically they're so beautiful because that this really is a shortcut all of the details that go in that if you just focus on him وسلم, and your connection to him وسلم, is that it will be not only a protection from you, but it will be a means for you to attain the highest degrees of closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This also could mean is that these people have khasha of the Rahman, the All-Merciful, um, that of actually what's going to happen in the next world by way of punishment, even though that we haven't seen that. And that there are even some say that this also that refers to that worshipping in a state of seclusion, وَخَشْيَ الرَّحْمَنَ بِالْغَيْبِ فَبَشِّرْهُ بِمَغْفِرَةٍ وَأَجْرٍ كَرِيمٍ To him bear good news of forgiveness and a generous reward. So give glad tidings to this person. So again our Prophet is Nadir and he's Bashir. And give that person glad tidings of not only Maghfira, so all of the mistakes that you made, all of the sins one committed, there'll be forgiveness. And then an Ajr. Kareem. And if you notice this, it's not just an ajr. It would have been sufficient for a reward. Because any reward that comes from Allah Ta'ala is going to be great. But ajr, kareem. Kareem. Ajr, kareem. And that, this is why when we say one of the meanings of the, when we say the Al-Quran Al-Kareem, yes, the Quran is noble. But the Quran is also kareem. It gives. It gives jewels of wisdom. That time and time again, time and time again to those who reflect upon it. Ramadan, Ramadan Kareem. Ramadan is Kareem. That everything is ultimately from Allah, but Ramadan is the means once this month comes, is that there are gifts that people receive that they don't receive outside of this month. Well, Ajr Kareem. That if a Ajr is generous from Allah Ta'ala, what on earth could that possibly be like? And it's not even on earth. Because we're on earth and we have no real conception of what that's really going to be, other than the names. And that the way we experience that though, if you've ever been to a generous host in the Muslim world, or you have friends, and you, you know people that are true people of generosity, there's something about the experience that you have with them, you just love these people in a way that it's, it's very difficult to describe. And... Um, they're out there. Uh, they, they seem to be less in the country in which we live, uh, but they're out there still. And there are people like that even here in the United States of America, but especially when you go overseas, there are in many of these traditional communities people that are known for extreme generosity. And um, that I remember in the days of Mauritania, one of the students of Marabat al Hajj, his name was Muhammad Zayn. And um, he was known for extreme generosity. And people thought that he was actually very wealthy, but he really wasn't that wealthy. He would actually that go into debt to take care of his guests. And it was more so than anything else, was the fact that he loved guests so much, is that it's almost as if he probably hasn't eaten a meal that in the past 40 years of his life without a guest. That's what they mentioned about Sayyidina Ibrahim is that he would always eat with a guest. And one of our teacher's teachers, Habib Muhammad uh, Sa'ad, uh, Habib uh, Muhammad bin Alwi al Aydurus, known as Habib Sa'ad al Aydurus, who passed away fairly recently, Rahimahullah, that he would that never eat lunch except with a guest. He would just wait. And the vast majority of people, food is, food is put down, right? We eat very quickly. But he would literally wait for a guest to come to his home. And um, uh, another one of my teachers, I remember one time visiting him in the morning time, and the breakfast table spread was probably put out fairly early. <clears throat> and I went in, and it was untouched, and he was sitting there. And he was literally waiting for someone to come, so he didn't have to eat by himself. And that this Sheikh Muhammad Zain, is that when you go visit him, SubhanAllah, and I keep in mind, Mauritania, the food was very simple. We were used to in Tuimarat eating 
plain rice. Usually they had black eyed peas. On a good day, that'd be dried meat and just enough oil to make the rice palatable and to be able to get it down. It, had, it was virtually tasteless. And that's it. No vegetables, nothing else. That's it. Just a plate of rice. And then dinner was even more difficult. It was just couscous. And not like the fine white couscous that you get like in Morocco with all the veggies and all that. It was just very thick brown couscous with a little bit of dirt in it. And that's it. And a little bit of butter. And um, breakfast wasn't much more of a help. You have these very, I think that the plainest, they are the plainest biscuits I've ever tasted in my entire life. And maybe some peanuts. And they compensate with their very sugary tea. If you ever drink in the Mauritanian tea, there's much more sugar in it than the Moroccan, that fine green tea with na'na. Anyhow, is that this is what you're used to. And then you go visit Sheikh Mohammed Zain. Subhanallah. That he serves breakfast, like a proper breakfast. And then a pre-lunch, and then a lunch, and then a pre-dinner, and a dinner, five meals a day. And then milk was very rare there. You'd only really get to drink milk in the fall because they're just the, ca the cows didn't have or goats didn't have much to eat so they didn't produce a lot of milk and he would they had this what was called shneen which is basically sour milk he would serve you like milk milk like three times during the day this other drink another three times in the day and tea so many times from morning to evening you forget like how many times you drank it and I was the first time I'd seen a camel slaughtered Right when he, he slaughtered a camel for us. And he would ask you, what do you want to eat? When you'd come, he said, what do you want to eat? And he was serious. He would insist upon, what do you want? Do you want to eat lamb? Do you want to eat goat? Do you want to eat right beef? Do you want to eat camel meat? Like, and he would insist that you, and then he would slaughter it right then and there, and cook it for you, and have this elaborate presentation. And it's just like, this is his life every day. He loves having guests. And the amazing thing is, his wife is even more generous than he is. Is that she loved it just as much in the times where he's not there. She assumes the maqam of that receiving all the guests and cooking for everyone and subhanAllah. And this is just his life. This is just his life. And just day in and day out, day in and day out that people are coming over. And this is a family that has, this is their path to Allah. And the thing is there's, fam there's, there's families like this all throughout the Muslim world. And it's amazing. Every place you go is that when you're exposed to these type of people, you realize what it means to be kareem. And if that's in the dunya, the whole point of mentioning all those details, what about the akhirah? If that's the way you, what you experience here in the dunya, then what about ajr that is kareem from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It's unimaginable ultimately, the way that we will experience this bliss. And all we have to do is hang on for a very short period of time, a certain number of years. Most of us might live the average life expectancy for man and woman. We might live to our 70s or early 80s, if that's the case. The general atmar of the Prophet ﷺ, the lifespans are 60 to 70. If we live a little bit longer than that, okay, we might get closer to our 90s and maybe to live to 100. But in the end, it's like walking through one door and going out the other in the end. It's like dreams of someone who's sleeping or a shadow that just is moving about is that the intelligent one is not deceived by this. We're going to be here for a very, very short time. That's why we have to open up our heart to the Quranic message and to do what it is that we need to do now so that we can reap the fruit in the next world and that we will speak about that the meanings of verse 12 and those beyond and tomorrow be the night ara may Allah ta'ala give us a tawfiq and bring our heart to life through these blessed verses of the Quran may Allah ta'ala bless us with the close connection of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and bless us to have khasha in a way that is pleasing to him like that of the ulama and the awliya and the salihin may Allah ta'ala fill our heart with nur and with barakah and with khair wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Or there is a discussion in the ulum of the Quran that referred to the Aba al Wahi, the burdens, if you will, of revelation. And we know this was something difficult for our Prophet to bear. And that how could it be otherwise when 
is, is coming from Allah Jalla Jalalu. And were it not to be that Allah Ta'ala strengthened our Prophet وسلم, he would not have been able to bear revelation. And were he not to have been able to bear revelation, you and I again would not have access to it. And we should think about the verses in the end of Surah Al Hashar. لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لريت خاشا متصديا خشية الله that were we to have revealed this Quran that to a mountain is that you would have seen it that full of fear and split asunder from the خشية of Allah خاشا متصديا خشية الله a صدع is a crack something خاشا متصديا that is split asunder and so pulverized from the power of the Qur'an is that a mountain which we normally think of as something stable and something strong is that it would have been obliterated from the power of revelation in other words is that the heart of our Prophet وسلم, is much 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 stronger than all of these metaphors of things that we usually use them to that speak about strength the heart of the Prophet was stronger he was able to bear that revelation and then convey it to us. And this is why the companions used to know when the Prophet was receiving revelation because they would see the changes on him. And we have narrations that indicate when he was on a camel, for instance, وسلم, that that camel would kneel down. And that one time he was on the lap of Sayyidina Bakr Sadiq and it became extremely heavy. And there was times where the Prophet وسلم, that would sweat even if it was in winter. There was an impact that receiving this revelation had upon him And then when we understand the greatness of revelation, every verse of the Quran, every that verse, not only verse but even word of the Quran we understand has great meaning. Is that it came to our Prophet exactly the way that our Lord wanted it to and it was perfectly conveyed and that perfectly received and then perfectly conveyed and alhamdulillah over 1400 years later is that we still have access to the meanings of revelation and even though our Prophet وسلم, was the that quintessential that example par excellence of a walking Quran is that through his inheritors is that they are the closest approximation and then there's different degrees but still to this day there are complete inheritors of the Prophet وسلم, and then there are those that even reach a higher degree of being complete whereby which that our connection to them that helps us have access to these meanings in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book and that's one way we have access the other way is through that the tafsir literature and learning everything that is that we need to know in all of the prerequisites so that we can understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book our attempt here is just to very, very, very briefly, in a very basic way, start to touch the surface of some of the most basic meanings. And that's what we're trying to focus on. And in that regard that we have reached the 12th verse. After Allah Ta'ala says, وَالسَّوَاءٌ عَلِيهِمْ أَأَنذَرْتُهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تُنذِرْهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Whether you warn them or not, it is the same to them. They do not believe. And we spoke a little bit about that verse. You can only warn those who follow the reminder and fear the all merciful and the unseen. To him, bear good news of forgiveness and a generous reward. And then that Allah Ta'ala says in the 12th verse. Truly we give life to the dead and record that which they have sent forth and that which they have left behind. And we have accounted for everything in an imam in mubin, translated here as a clear registry. So the majority of today will be spent on that this verse. And so this verse follows up on the counsel to the Prophet وسلم, is that he has to convey the message and that when he conveys the message and warns his people, this is all it is that he can do. And that we know that the result of conveying that message, 
which comprises this process of warning and a giving of glad tidings, is that ultimately the consequences of that will play out in the next world. And so now Allah Ta'ala that begin that, that that in this verse speaks of this idea of giving life to the dead. In the Nahnal Nuhyan Mota. Truly we give life to the dead. So that there's a transition now to speak of what are the results of that the way that we respond to the prophetic call, to the prophetic message, whether we believe or we disbelieve, and what's going to happen to the individual after this. And that also is that this indicates to us is that when we speak about this idea of warning, and we speak about this idea of giving God tidings, is that Allah Ta'ala that we'll follow this up with mentioning some of the foundational affairs that pertain to the usul al-imaniyah, the foundations of our faith. And so that when Allah says, Inna nahnu nuhiyan mota, truly we give life to the dead. There are a number of possible meanings for this. So just very quickly, that the mota are the dead in the plural. And that ahya yuhyi is to bring to life. So we give life to the dead. And that there are different types of people that can all be considered to be dead. And first and foremost, this is a reference to the resurrection. The after Allah Ta'ala that will that cause the first horn to blow and all souls will be taken, and then there's a 40-year period, and then the horn will be blown a second time, and then everyone will be raised out of their graves, and they will be driven to the plane of judgment. And so the resurrection belongs to Allah, is that those who were deceased, is that Allah Ta'ala will give them life. He will bring them back to life, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that when we spoke about these usul al-imaniyah, these foundations of faith, is that they say, Usul al Iman Thalatha. There are three foundations of Iman. The first is Tawheed, in belief in the oneness of Allah, which includes a long list of attributes His existence, of course, and then everything else that we attribute to Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Tawheed, belief in Allah, and everything else that that includes. And then, Ar Risala, that everything that pertains to the messengers. Risala here, messengership. And then Hashar, which is the gathering, literally, but in relation to everything that's going to happen in the next world. And so, as one of my teachers once taught me, is that when we talk about the science of Tawheed or Ilm al Kalam or Aqidah, roughly, loosely translated as theology, what we are really discussing is Allah Jalla Jalala. That really is the subject matter. And the ta'rif, the definition of this science, changed over time. But in reality, everything that you are studying, that when you study aqidah, you're studying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, either His essence, His attributes, or His actions. So His that, His sifat, or His af'al. And so obviously the first two is that His essence and His sifat, this is normally what we think of when we think of theology. But then, the reason that we speak also about the, the acts of God is that the two greatest acts of Allah are His sending of messengers and that everything that's going to happen that towards the end of time and then after that we, are, we die and then are resurrected. So the resurrection. So in other words, is that His sending prophets and that the Day of Judgment, everything that follows, are the two greatest acts of Allah, Jalla Jalalu. And thus that they had become their own um, chapters, if you will, or they are part of that tripartite breakdown of the science of Aqidah. Is it such that you study that which pertains to Allah, you study that which pertains to the messengers, and then you study that the Sami'at, that the eschatological events. And so that the first meaning of inna nahnu nuhyi al-mawta, that we give life to the dead, it's a reference to the resurrection. And the second meaning is the idea of Allah wa bringing the earth 
back to life. Allah Ta'ala says, Know that Allah gives life to the earth after causing it to die. We have clarified to you the signs so that you can understand. And then we have other meanings as well. One of them is, is that bringing people from idolatry to faith. Bringing people from disobedience to obedience. Bringing people from the depths of kufr to the light of faith. And that we know that Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Al-An'am, in the form of a question, Which translates, is a dead person brought back to life by us and given light with which to walk among people, comparable to someone trapped in deep darkness who cannot escape? In this way, the evil deeds of the disbelievers are made to seem alluring to them. And so there are some people that are dead, they're mates. But then Allah Jalla Jalalu, He brings them back to life. And anyone who has tasted the sweetness of faith, after tasting the bitterness of kufr, of disbelief, knows that something of this meaning has experienced intimately something of this meaning in its various degrees. But anyone who does not truly believe in what should be believed in is in a sense is dead. And even though that they actually have life, in reality that they're dead. And so there are certain people that Allah Ta'ala will bring them back to life. And then when you compare the state of these two, SubhanAllah, is a dead person brought back to life by us and given light with which to walk among people. And they notice here is that the light that comes to your heart and leads to that state of inshirah and that state of that the heart's expansion is that notice here Allah Ta'ala says finnas. And here the particle fi in connotes this idea of light spreading. So Allah Ta'ala says, Wa yamshi bihi finnas. Yamshi bihi finnas. And that to with which to walk among people. But it's as if that light is also that finnas going into people as a result of what is the state of heart. And for this reason, is that the very foundation of all of the foundations when it, we talk about da'wah or sharing our faith is our own state and how we carry ourselves. If you don't have something, you can't give something. But if you're living the reality of that faith and you have light in that heart, this is the number one thing of all that affects other people is your own state of heart and when you accompany that with good character and good interactions and that good intentions and all of these other things we're supposed to do, is that you will maximize that your potential impact upon other people. And that if you think about this, what Allah Ta'ala is saying here, is that as for the person who is steeped in darkness and that they can't escape, Ya Latif, is that this is the reality of the internal mindset of the state of kufr is that even though on one hand is that someone thinks is that there's some type of freedom and people are doing whatever it is that they're doing but the reality is that there is emptiness and there is darkness and sometimes you don't realize that the state you're in until that you experience something else so the second another meaning the third meaning of this verse in the nahnu nahnu mota is bringing people from disbelief into belief. And closely related to that is yet another meaning which relates to the reviving of the heart. That from that heedlessness to wakefulness, from ignorance to knowledge. So this is yet another meaning and uh, this is mentioned in the tafsir of Ibn Ajiba and he quotes Imam Qushayri is that bringing the dead hearts that are heedless to life that with knowledge and bringing the dead hearts that are dead through ignorance to life through that knowledge and so forth uh, through through ghafla through wakefulness and jahl ignorance through knowledge and um, as one of the poets said is it akhul ilmi hayyun khalidun ba'da mawtihi wa dhul jahli 
maitan wa huwa mashan ala thara as that the person of knowledge will remain that known and alive even after he dies because people are always mentioning his name whereas that the person of ignorance is as if that they are dead and they are walking that on the earth still and so this is the, the next meaning is that bringing the heart to life and as Imam Qushayri says is that hearts that have qaswa, hardness Allah Ta'ala can make them fertile and bring them to life such that goes and that these are hearts that set out on a path to Allah Jalla Jalalu So inna nahnu nuhyil mawta Truly we give life to the dead in all of those meanings and this is why when you understand that Allah is the muhyi and He is the mumit subhanahu wa ta'ala is that in every gathering when we come together and all of the different acts of worship that we do is that we hope that Allah Ta'ala through them will bring our hearts to life and that we'll experience what it means to truly live and that as they have said that a true life is always going to be connected to muhabba it's always going to be connected to love love of Allah and love of the Messenger of Allah and love of the righteous and love of what Allah Ta'ala loves in love of what the Messenger of Allah loves. This is why they say, La Aisha illa Aisha al Muhibbin. Aisha is another word we use for life. Just as Haya. There's no true life except the life of lovers. Because of what they experience from the beauty of everything it is that they do. And think about if you could just bring love into your life when it comes to fasting. We're in this blessed month of Ramadan. Is that someone that fasts out of love? There's not there's someone who fasts because. If I don't fast, I'm going to get beat. If I don't fast, I'm going to get yelled at. If I don't fast, that I'm going to get punished. Right? At least someone is still fasting, okay. But someone who wants to fast, someone who finds it easy to leave for a very short period of time, things that are beloved to the lower self for the sake of Allah Jalla Jalalu, out of love and muhabba. And how could it be really any other way when you really think about it? What is the whole purpose of fasting? I think we already spoke about this. Allah doesn't benefit from our fasting. <laughs> we are the ones that benefit. So it's not just about doing the fast. It's about the whole purpose behind the fast and what we attain from the fast. And we approach our fast as such, as this is something that we love to do for the sake of Allah Ta'ala, is that this will allow us to live that fast and to live the religious, religious life, which includes the fast, in ways that other people simply don't have an ability to do, in a way other people don't have an ability to do. Inna nahnu nuhyir mawta. In truly, we give life to the dead. Wa naktubu ma qaddamu wa atharuhum. And we record that which they have sent forth and that which they have left behind. When aktubu, literally means to write, but we've translated it here as record. And so, ma qaddamu wa atharuhum. And that ma qaddamu, a qaddam is your foot. And so that as you're walking forward, it connotes this idea of that forward motion and at that which is before you. And that which is going to happen, that in the future even. And so, when aktubu ma qaddamu, that which they have sent forth, what? The deeds that will testify for you or against you on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So Allah Ta'ala will write those down and record them. When aktubu ma qaddamu wa atharahum. And athar is a trace. For those of you that remember the that class that we did on fasting, we, different, we differentiated between the ayn of something and the ather. The ayn of something is its substance, and the ather is its trace. And when it comes to fasting, is that if you have some type of foreign essence that's beyond your mouth, whether it be toothpaste or whether it be some type of food or whether it be an impure substance, and someone to swallow that, it would break your fast, even if it's not food, even if it's dye or something like that. Now we differentiate between the substance of something and the trace of something. The ether, the trace, is that there might be that some type of smell that associated with it that you realize that it's still there, but the actual substance is gone. So if someone brushed their teeth, rinsed their mouth out really well, 
So there was no, that substance of toothpaste left and just kind of the traces of the smell and the feel of having that toothpaste on your tongue is that that does not break your fast for you to swallow that. So we differentiate between the two. But the word ather also means that it's, it's a footstep. And it's a trace in the sense of that which you leave behind because if you're walking through the desert is that you leave traces. And that there's different narrations they ask the Arabi, who was the desert Arab, how did you know your Lord? And he said in a beautiful way, and again there's different narrations, and he went on to say, that to speak about the constellations in the sky, in the waves, in the ocean, and that everything on earth. And then he said, went on to say, وَالْأَثَرُ يُدُلُّ عَلَى الْمَسِيرِ وَالْبَعْرُ تُدُلُّ عَلَى الْبَعِيرِ أَلَا يُدُلُّ هَذَا عَلَى السَّمِيعِ الْبَصِيرِ He said the footstep indicates that someone was walking there. The camel dung, dung indicates that there was a camel there. He said, does not all of this indicate to you the existence of the one who is that all hearing and all seeing? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, the very simple logic which is the way that we actually really should be thinking. It's impossible that there be an effect without a cause behind it. And so that the athar is a footstep that is left behind, a trace. So literally their footsteps or their traces. And the sabab al nuzul, the occasion of revelation for this particular verse, was that there was a tribe of the Ansar known as Banu Salima. And that their homes were on the periphery, on the outskirts of Medina Munawwara, such that it took them quite a long time to walk to the masjid. And because that they wanted to that be in the masjid more, is that they wanted to relocate closer to it. And that when this happened, is that this verse was revealed. And then the Prophet وسلم, that he said to them, Inna atharukum tuktab falhatantaqilu, is that the footsteps that you take to arrive to the masjid are written for you. He said, so don't move. And uh, there's other narrations that, that as well. Alikum manazilukum. He said to them that remain that where you are, فَإِنَّمَا تُكْتَبْ أَثَارُكُمْ You get the reward for the steps that you take. And so that this was something special to the Banu Salama, although in general it's good to live near a masjid, but for them is it because he knew that it wouldn't prevent them from coming to the masjid. He realized the great reward that they were getting is that, this is what he said, is that he told them to remain where they were. And this was, then the verse was revealed. وَنَكْتُبُ مَا قَدَّمُوا وَآثَارُهُمْ So it, it, it literally means the footsteps or traces, and this is the sub of the Nuzul for it. But then, that in a broader sense, that it also relates to the traces of the deeds that we leave behind. وَلَكْتُبُ مَا قَدَّمُوا وَآثَارُهُمْ Right, that which, the deeds that we have sent forth, and that which we have left behind. And this applies to both the good and the bad. And that as for the good, that we have a hadith that states, إِذَا مَاتَدْ insan in عَمَلُهُ إِلَّا مِنْ ثَلَاثَ If a human being dies, is that their actions cease except for three. صَدَقَ jariya, An ongoing charity. أَوْ عِلْمٍ Knowledge that is benefited from or a pious child that supplicates for them. So these are three of the greatest examples of ongoing charities. So those that do some type of ongoing charity and support a project and invest in it, that everything that happens and all of the benefit comes to all of the people that that attend the programs and everything else related to it is directly in the scrolls of those people who took part in it. And immense reward. And that goes on as long as that, that institution or that building or that project is there. As long as that sadaqah jari is there, is that someone is in their grave and still receiving reward and reward and reward and reward and reward. Or knowledge that is benefited from. And if you think about 
that all of the great people of knowledge who came before us and the enterprise of knowledge and the way that people quoted from this person and from that person, sometimes you don't even know where the original quote started because it's been quoted and requoted so many times. Is that all of those who took part in the transmission of that are all receiving reward to this day of everything that it is that we are talking about even now as we speak? This hadith that we just quoted, the blessed words of our Prophet ﷺ, think about all of the people that took part in the transmission of that hadith such that you and I can that graze in its beauty on this day. It's amazing if you really think about it. And so that knowledge that is benefited from, or they walid salih, a pious son or daughter that prays for them. And that this is also an indication that our children should pray for us. And we should pray for our parents on a daily basis. Especially if we have parents who that open up all the doors of goodness to us and that help us to that take the right path and facilitate for us that to memorize the Quran and to learn our deen and so forth and so on. That we should love our parents and make dua for them every single day. And that they benefit from it. And then that the beauty is that as well is that when you do that for your parents, Allah Ta'ala will grant you children who do the same thing for you. The way we deal with our parents is the way our children will deal with us. And this is the way that it works. And so that these are the three great that uh, these are the three great uh, ongoing charities. And so you can see how when you build an institution of knowledge, how that they combine that all three of these. Because it, it, there's no doubt about that, that it's an ongoing charity. And the whole point of it being institution of knowledge, that there's a transmission of knowledge. And then, is that there are people that come there, that all of them, of course, have parents. And when they're encouraged to do this, you can combine all of these meanings of this ongoing charity. And that, uh, in that, uh, that supporting institutions of learning. So that's in a more positive sense, but then we have another hadith in Sahih Muslim that speaks to us about initiating various types of practices. So in this hadith that the Prophet said, مَنْ سَنَّةِ islam sunnatan hasanatan." You could roughly translate this as whoever initiates in Islam a good practice. فَلَهُ أَجْرُهَا وَأَجْرُ مَنْ عَمِلَ بِهَا That he will have the reward of that and the reward of all of those who also act upon that, بعده, after him, من غير أن ينقص من أجورهم شيء, without having any of the rewards diminished. So everyone gets a full reward. But then it works in the other way as well. ومن سنة في الإسلام سنة سيئة, and whoever initiates into Islam a bad practice, كان عليه وزرها وزر من عمل بها من بعده من غير أن ينقص من أجورهم شيء. Is that he will have the sin of all of those who act upon it after him, that without diminishing that he, the sins of any of them in any way. So this also is that something that we need to take heed of. And so when Allah Taala says, "Wa naktubu ma qaddimu wa atharuhum," and that we will record that uh, that and we will record that which they have sent forth and that which they have left behind is that this is something that we really need to reflect upon. The seriousness of the various things that we do and the legacies that we leave behind. And that we should take stock of that what it is that we are dedicating our lives to. Because that when we pass and return to Allah Ta'ala is that we don't want things that are going to continue to channel that bad deeds into our grave. Uh, that is the last thing that we want. On the contrary, we want things that are going to channel good things into our grave. And there's a lot of details that we don't have the time to go into. What are that the list of, for instance, that good practices? There's a long list, just as there's a long list of bad practices. And that the scholar Imam Anawi says in his commentary on Sahih Muslim, that this hadith is a proof, is that the hadith about bid'ah is conditional. Meaning there's certain types of bid'ah that is being referred to in that hadith. Because here, that our Prophet is saying, Sunnah and Hasanah, a good practice. And that there's reward for initiate, mensanna, which is to initiate. 
So this is a proof that we have a more nuanced view of what is a bid'ah and you know, what is a not and, and what is not. So anyhow, is that we should really think about our actions and think about what are we leaving behind. And what we want to leave behind is only goodness and that we want to leave behind that legacies that will allow people to flourish in the future. And then Allah Ta'ala says, وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَحْسَيْنَاهُ فِي إِمَامٍ مُبِينٍ And we have accounted for everything in a clear registry. And that this refers to, first and foremost, the inscription of all things, everything that will exist from the beginning of time until the end of time in what is known as the Lawh al-Mahfuz, that is the preserved tablet. And we have accounted for everything, we have enumerated everything fi imamin mubin in a clear registry. And so what is translated here as a clear registry the Arabic word is Imam, and then the adjective of that is Mubin. So Mubin means to be clear to, that be, that, um, that um, elucidated. Uh, and the Imam, there are a number of that ways that we think about an Imam. The most obvious is that you have an Imam that leads someone in prayer. So the idea of that an Imam is that person which is, or that thing which is followed. So you also have the Khalifa of the Muslims, is also known as the Imam. You also have, for instance, a general of an army, is this word in Arabic could also be used for a general in the army. The one who guides you, like your travel guide, can also that, uh, be called an Imam. Even a, that vast path, a wide path, is called Imam in the Arabic language. And um, a book that is the mother copy whereby which other books are transcribed from it, is also called an imam in Arabic. And so you hear, if you have the most authentic edition of a t particular text that was then transcribed in manuscript form after it, that's considered to be the imam of those other texts. And so, is that what is really meant here is that, that the preserved tablet the, is, is the imam mubin, and it is the Imam in the sense that it is the leader of all of the other books in that all of the other books follow it. And what is that meant specifically by that is that we know that all of our actions that are recorded by angels, we know that. But in this sense is that their registers will follow in a sense what is recorded in the Lohan Mahfuz in the preserved tablet. And that one scholar counted up to 15 times where Allah Ta'ala refers to this Loh al-Mahfuz and refer to it in different ways, calling it Al-Kitab al-Mubin, calling it the Umm al-Kitab, and obviously the Loh al-Mahfuz, the Imam al-Mubin, Al-Kitab al-Maknun, referring to it in different ways that he counted 15 verses that refers to this. And when we start to get into a detailed understanding of what exactly is the Loh al that requires a much closer and detailed study. For now, what we are just going to describe it as followed is that it is that which all of the divine decrees are written in it. Everything that will be from the beginning of time until the end of time is inscribed in it. And I thought this was helpful uh, to quote this following passage. This is taken from Man in the Universe by Mustafa al Bedoui. He says, <coughs> in the context of relationships, um, to render these relationships clear, we must know that everything in existence was made according to a model or archetype in the eternal, immutable divine knowledge. Every relationship here below corresponds to another at a higher level, and so on until their origin in the uncreated divine knowledge. The first pair, so this is in the context of the pairs, which was created expressing this duality, which became the model for every subsequent pair, is that of the pen, the qalam, and the guarded tablet, the lohan mahfuz.
The first is active and represents majesty, and the second is passive in relation to it and represents beauty. The pen in the sense of the writing of the divine decree. The Prophet ﷺ said the first thing that Allah created was the pen. Then he made the tablet, then the pen was commanded to inscribe on the tablet Allah's knowledge concerning his creation from the beginning to the last day. This is a hadith in Tirmidhi. Thus the pen actively wrote and the tablet passively received its imprint. The first human pair was also of an active pole, Adam, who was first to be created, and Eve, his passive complement. And the idea is to, to understand the pairs in this idea of what is active and what is passive in relation to it. Everything that Allah has created has both a passive and active nature. But here is that the Lohan Mahfuz, what's important for us to understand now, contains that the knowledge of everything that is and will be from the beginning of time until the end of time. And we have accounted for everything in a clear registry. And if you notice, this verse comes right after Allah saying, is that we will record that which they have sent forth and that which they left behind. But then Allah emphasizes further, not just what human beings have done, everything. Everything that we have accounted for in a clear registry. And the Arabic word that is used here is that ahsa yuhsi, ahsayna. The na there is what we call in English the royal we. And the scholars say that it is used here that to indicate the, um, the, the magnitude of what is being said. Say now, this is something immense. If you really think about this, everything that was, is, and will be, Allah Jalla Jalalu has recorded that and accounted for that and enumerated that, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is amazing. Everything. And this word that Ahsayna, one of the names of Allah is Al Muhsi. And in general, is that it relates, this name also is one of the names that relates to knowledge, but it relates to something specific in relation to knowledge. And so that Sidi Ahmad Zuruq says the following about this name of Allah, He is the one who encompasses all existence in detail, such that nothing, not even a single atom, escapes his knowledge, and no state is hidden from him. So not only in relation to every atom, every state, he is the one subhanahu wa ta'ala that is accounted for everything and is fully and totally aware of everything and knows everything. And so this is why one of the ways that we can that translate this is the one who knows the knower of all separate things. And that in his commentary on the nine names of Allah ibn Ajiba, then he says, quoting one of the scholars before him, he who knows that Allah is the knower of all separate things can never be oblivious and neglectful of him under any condition. So the more that you bring that name to mind, is that Allah, yes, he is the knower. Allah, yes, is the khabir, the totally aware. But when you think about the name al Mursi, is that it even incites in you a greater state of muraqabah, of vigilance, because you realize that Allah Ta'ala knows everything, every detail, that every single piece of it, every single, ad, the es, every single, uh, the, he knows the essence of something, all of the traits of something, he knows the reality of things, and everything that could possibly be said about that thing. And then when you really think about your own knowledge, is that even this carpet that is right before us here, if you asked us, what is this? Okay, it's carpet. We're praying on it. But to what degree do we actually know this carpet? There'll be different degrees that uh, Tishambai is going to give us a lot more details because he has so much experience with this carpet and where it's from and where it's made and what the materials are and what you can do with it, what you can't do with it. None of us are going to know that. We know that, okay, it has beige in it, it has that a little bit of that um, off-white in it, there's red in it. We'll know some basic things. Okay, it's a bit comfortable and so forth and so on. But those that have a greater knowledge of it will be able to give you a lot more details of 
just this carpet that's right here and that what is made from where it comes from the inter and all these other types of things but then even that to what degree do we really know the carpet even if you knew everything you could possibly know about it from the outward perspective that what happens if you put it through a microscope times 10 you're seeing something else completely times 100 you're seeing something else completely times a thousand you're seeing something else completely then what is it when you get down to the basic components of matter, how much do we actually really know things? And then in terms of what we can know, and especially with all of these break scientific breakthroughs and the way that we're finding out fascinating things at the micro and the macro level still, is that we're very limited in what we know. Allah is the muhsi. He knows everything about everything. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we understand that name, is that the result should be is that we never can be oblivious and neglectful of him under any condition. Rather, is that he will stand in vigilant watch over himself or herself at all times, watching over all of our breaths, watching over all of our movements, and even times of stillness. Allah knows everything about us. Can we count our breaths that we take in one day? Even if you sat next to someone to try to count how many breaths that they take in one day. Everything. That should be our response to this name of our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَكُلِّ شَيْنْ أَحْسَيْنَهُ فِي إِمَامٌ مُبِينٌ We have accounted for everything in a clear register. And the purpose of this is ultimately that for that you and I to call ourselves to good behavior, to avoid disobedience, which is the greatest poison of all. Acts of disobedience are the greatest poison of all that kills the heart. And that to encourage us to embark upon a path of obedience to Allah Ta'ala, which is the greatest elixir of all, which is the greatest door that opens up all good. And that this is ultimately that why we've been created, so that we can show our obedience to our Lord Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and those that do and are sincere in their worship, is that the door of every all good will open up to them in this dunya, before the next. And so, insha'Allah ta'ala, we will stop there. And may Allah tabarak wa ta'ala that make us aware of these meanings and to that open up our hearts to be able to understand them and to put them into practice. May Allah ta'ala give us tawfiq in all of our different affairs and bless these nights and these days and bless our fasting and to bring relief to the Ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah ta'ala to strengthen the Ummah of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to protect the Ummah of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all of our brothers and sisters that are suffering in different places in the earth. May Allah ta'ala grant them relief. May Allah ta'ala give them solace and to make these in intense tribulations that they are going through burden was salaman that peaceful and cool upon them ya rabbal alamin wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wasallam walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin mhm you may uh, so is there a certain number of um, so when it comes to that, I would just say that uh, you really need a sheikh when it comes to reciting specific names of Allah Ta'ala multiple times. Um, that's not really an over-the-counter type of dhikr. Uh, the over-the-counter part type uh, of the over-the-counter aspect of the names of Allah is just reciting them uh, in their entirety from beginning to ending. So just reciting the nine names, Allahu Rahman, and however you're accustomed to doing it, uh, the way we used to do it in Tareem, they used to recite the nine nine names every every night, but they do it in congregation, and they would just do it. They would add, yeah, Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Malik, Ya Kudus, Ya Salam, Ya Mu'min, Ya Muhaymin, Ya Aziz, to the end, and so that's something we can all do because it comes directly from a hadith where you just from the beginning to end recite all of them so I would attempt to do that at least once a day as for reciting a particular name a particular uh, amount of times um, that's prescribed based upon need so that's, but it does you know there are um, you know that you know, there are times for a few you know we'll do that for you
Valkaria, the people of the town, and we'll get into what scholars say that that means. And that the meaning behind this is, is so that, that first and foremost is that those among the Prophet who deny the message, and by extension, all of those who deny that any prophetic message can take heed, that they can hopefully learn a lesson from that those that came before them and what happened to them. And as the principle states, if we do not learn to take lessons from the people of the past, is that we will be lessons for people of the future. If we do not take lessons from people of the past, we become the lesson for the people of the future, because it will fall into the same thing. And that this is why it's so important for us to learn lessons and to that go beyond the surface level of how we understand that human acts to understand the purpose behind them, which relates to ultimately the decisions that you and I make. And human beings are very subtle. And the way that we come to the conclusions that we make, the way that we make the decisions that we make is very subtle. And it requires an intimate knowledge of the states of our heart, an intimate knowledge of what is taking place there, and that why it is that we do what we do, and how does desire play its part, and how does shaitan play its part, and how does that relate to our temperament and all of these different things and our particular situation that we're in and those that are around us and the ways, way that we are raised as children and so forth and so on. That this plays out with different people in different ways. But the key is, is that we come to know ourselves. And some of those characteristics we share with all human beings and some of those are unique to ourselves. But we hope as we go through life, is that we make the right decisions. And Allah Ta'ala gives us tawfiq to be able to that do sincerely for His sake what is pleasing to Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to avoid all the different ways of going astray, the two greatest archetypes of which are to not know and thus go astray without knowledge, or to know, but to have our desires get the best of us, and so that we go astray based upon knowledge. And that, that latter state is more dangerous than the former. So Allah Ta'ala says in verse 13, وَضْرِبْ لَهُمْ مَثَلًا أَصْحَابَ الْقَرِيَةِ إِذْ جَاءَهَا الْمُرْسَلُونَ And set forth for them as a parable, an example, and a, le- a lesson, a similitude. The people of the town, when the messenger, when the message bearers, or you could say the messengers, came unto it. And so here is that the Prophet Wasallam is commanded to provide the Quraysh with an example of what happened to those that came before them when they denied the messengers that came with truth. And so that this is why Wadlarib and set forth for them is first and foremost a khitab, Allah Ta'ala is addressing Sayyidina Muhammad وسلم, and by extension Allah is addressing that all people who are that carrying out the prophetic message and that representing him وسلم, as his inheritor to the people that they are speaking to. And so that, that this is first and foremost a, an address of the Prophet and by extension all of those that are carrying out the prophetic duty after him. And set forth for them Lahum for them here refers to the again the Mushriki of the Quraysh, the polytheists of the Quraysh, whom that um, that were around him and that were described earlier as those whom that were denying the message. And a method in the Arabic language, actually before we get into method, sorry, I want to look a little bit at this word that Wadrib. Darba Yadribu is normally the word that we use for hitting someone. But the foundational meaning of Darb is that where that you take two things and you bring them together and such that they strike one another and then an impact is left. So that's really what is meant by Darb. And obviously you can think about when you hit someone that that's what happens, that there's forces used, is that you have, for instance, your fist, then impacting, touching that someone else's body, and then that some type of impact. So this is the foundational meaning of darb, and it is for this reason that it is used in different contexts as well. For instance, 
is that we also speak of it in the context of traveling. And that if you say that, that the reason that it relates to traveling is because is that, that when the traveler that walks upon the earth or treads the earth or his riding beast that he is riding upon treads the earth, يَضْرِبْ رِجْلَيْهِ بِرِجْلَيْهِ الْأَرْضِ is that he is in a sense hitting the ground that, or with his feet if he's walking or with the uh, legs of the animal, the hooves of the animal that he is riding. And then that there's imprints that are left. When you walk that there's footprints in wind that you ride that on some type of riding beast that footprints are left in the earth or in the sand or whatever. It's also a word that we use for printing coins. As you say, darba fulanun adarahim. Is it so-and-so printed that here in this sense silver coins or even gold coins? And the idea behind that is is that you that are taking that coin that you want it to look like, and you are pressing them. So it is that the, it, you are pressing the molds, and then you are forming new coins. And this is why that when we use this word with a method, which here we roughly translate as parable, is that well, little bit of method in, and so that you that setting forth a parable, what are you trying to do? Is that you are trying to impress? A lesson upon someone. So in all of these all of these meanings is that there's this idea of contact and then an impression whether it's physically hitting or whether it's traveling and the traces that you leave behind whether it's that printing coins and pressing coins and the idea behind is that you have a parable a lesson a similitude that you want to impress upon someone and that's the whole point of this is not that we just hear the story is that the meaning is impressed upon us and imprinted in us so that in our own lives is that we can see how that the archetype manifests in our own sense in relation to how we respond to it. So what well, little bit of method in a method is a parable. And a parable in English is it's a story that is used to illustrate that some type of lesson. It's a parable. If we that translate it as similitude, a similitude is really closer to the foundational meaning of method, which is this idea of com a comparison between two things. And you compare one thing to another. In this sense, what is being compared is that the state of these people who, as we will see, denied the, the messenger bear the message bearers that came to them, is that is the same state of these people who that denied the Prophet So there is a similarity there. Or you could just roughly refer to it as an example, which is that something specific that indicates a general rule. Anyhow, and set forth for them as a parable Ashab al qarya the people of the town. And uh, the vast majority of scholars say that the town that is referred to here in Arabic is Antakya, in English Antioch. And um, that when they say, when Allah says, al-Mursalun, when the message bearers came unto it, here is where they, they differ. Um, that are these message bearers apostles that were sent to the town by Sayyidina Isa, by the Prophet Jesus, alayhi salam. And that this is that one opinion of the commentators is that it was the city is Antioch and it was a that town in which there were polytheists and that Allah Ta'ala commanded the Prophet Jesus السلام, to send to that of his apostles there to convey the message and to call them to Islam. Um, according to another opinion, uh, the here the Mursalun, the message bearers or the messengers, their prophets. And um, some of the scholars say this seems to be more likely because our Prophet himself is that referred to as that one of the Mursaleen, as we spoke about in the third verse, in the Kalamina Mursaleen. Truly, you are one of the messengers. So there's a difference of opinion. The point is, is not the historical details. The point is, is that the lesson that comes from it. Okay, and so that, again, that our Prophet is being commanded to that tell them, set forth for them a parable. And it is the story of the Ashab al Qarya. Because in the Quran, it's left general, means the, the people of the town. 
and so that that those that are in his time can understand what happens to people when they deny prophetic truth. And then Allah Ta'ala says in verse 14, إِذْ أَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهِمْ وَثْنَيْنِ فَكَذَّبُهُمَا فَعَزَّزْنَا بِثَارِثٍ فَقَالُوا إِنَّا إِلَيْكُمْ مُرْسَلُونَ When we sent to them two, they denied them, so we reinforced them with a third. And they said, Verily, we have been sent to you. And so that if we base it on the fact that it was, uh, if we look, if we say that it was the Prophet Jesus who sent the apostles, they, or that they were either way, is that that two of the messengers, either the apostles or the messengers, that came to this town. And the first response of the people of this town was that they denied their message that they brought. And then Allah Ta'ala says, فَعَزَّزْنَا بِثَالِثًا So we reinforce them with a third. And then a, a third messenger came and that reinforced everything it is that the first two said. And that encouraged them to that, uh, move away from their polytheism and to worship Allah Ta'ala only and associate no partners to Him. And to leave their worshiping of idols. And that the way that they spoke is that inna ilaykum mursaloon is that they wanted to emphasize what it is that they had been commanded to tell them that indeed that they were messengers that indeed verily we have been sent unto you and there are that two mu'akkidat here there are two that functions in the Arabic language that are used to that emphasize this sentence the first is inna and the second is in this case the jumla ismiya the nominal sentence and scholars also point out is that the wisdom of that if we say that it was the Prophet Jesus sending that two people and um, how that one of them could support the other and that that one testimony is not the same as two and having two people that speak and it is more convincing uh, that for the people that they are speaking to and then that they said in response to these message bearers coming to them. And this is verse 15. They said, you are but human beings like us. And the All Merciful has not sent down anything. You are simply lying. So this was their first response. In other words, is that the people of the town responded to these three messengers in this particular way. And what they said includes three things. There is, first of all, what is called the i'tirad. That is, is that they are denying or they are opposing the message. And then secondly, is that there is um, ittiham or iftira, that they are uh, that lying. And then there is the ittiham, and that they are then blaming um, them, or they are that finding, um, that putting into question what it is that they are saying. And so, that one of the other meanings that we take from this is as well, is that this is again, this is the nature of that truth when someone comes with it is that there will be people who are opposed to it and Allah Ta'ala continuously mentions stories like this in the Quran to us so this can be firmly ruled within ourselves and so that we shouldn't that be amazed at people that opposing that religious truth this is not something that should shock us this is something that in fact is expected now, when it comes to, as often is the case in our time, when people are misrepresenting <clears throat> the religion itself, that's something else entirely. And that's something that has to be dealt with, which is one of the problems of our time. But when it comes to people who are really embodying the principles of the religion, it's to be expected is that they are going to be seen as strangers. Lest we forget the hadith of our Prophet ﷺ, is that Islam began as something strange. Bada ad-deen gharibun. And it will return strange as it began. So God tidings to the strangers. So if you feel estranged 
in your particular locale, in your community, wherever it is that you are from, because they're not like-minded people, because that you are struggling to maintain your deen and you find that people around you are not going through the same struggle, is that we should go back to the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu and that we should actually be happy and see this as a blessing of Allah that we are finding that difficulty because our Prophet said, glad tidings, فَطُوبَ الْغُرَبَ God tidings to those who are strangers, who feel estranged. And that in general, this is also how we are taught to live here in this world. Kun fi dunya ka'annaka gharibun aw abidu sabil. Be in this world as if you are a gharib, a stranger, or an abir sabil, someone who's just passing by, a wayfarer. So the world in and of itself. Even if you didn't have a lot of Islamophobia, for instance, or a lot of people that hated you, or whatever else it is, is that the world itself is like this. Is that if we feel excessively comfortable in the world, it's a sign that there is a lack of Iman. Because a believer that should feel more comfortable in his or her reflection of the world to come, and that we need to work on ourselves to slowly detach over time, putting things in their proper place while we're here, of course, but working with a strong intention and having the motivating factor behind everything that we do to be to draw near to Allah Ta'ala and to return to Him safely, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, is that the first part of this, what do they say? قَالُوا مَا أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا بَشُرُونَ مِثْلُنَا Their first response is to say, is that you are but human beings like us. And that if you really look carefully at this, this is one of the that main things that people can't get over. Is that the fact that there are messengers. And sometimes a lot of people throughout history, and even in our time, find it far-fetched and difficult to believe that a human being like them will that be a be able to receive what we are calling prophecy and to that receive this message from Allah Jalla Jalalu and to convey that and we must follow them. And unfortunately is that there are many Muslims today that are finding difficulty in understanding this and that this is a very very dangerous situation because yes that our Prophet was a human being no one is saying that he wasn't Bashar the Bishra in Arabic is your skin. Bashar is a human being. And we, Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Al-Kahf, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ Say that I am a human being. I am a Bashar like you. مِثْلُكُمْ I'm a, I'm a human being like you. But then what does the verse say? يُوحَى إِلَيْهِ I receive revelation. إِنَّمَا إِلَهُكُمْ إِلَهٌ وَاحِدٌ and indeed that your Lord is one. And so is that while we absolutely affirm that our Prophet was a human being, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and there was a wisdom in that, so that we could follow him. Because the fact that he was a human being is that enables us to that feel that sense of closeness to us, even though he wasn't like other human beings. And what we mean by he wasn't like other human beings is that he receives revelation which is this right after that in the same verse. So he's different from other human beings insofar as he receives revelation. And we spoke a little bit yesterday about the difficulty of him bearing revelation and how it is only prophets and messengers that have the ability to bear revelation. And were anyone else in creation that who was not prepared to receive it, that to have to receive revelation, which they can't obviously, but let's just say, Naftarat, were they to have, is that they would have been completely, that just completely and totally annihilated from the power of revelation. Just as we mentioned yesterday, that Lo the Quran ala Jabal, this is what would happen to that a mountain. And so is that Allah Ta'ala has chosen prophets and messengers to be able to bear, receive, and transmit revelation, and that this opens up a door for us to understand a very subtle point. How do we view Allah Ta'ala's creation? 
And for it really is simple at one level, and then to the degree that someone doesn't have that clarity, is that there are that various diversions whereby which the heart and mind becomes muddled, and it becomes difficult for people to decipher what it is that they should really believe and what it is that they shouldn't believe. Whereas if you just confirm the existence of Allah, once you believe in the existence of Allah, and you believe that Allah Ta'ala is all-powerful, and you believe that He's fa'alima yurid and does whatever He wants, so many other things become so easy to believe. Miracles are easy to believe once you believe in Allah. That believing that Allah that gave revelation right, to a, a, a human being is easy to believe. Once you affirm the existence of Allah, all of that is easy to believe. And one of the common questions that you're asked, especially with young people, what does Islam say about evolution and so forth and so on? In questions of this nature, natural selection and that Darwinism, and while I'm in agreement that we need to have very um, that sophisticated responses to uh, various obfuscations, this being one of them, and I'm all for doing the research for these things and writing books to clarify these points. From one perspective, once you realize and believe that Allah Jalla Jalado is all powerful and does whatever He wants, subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's very easy for you to believe in the unique creation of Adam alayhi It's really as simple as that. And so what ends up happening is a lot of people, that when they entertain these questions, they're entertaining them from a standpoint of weak belief. And that this is the modernist Muslim tendency, where you have to go back now and rewrite some of our history, or much of our history, because it's hard for you, no wait, the late Isra Mi'raj? No, no, it was just a dream. Okay, or is that, um, that miracles aren't really miracles, there's some type of scientific explanation for it. But none of that is necessary once you believe in the existence of Allah. You realize is that everything in creation belongs to Him. And in reality, is that this is why we call a miracle is a breaking of the norm. Even the norm actually is really a miracle if you think about it. The very fact that we are experiencing existence like this and with this fluidity and we are experiencing time right now as we speak from one moment to the next and we don't feel it as being choppy. We don't feel ourselves going into existence and out of existence. Allah Ta'ala is creating all of this in every single moment right now as we are speaking, as I am speaking. It is something really amazing. And that he has his sunan in creation, so that we know gravity being one of them. That you hold something up, generally speaking, that it's going to drop. But these what we call norms, it's only because Allah Ta'ala is creating that and sustaining that in every single moment that it is happening. So a breaking of the norm really is in relation to how we see things. Otherwise Allah Ta'ala could have made things differently. But this is the way that we experience things. And it's really fascinating to think about that, that everything that is happening in creation, right now, as we speak, not just in this world, but in the micro world and in the macro world, is that Allah Ta'ala is the Qayyum of Samawati wal Ard. And we say in Surah and Ayat Kursi, لا تأخذه سينتون ولا نوم. He does not doze off, nor does he sleep. And that just as you and I, were we to doze off, we lose our qudra, we lose our power. And they actually mention this in the books of fiqh as a way of determining whether or not you fell asleep because there's certain legal rulings that relate to your wudu if you fall asleep. And if you're holding a pen and the pen falls out of your hand, is that, that's a sign, for instance, that you had fallen asleep. And what is the meaning there is that you lose your power, you fall asleep, but you, your normal power you have, you no longer have. Were Allah Ta'ala to doze off, and it is impossible for Him to doze off, because He is the Hayyul Qayyum, is that everything in, in the universe would be obliterated. He is sustaining everything in every single moment, and created and recreating it, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the way that we experience it is that it's seamless. 
But the reality is, is that were it not to be that Allah Ta'ala is giving us the ability to live in every moment and to do what it is that we do in every moment, none of this would ever be here. Anyhow, is that once you establish that, it's very easy for you to believe that Allah Ta'ala sent a messenger. But a lot of people get veiled on this particular point. And at the level of disbelief and refusing to accept a message that comes from that a messenger. And then for other people that even though they might be believers and accept the idea of a messenger, is that they de-emphasize the special nature of the Prophet Muhammad And that is also a great danger. Other examples of that previous people's denying that the Prophets, because of their human side, in Surah Al-Taghaban, that And thus it was that their messengers used to come them, to them with that clarifying matters. And they would say that, will a human being be a source of guidance for us? Will a human being guide us? In other words, that they were in the state of ta'ajjub, a state of negative type of wonder that led them to deny. And then Surah Al-Furqan, وَقَالُوا مَا لِهَذَا الرَّسُولِ And they said that what is with this messenger? يَكُّلُ الطَّعَامُ وَيَمْشِي فِي الْأَسْوَاقِ Is that he eats food and he walks in the marketplace. لَوْ لَا أُنزِلْ إِلَيْهِ مَلَكٌ فِيَكُونَ مَعَ النَّذِيرًا Is that were there not to have been that a angel that have been that uh, descended with him and that could then warn others alongside of him. So in other words, is that this is nothing new, that people have been blinded by the human side of the messengers from the earliest of times. And that this, again, that gets back to something very fundamental, is that how do we look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation? And everything in creation, from the standpoint that Allah wa ta'ala created it, has a meaning. And we've quoted this line of poetry many times, but it's such an amazing line of poetry that it deserves to be quoted time and time again, and it definitely pertains to this subject, where that Sheikh Muhammad ibn Habib said, Indeed, that the entire universe is meanings that set up and forms. Anyone and everyone who perceives this is from the people of recollection, is from the true people of intellect. In other words, all of creation is meanings. But it's whether or not that we can pick up on that meaning or not. And so people that just look at creation as creation, there's nothing beyond the material, is that those same people will be blinded to that learning the special nature of something, something that Allah Ta'ala put in that thing, whether it's a wisdom or whether it relates to a prophet or messenger, that something special he's given them, i.e. made them a prophet or messenger to bear revelation and then convey it. And so it really gets back to that our belief in Allah. And once you establish that, is that all of these other things actually become very easy for us to reconcile. So, مَا أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا بَشَلُوا مِثْلُنَا You are but human beings like us. And the second part of this are Muslims that really de-emphasize the importance of the Prophet Muhammad and almost think of him in a very vague, that very that, um, uh, distant type way that somehow his only job was to come and to convey the message and that's it. There's no connection that you really have to him after that other than to the message, not the message bearer. And this is just simply not the understanding of the companions or that all of the people who came after them, the rightly guided scholars at this until this day. If that was the case, why did Sayyidina Bilal that have to leave Medina and Munawwara after the time of the Prophet Sallallahu There was so much nostalgia in Medina that there was so much that reminded him of the Prophet Sallallahu He couldn't bear being there. And then at the very end of his life, just before he passes, is that he is the one that said that when that his wife realized that he was going to pass soon, and that she said, Wa karba, what a difficult situation this is. And he changed the frame. 
And he said, Wa Taraba. He says, What an exhilarating situation this is. Tomorrow I'm going to meet my loved ones, Muhammad and his companions. In other words, why was that what he was saying at the end of his life? Why was he only, th- yes, he believed in Allah, yes, he wanted to meet Allah. But why was it the Prophet said him and his companions? And why was it that not only a mentioning of Allah? Because he saw being with the Prophet and being with the Prophet's companions as the means for him to receive the bliss of paradise. And that's not only not that does not contravene any of the principles of Tawheed that we believe in, and this is from the essence of Tawheed. Everything that Allah Ta'ala created is created in His creation ultimately that is a means for us, if we approach it the right way, to draw near to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you could go on and on and on and on and on. Sayyidina Uthman bin Affan, that the night before that he was murdered, he saw a dream with the Prophet said, I'm saying to him, is that tomorrow you're going to break your fast with me. Sayyidina Hussein bin Ali saw something similar. That and so forth and so on. There's a number of examples like this throughout history where is that it shows the connection of people to the Prophet himself and this is one of the not only important, this is one of the most important that aspects of our deen. And that this modern coarseness that many modern Muslims have in relation to the Prophet and that almost as if that they don't want to send sarawat upon him. I mean, even there's so many proofs of this that this is a topic in and of itself, but I just wanted to point out that even though Muslims believe in the Prophet of the Prophet, still is it sometimes that his special nature is de-emphasized. And that what we want is a balance in the middle. We believe that the Prophet was a human being, but we believe he received revelation him. Ultimately, this is about being sincere and worshiping Allah. But the way that we do that is through the prophetic teachings. And then the more that you love the Prophet, the more that you're going to follow him, and then the more that you follow him, the more that then you will attain the love of Allah Jalla Jalla. So the point is, is that traditional Muslims have always understood a balanced way to understand this. In this context, Allah Ta'ala is speaking of how people are blinded from the Prophet Sallallahu or from a Prophet or a Messenger by virtue of their humanity. And just being in a state of wondering, how could another human being that guide me? And sometimes that could just merely be from that a lack of understanding of Tawheed, of belief in the Divine Unity, and sometimes that could come from arrogance that is in the heart. And so that in our day and age is that we have to understand, and I'll speak specifically in the context of the United States of America, we live in a highly racialized society. And if you would go and ask the vast majority of people in America, what is their opinion of the Middle East? Mention adjectives to describe the particular, the, the, in your mind, the typical Middle Easterner. And you'd be surprised, actually you probably wouldn't be surprised, that what people would say. Now, but knowing that our Prophet is from the Middle East, and he's from the Arabian Peninsula, and even people earlier in history, is that in the two great empires of the time, the Byzantine and the Persian Empire, is that they completely disregarded the Arab that they, had, they held the Arab in very low regard. But this is because of their arrogance. Mm-hmm. Is that if Allah Ta'ala sends a messenger, is that if we are truth seekers, we would accept that message from anyone, who, whoever that person might be. And what I'm pointing out here is, is that if people have arrogance, if they disregard people, or if they look down upon people, and they belittle people, do you really think that they're going to accept guidance from that person? <laughs> Do you really think they're going to accept guidance from that person? And it's on the tip of many people's tongues even to this day. Although that people now will that get in big trouble if they actually say it. And then even within the United States of America, when that people look at other converts and certain types of converts, one of the things that you'll hear people say is that I'm not in need of changing things. I'm very happy with the way that I am. But a lot of what it really is subtly, it's like, hmm, these are the people that are converting, but I don't really want to be with them. 
because I'm of a certain class or I'm of a that certain social dis level of social distinction. These will blind us from the truth, these types of things. And um, that again, it gets back to the humanity of someone being blinded by their humanity. And one of the beautiful du'as of Shaykh Abu Bakr bin Salim is, Allahumma utbi anni bashariyat kulli muslim wa ashidni khususiyat kulli muslim. Or kama qal, he asked Allah to that veil from him the human side of all believers and to show him the special nature of all believers. All believers have something special. Everyone. Everyone in this room, everyone in this community, everyone in this area, all Muslims that you meet will have something special about them. But if you're arrogant and you don't think that there's anything special about them, you're not going to benefit from them. You're not going to be able to that take what it is that they have and to benefit from them. So this is the first thing and this is really deep. There's so many things that could be said about this. This is very deep psychology that has prevented so many people and to this day there are people that it's just too far-fetched for them to believe that a human being received revelation, the idea of a prophet or a messenger. And as long as they're caught up on that, is that it would, it's very difficult for them to accept the truth that they bring because they see themselves as human beings just like them. And rather in our time, is that what is prevalent now in our time is that anything of the past is considered to be that looked down upon. For the most part with this myth of progress is that anything of the past is like like 1400 years ago you're following someone who lived 1400 years ago we live in the age of you know space exploration we live in the age of that nanotechnology we live in the age of that all of these types of things that are happening that you're following someone 1400 years ago and you'd be surprised, the vast majority of people who are part of this globalized modern world and that are that inundated with much of its nonsense, this is their perspective. Yes, we are following a prophet who lived 1400 years ago. And not only are we following a prophet of 1400 years ago, خير القرون قرني. It was the very best time of all. The best of all centuries, the best of all ages was my age. And this is why, if you really think about it, there is so much that about our deen, it's just diametrically opposed to what we're being told in the modern world. It doesn't mean that we can't exist in the modern world. We can. We're a part of the modern world. There's nothing, there's no other way, there's not really a way not to be a part of the modern world. We are a part of the modern world, but we are holding on to something much different. And that this is why it's so important for us. It's so important for us to have izza. We have to have izza of Islam. And the reality of izza is that we feel at the level of our heart is that we've been given the greatest gift of all. We have been given the greatest gift of all, which is the gift of La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah in submitting to the Lord of the heavens and the earth in a time where you have some of the most arrogant people who have ever walked the face of this earth, who actually think in their mind, erroneously of course, that they can do things better than Allah Jalla Jalala. And yes, that we are maintaining our principles in light of all of that. That yes, we even wear traditional dress. If pe When people outside see a woman with a hijab on, they see a man covering his head or wearing a turban or something like this, or wearing traditional clothing, it, they don't know how to process that in their mind. Although there still are religious communities that even here in the United States that dress traditionally. They, there are. But for the most part, the public sphere is not a place that is warm to religion. And all of these meanings are circling around this same archetype that started that a long time ago and has been further compounded in the time in which we live and has become more nuanced. Anyhow, this is the first thing. You are but human beings like us. And so this is the iftira. This is where they lied and they said, and the all merciful has not revealed anything. And so notice here, 
is that they acknowledged these particular people, the belief in that Allah Jalla Jalla, because they referred to him as Al Rahman. But they're denying that he sent down revelation. And again, if you take it back to that blessed story, which has so many different meanings packed into it, of Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq. And when he was asked if he believed that the Prophet went to Jerusalem by night and came back and ascended into the heavens, and he said his famous statement, if he said it, it is true. And because then he said, I believe he that receives something greater than that, which is revelation from Allah. And that is the amazing thing about belief, is that if Allah places belief in your heart, He makes it easy for you to accept that Allah Ta'ala gives revelation to certain prophets and messengers. And it is easy to accept, because Allah Jalla Jalla does whatever He wants, subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he wanted to, he could have left us to our intellects and said, work it out. You're not getting sent a messenger. Work it out yourself. I gave you an intellect, an intellect that even though definitively it can't, according to the Sha'ir Ashari position, is that tell you what uh, that uh, good and bad is, khair and shar is, is that by virtue of the fitrah, we tend to incline towards knowing what is good and what is that not good. Allah Ta'ala could have done that, <clears throat> but He didn't. So, the second thing is, is that they denied that the sending down of revelation, and then is that they started to criticize the character. So at first they're like, you know, who are you? You're just a human being like us. And then second is that they then deny that they had this special, they, they were sent something special, which is revelation. And then they started to criticize their character, right? In into illa takthibu. You are simply lying. And if you would look at these three principles and apply it to many people's responses, these are the things that you will see happening. And then especially this last one, there's a long list of things that people end up saying about you. You're this, you're that, you're this, you're that, you're this, you're that, a long list of things. So, in antum illa takthibun, that you are that simply lying. And then that the response to this was, قالوا رَبُّنَا يَعْلَمُ قَالُوا رَبُّنَا يَعْلَمُ إِنَّا إِلَيْكُمْ نَمُرْسَلُونَ So keep in mind that they just said, um, that they just said to them, is that they were, that they, that they were sent to them. إِنَّا إِلَيْكُمْ مُرْسَلُونَ um, uh, Excuse me, they just said to them in that, uh, that uh, verse 14, إِنَّا إِلَيْكُمْ مُرْسَلُونَ Yes. And then in verse 16, is that قَالُوا رَبَّنَا يَعْلَمُوا إِنَّا إِلَيْكُمْ لَمُرْسَلُونَ So it's very close, but there's a slight difference. At first they said to them, إِنَّا إِلَيْكُمْ مُرْسَلُونَ Verily we have been sent to you. And we use verily here, even though it is an archaic word, because there is emphasis in the Arabic expression. إِنَّا right? So إِنَّا is one of the ways that we emphasize something in Arabic. So if I say that Munir is present with us and someone thinks that Munir is actually not really here. So I say Munir haldirun ma'na. But then if someone thinks that that's not the case, I can further emphasize that by saying inna munirun haldirun ma'na. I emphasize that Munir is definitely with us or verily he's with us. And then that if I want to even emphasize that further, I can say, Inna munirun la haldirun ma'na. I can add a lamb before haldir. And that gives further emphasis. And so that as there was two ways of emphasizing when they first said that we're messengers, because they wanted to get the point across, now in verse 16 is that there's four ways of emphasizing it. The same two and then two more. The first is where they say, Rabbuna ya'lamu, that our Lord knows. Which is emphasizing the point further. Inna ilaykum la. This is known as the Lam al Muzahlaqa, la mursanun. Our Lord knows that we have indeed been sent unto you. And so this is the way that they responded to them. And that when you have people that deny, 
is that there's only two things you can do. And this is why their response was of twofold. Was to reiterate what it is that they came with in the first place. And part of this is the rhetorical value of a lot of people, when people question what it is that they're saying, will all of a sudden maybe slightly waver. And that, hmm, they're denying what I'm saying, so maybe I'm not going to say that again. Right? Whereas that these were, either according to one opinion, apostles or messengers, is that they reaffirmed it more emphatically. Because they're people of truth, and they've been sent with a mission. And that, inna ilaykuna mursalun. And so that this is why that if we believe in truth, and we speak that truth, and that there is a response from people that is not really the ideal response, and that they are putting into question what it is that we're saying, or not accepting what we're saying, and then they become that disparaging and derogatory, is it, how do we respond? We have to be even further, we have to be even more firm. <inaudible> they answered, Our Lord knows that we have indeed been sent unto you. And then, <inaudible> And our duty is only to convey the message clearly. That's all we can do. And every person that is that interested in accepting, living, and conveying truth has to know this. And our duty is only to convey the message clearly. You cannot make someone else do something. You cannot force someone else to believe something. There is no compulsion in religion. Our job is to clarify the truth of things. A, a balag that is mubin, al balag al mubin, to convey the message clearly. If there's questions that people have, we happily answer those questions to the best of our ability. If we can't answer them, we send them to someone else who can answer them. Is that we do our very best to express the truth that we believe in to other people, and that we clarify our principles to other people, and then people will have different responses. People will have different responses. This is just the way things are. This is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the earth. But once you realize that, it gives you the internal solace because sometimes that we get weak because people don't accept what it is that we say. And somehow we think that because people are not accepting something we say, it means that what we say is actually not true. So we start to question ourselves in this type of thing. Whereas no, is that when you believe in truth, you have to be firm in that belief. And that we have to realize that not everyone is going to accept what it is that you believe. And that this is there to make us that have that firmness that we need. And to recognize our whole purpose is just to clarify. Just to clarify in a clear fashion. And then the rest is up to our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we incorporate these principles into our lives. Is that you will find, we will find much, much, much good that comes from it. And our interactions with people will be very different. And that uh, we should think a lot about people. Because as it has been said, Only people have that destroyed other people. One of the biggest veils for most people are other people. And wanting approval from other people, wanting to be like other people, having expectations in other people. And that ideally is that we don't want to have any expectations in any human being is that we only want to have our hope be in our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then based upon the prophetic teachings is that we interact with all other people that are around us in a way that is principled. And sometimes that means being gentle, and that's usually the case. And other times, which is a little bit more rare, <coughs> it means that we are firm in putting everything in its proper place. Because indeed, sometimes when we have, sometimes having good character means is that you are firm. And so we put everything in its proper place, and then ultimately we leave the creation to the Creator. We leave the creation to the Creator, and we are first and foremost only required to save our own selves and to work upon our own selves. And then, because we've been commanded to do so, is that as many other people that we can help, we try to do so, 
But all of that, the whole purpose of it is, is ta'abudan. It's to establish our servitude to Allah because He wants us to do it. And so our love of good for people in all of the manifestations of the love of that good is ultimately because this is what is pleasing to our Lord. So we live and die upon that and even our worst enemies that have caused us personal harm to a degree that we can't possibly imagine is that we are worshipping Allah by that wanting good for that particular person. And when you have hearts that embrace these meanings as that it won't be a short time won't pass in any particular geographic location except that usually what happens is that people are guided to that truth because of the great hearts of these people who then embody these lofty principles. May Allah wa ta'ala that uh, root these principles in our hearts and may Allah ta'ala bless us to benefit from these ayat mubarakat to give us tawfiq in all of our different prayers and learn to take lessons from the situations that are happening around us from that our own lives and from people that are around us so that we won't be the lesson for the people in the future. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadan wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. There's any uh, quick questions? I have one. Um, how does hypocrisy come into play here? Like if uh, somebody opposes the truth in front of you with a statement or an action, and then a person doesn't stand up for the truth. Could this be a sign of hypocrisy? Like if, if, if the person, if, if, if someone's opposing the truth and someone doesn't stand up to that person's truth. It might, it might not necessarily be hypocrisy because people have different personalities too, right? Mm -hmm. So some people are are able to be stronger than others and that some people from certain backgrounds find it very easy to be very firm upon the truth other people they believe in it but their interactions with people uh, they have a personality that is there's a weakness to it mm -hmm. and so there's no doubt that's a deficiency and then they have to go about that treating that deficiency in themselves mm -hmm. Um, so it's not necessarily, if I think about it in that way, uh, hypocrisy. Um, it, it could be if someone was just kind of just glossing over it and that really not that saying anything when they had the ability to do so, like out of hypocrisy. But it, it, in my mind, it doesn't have to necessarily be hypocrisy. It could just be like a, a, a weakness in someone's personality or something like that. Yeah. Sheikh, you mentioned ittiham, uh, ittiraq, and what was the third one? So the first was, um, the first was um, that نَوَيْنَ تَعْلَمُ وَالتَّعْلِيمُ وَنَفَعُ وَالْإِنْتِفَاءُ وَالتَّذَكَّرُ وَالتَّذْكِيرُ وَالْإِفَادَةَ وَالْإِسْتِفَادَ وَالْحَثَ عَلَى تَمَسِّقِ بِكِتَابِ اللَّهِ وَصُنَّةَ رَسُولِهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم وَالدُّعَى لِلْهُدَى وَالْدَلَالَةَ لِلْخَيْرِ يَبْتِغَاءُ وَشِلَّهِ تَعَالَى مَرْضَاتِ وَقُلْبُ so inshallah, we're going to continue on in our that study of Surah Yasin. May Allah Ta'ala open up the meanings that to our hearts and to our minds and allow us to be able to that fully absorb those meanings and to put them into practice in a way that is pleasing to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Keep it in mind all along is that the Quran is the ultimate makhraj, it is the ultimate way out according to a prophetic hadith that indicates in times of tribulation, in times of strife, in times of difficulty, in all of the other meanings of fitna, the makhraj is the kitab of Allah, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then it's really about learning how the Quran is a makhraj and what that really means. How that is important for us to view the world from the Quranic worldview, to be able to implement what the Quran encourages us to implement, and all of the other meanings of that bringing the Quran into our lives and living its realities to the degree that we do that will be to the degree that we experience the Quran as that bakhraj, as that way out. And we have reached verse number 18. Which states, قَالُوا إِنَّ قُطَيِّرْنَا بِكُمْ لَإِنْ لَمْ تَنْتُهُ نَنْجُمَنُّكُمْ 
ولا يمسنكم من عذاب أليم. They, the people of the city, said, "We augur ill of you. If you desist not, we shall surely stone you, and a painful punishment will befall you from us." So that if we remind ourselves where we are, verse thirteen, "Well, the Rebbe Hom Methaden, Ashab al Qariti is Jahal Mursalun." When Allah says, "And set forth for them as a parable, the people of the town." When the message bearers came unto it, إذ أرسلنا إليهم اثنين فكذبهما فعزز نبي تاده فقالوا إن إليكم مرسلون. When we sent to them two, they denied them, so we reinforced them with a third, and they said, "Verily, we've been sent to you." And then they said, "You are but human beings like us. The All Merciful has not sent down anything; that He has not revealed anything. You are simply lying." Then they answered, "Our Lord knows that we have indeed." Been sent unto you, وما علينا إلا البلاغ المبين. And our duty is only to convey the message clearly. And then this is the verse that comes after it. They, the people of the city, said, "We augur ill of you. If you desist not, if you don't stop what you're doing, we shall surely stone you, and a painful punishment will befall you from us." So let's look a little bit uh, more closely at this verse. So, قالوا, this the people of the city. There's a conversation now taking place, and keep in mind is that these apostles or these messengers were sent to the people of the city, and to call them to tawhid and to call them to that proper conduct, and then everything that happened after that, from their denial of them and everything that they did, from that denying them and that lying to them and accusing them. And then the response of the messengers, and how they emphasize that they had been sent to them, and that their Lord knows best, and then reminding them as well is that, and our duty is only to convey the message clearly. Now the conversation shifts to the people of the city, where they're going to do something different now. So keep in mind, we already said is that they first and foremost that that there was denial. Which is that them putting into question that a human being could actually bring revelation, and then the lie that that Allah Taala had not sent down anything, and then the accusation is that they were liars, and so then when they responded to those claims and everything that was said, then they start doing something different now. And that this is very telling about the psychology of disbelief. And again, you see these same archetypes manifesting throughout history and even to this day and age. So now, what do they do? That they resort to a pretext. They resort to a pretext to turn the message bearers away. And the idea of a pretext is to find some justification. And to give a reason for what they want to do, which is to really rid themselves of them, and that even if it's not the real reason, the real reason is they don't want to hear it. They don't want to be reminded. The real reason is is that they want to remain as they are. And the pretext is is that now they're trying to find something wrong with them so that they can demonize them, so that they can. Character assassinate them, and so that they can justify to their people that the fact that they need to rid themselves of them. So what do they say? That inna tatayyana bikum. That indeed that we augur or we augur ill of you. We augur ill of you. And that another way of translating this is, is that we think you are an evil omen. And so here, tatayyur is to take an, an omen, but in this case, an evil omen. So they augured ill of them; they took an evil omen from them. And the idea of auguring ill is this idea of that seeing something as a sign or a warning that is something likely to happen. And the commentators say is that. The main reason that they augured ill of them and took a bad omen from them was because they came with a religion other than theirs. 
Other commentators say, what other opinions state, that some of those that denied were afflicted with leprosy when they disbelieved. Others say is that they suffered from a famine. And so they saw this as an evil omen for these people that had come. And But the key here is, is that they're starting to point the fingers at them, that there's something wrong with them. And so let's look at this word a little bit more closely. That take in an evil omen, that atatayyur. In Arabic, it's also known as atasha'um. In relation to its root, it's actually very similar to the English root. Because that an, an augur was actually a religious official in the Roman Empire who would observe natural signs, especially the behavior of birds, interpreting these as an indication of divine approval or disapproval of a proposed action. That's where the word actually gets its name in Arabic as well. Atatayr comes from the word tayr, which is a bird. And the, in the pre-Islamic Arabia, what they used to do when they needed to make a decision is that there would be a certain person that would that move towards birds and then see which way that they flew. If they flew to the right, it was a sign that this is a good sign and they took a good omen, this is something we do. If they flew to the left, that they would consider that to be a bad sign and that they would refrain from doing it. And so that that thus it has become to be known as at tayyur but that we translate this as taking a bad omen. Now it is important to note uh, that our Prophet وسلم, is that he prohibited us from taking bad omens. And he says in a hadith, La adwa wa la tiyara. That, that adwa is the idea that diseases or illnesses can be contagious. And that what is really meant by this hadith is, is that we have to be very careful in relation to the power of Allah. Is that, yes, some diseases are contagious, but we believe in the power of Allah. It can only happen by the will of Allah. It can only happen by the will of Allah. And that there was a that scenario that took place with Sayyidina Omar bin al-Khattab when he was caliph, and that there was a plague in a particular place, and that Sayyidina Umar did not go into that particular place. And that they then said to him, that are you that fleeing from the Qadr of Allah? And then they brought forth one of the companions who mentioned to him a hadith, right? That about there being a plague and that you shouldn't go to where there is a plague and people that are there shouldn't leave. And Sayyidina Umar then said, is that we're fleeing from the Qadr of Allah to the Qadr of Allah. I mean, there's no way to flee from the Qadr of Allah Ta'ala. And that the idea of that diseases being contagious and so forth, um, that means is that we have to be very careful in that falling into the idea that it's happening in and of itself. From the power of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala is that He can do whatever He wants to do. And people that are involved in medicine have to be careful to say that there's no cure for this. Right? This person is definitely going to die. If they don't do this, this is going to happen to them. No, that's not the way we deal with the asbab. Allah is called al kulli shay. Outwardly, you could look at statistics and analytics that indicate that this percentage of people die and so forth and so on. But we have to be careful when it comes to tawheed. And we will present it in a slightly different way. And that this is what we suggest. And the people of Allah are very careful with their language. Very careful with their language. And so that sometimes they say that they want to go somewhere instead of saying that I am going to such and such a place. Even if they say inshallah, they might prefer to say the plan is to go to such and such a place. Why? Because that they don't know if they're actually going to be going to that place or not. They're very careful with their language. Uh, one of the righteous, for instance, when something was said about something that happened in a particular place, and then people are talking about this incident, but you don't know whether it is hearsay or not, then when someone asked him about, oh, what about this? What he would say is, they say that such and such a thing is happening, instead of saying such and such a thing is happening. Why? Because if you say such and such a thing is happening, it's really not, you have now taken part in something that is not a truth. But if you just save yourself that, oh, other people are saying that this is happening, 
is that you're just relating now what other people are saying. The righteous want to be careful in the frame and how they frame things and what it is that they say. Um, so then the Prophet said, وَلَا طِيَرَةً That he's negating that the taking of bad omens. And what is really meant by that is, is that there's nothing that intrinsically has qualities from people or things or events that we can say that's always going to be a bad omen. We don't take bad omens. And there are people that believe intrinsically there's something in that person or there's something that's in that particular thing. Like a black cat or walking under a ladder or opening up an umbrella that inside and these very superstitious type things. We don't believe in any of that. And however, that this doesn't mean that we don't protect ourselves. This doesn't mean that we don't take the means to ward off harm from ourselves, to that ward off evil from ourselves. So of course that you know that anything that could potentially harm you, you protect yourself from it. Okay, so we put everything in its proper place. And so that this is what they are saying. This is the pretext for what it is that they want to do to them if they actually don't leave, which is, we shall, surely, we shall surely stone you, and a painful punishment will befall you from us. Why? Because we that feel that you are a bad omen, you are an evil omen. And so, that then, that this is also, it's important to point out, um, that this is the way that, that oftentimes that people of disbelief act. And that there is another verse in Surah Al-A'raf in relation to the people of the Pharaoh, where Allah Ta'ala says, فَإِذَا جَاءَتُمْ الْحَسَنَةُ قَالُوا لَنَا هَذِهِ وَإِن تُصِبْهُمْ سَيِّئَتُمْ يَطَّيِّرُوا مُوسَى وَمَنْ مَعْهُ أَلَا إِنَّمَا طَائِرُهُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ Which translates as, but whenever good came to them, they would say, this is ours. And if an evil befell them, they would, they would consider it an ill omen on account of Moses and those who were with him. Nay, their ill omen lies with Allah, though most of them know not. Also the people of Salih, They said, we see you and your followers as an evil omen. He replied, God will decide on any omen you may see. You people are being put to the test. And so, this is the pretext for what it is that they want to do, and this is the nature of people of ignorance. Is that when it relates to something that they don't want, they try to speak ill of that particular thing. And that when it's something that they like, that they'll speak that well of it. And that this is a real problem. And we should always be very careful that when we're involved in the, any type of group effort, if we don't get our particular way, we have to be careful to that distinguish between simply saying what I wanted didn't happen, in between finding fault with a person or persons or the decision-making committee or whoever's involved, that somehow there's something wrong with them. Because sometimes there's a tendency to do that. When your opinion is not taken, is that then you're going to find fault with the other people. Whereas part of the adab of shura, the etiquettes of consultation, is if your opinion is taken, you actually make tawbah in istighfar. You repent to Allah and ask His forgiveness. And if your opinion is not taken, you show your gratitude to Allah and say, Alhamdulillah. So whenever people come together, and that everyone should feel that fully comfortable putting forth what it is that they feel is best. No one should deter them from putting forth what they feel is best. Now, people should put forward ideas that are well thought out. We shouldn't just shoot ideas from the hip. And after the ideas come forward and they're considered, then that if an idea is accepted and it's the person whose idea was accepted, that's their etiquette is actually to seek forgiveness. And when their idea is not accepted, that they show they actually say Alhamdulillah. And these are the etiquettes that are going to keep people together. And it's very easy to criticize. 
very easy to criticize. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And it's only when you start to do your own thing, you start your own company, you start to try to start your own organization, try to do your own thing, that you start to really regret all of your baseless criticisms from the past. And sometimes really nitpicky criticisms, or even if they were justified, that you not until you're actually going through it yourself do you realize how harmful it is. The vast majority of people just want to take things down. And I remember learning a, a beautiful lesson where there was one time in the place where I had studied, I felt that something could have been bettered. And that when I went to the person who could have actually done something about it, his response was, okay, please formulate your thoughts, write it down on paper, and then present it to me, and I will fully consider it. And then in the moment, I was kind of like, but I just want you to take my idea and mention what I said and do what I said. And then I started to realize, subhanAllah, there was a lot of nafs in my response to that situation. And nafs is never going to bring good. That is the proper way. There's an organization. There's, it's running. Is it, it's not as easy as just implementing a solution. It has to be that well thought out to begin with. It has to be considered in light of everything else that is happening. And sometimes things take, it's a process. They take time and so forth and so on. And not that you can always justify everything. People make mistakes, of course. But the point is, is that having a good opinion and putting things in that their, their proper place and taking the time to that really think things through, but it really gets back to that how do we respond where we don't get what we like. This is really what this is about. And the vast majority of people, when it doesn't go their way, when they don't get something that they want, is that they'll use that as a pretext to that speak ill. They'll use that uh, some of, they'll use, they'll, they'll demonize, they'll use their demonization of that person as a pretext to that rid that person from their life or to move that person out of the organization or whatever it might be. So they said, we see you and your followers as an evil omen. Now, um, the, uh, excuse me. So the, the, it says, we augur ill of you. We think of you as an evil omen. And then what did they threaten after this? If you don't stop what you're doing, if you desist not, we shall surely stone you in a painful punishment will befall you from us. So now they're resulting to a threat. If you don't do this, this is what we're going to do now. And this is the nature of that this same archetypal person. Again, is that they started already with the approach that was previously mentioned. But then when there is persistence from the other end, is that it's going to result ultimately to violence. And that here, is that why do they mention stoning? Because that this is that one of the ways that they used to that punish people in pre in, in, in previous times. And that this is also an indication that what I am is that they wanted to be brutal and they wanted to be a painful punishment. And that would that again have adab alim. It would be painful and it would really hurt them. So this is what they've resorted to. And then the messengers are going to respond back to what they've said. They said, your auguring ill is upon yourselves, though you have been reminded. No, but you are a people who have exceeded the bounds. Alternatively, did you could translate this as, the messenger said, yani in response to them, the evil omen is within yourselves. Why do you take it as an evil omen when you are reminded of the truth? You are going too far. So in other words, the response from the messenger bearers to the disbelievers is that, they, that what they're saying that they're going to do to these people is that really going to befall them as because of their own disbelief. And so that the evil omen is within their own selves. That there are people, the messengers came to them 
with the best of intentions. They've come to them to call them to only something that is beautiful, to worshiping only one God, and to having sincere worship towards Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And <clears throat> they were the ones that responded in that particular way. And there is some technical language here that I'm going to just quote uh, verbatim because it's going to point to a particular point. And that in the most widespread reading of this verse, though you are reminded is read in the kiltum, meaning even if you are reminded in this reading, the ellipsis indicates a rhetorical elision that constitutes the object of the interrogative and serves as a rebuke as if to say, do you augur ill in disbelief even when you have been reminded? And so that this idea is, is that, that they are taking an evil omen that about these people. But really is that the evil omen is that in their own selves, is that it relate, it's upon their own selves. So this is something that we see often, is that these same people that are doing this or wanting to do this to others, is that what ends up happening is, is that actually falls back upon them in this reflexive sense. And this is why we see in different places in the Quran, is that the idea of that someone trying to deceive, but they are the ones who are actually only deceiving themselves, is that someone wants to plot, but in reality they're being plotted against. And this is the nature of this mentality. And this is why we as believers have to be patient. Because people that act like this, time won't pass except that it will come back upon them. And this is a principle that we believe in and we live by. If you want something to be right, you have to have a right intention and you have to have a right way of going about it. The ends do not justify the means. The means have to be justified, and the ends have to be justified. You can't say that you want this lofty end, and then that you're going to that take whatever means necessary to get to that end. We do not believe in that. The means have to be justified, and the ends have to be justified. We have parameters. There are certain things that you can't do. Even if were you to do that thing, you think that it leads to some type of good, you can't do it. And this is the general principle of how we go about bringing about change. We want to have the means be done right, and we want to have the ends be done right with a righteous intention all along the way. And that those that choose to live another way, that try to cut corners, or that try to that cheat, or that try to deceive, it will come back to them. It will come back to haunt them even. And people that you maneuver against at the workplace to get to a particular place, is that there will be people that maneuver against you at another point. Anytime that you cheat, that you deceive, all of these types of things that happen, anything that you attain in the world, whether it be money or a position or a job or anything else, as a result of trickery and cunning and deception, is that short time won't pass, except that the same thing will happen to you. And that will either be taken from you, or is that you will suffer and go through difficulties as a result of what you did. And the reality is, is that this is a sign for us, so that we can that know that what is happening here in this world and rectify our state. ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس. Is that Allah Taala says? Is that fasad, corruption, has appeared on the earth, that and in the sea, from what? That the hands have wrought. But what does Allah Taala say at the end of this verse? In hope, in hopes that they will return. And Allah Taala tastes them, that some of what they cause them to taste, some of what they've done, in hopes that they return. So when you see negative consequences of things that we've done appear, the hope is that we return. But we should know this, is that we must be people of principle. Nothing that is worthy of us doing, nothing that is a noble thing to actually do, that can be accomplished except through noble and meanwhile means. So this is coming back upon them now. And so that 
um, that they said, we see you and your followers as an evil omen. They said, excuse me, that the evil omen is within yourselves. Why do you take it as an evil omen when you are reminded of the truth? You are going too far. And um, there is that one other thing. Today we're going to have a shorter class that we wanted to bring up in relation to this. It also relates to the same word. It's this word, ta'ib. And Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Al-Isra, وَكُلِّ إِنسَانًا أَلْزَمْنَهُ طَائِرُهُ فِي عُنُكَهُ وَنُخْرِجُ لَهُ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ كِتَابًا يَلْقَهُ مِنْ شُورًا We have bound each human being's destiny to his neck. On the day of resurrection, we shall bring out a record for each of them, which they will find spread wide open. And the scholars differ about what this ta'ir is. And that Ibn Abbas's opinion is, is that it's their amal, it's their deeds, their actions, and everything that was decreed for them that they would do is that it's constantly with them. And that Mujahid says that it is no person is born except that there is that a waraka, that something written that attached to his neck is that whether that person is a shaqi or sa'id, they're people of paradise or people of perdition. And others say that it's their portion of that khair and shar, of good and of evil. And if you think about this, um, that it, it would be more difficult for a person uh, to try to really understand what this is in the pre-modern world, how all of that could be that attached to someone's neck. And that this is one of the ways that we're actually helped by modern technology and understanding how you can have an incredible amount of information on something that is actually really, really small. That a tiny, that just a tiny piece of whatever the material actually is, that when you that extract the information from it, is that it can contain a massive amount of information. And this is something we believed Allah had the power to do, even without a knowledge of that modern technology. But modern technology makes it easier for us to understand how that could be. Because this is man-made, and that you could have these tiny little things that have such a large amount of information indicating to us that then what are the possibilities in relation to the qudra and the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that this is something that is always going to be with us. Is that based upon the decisions that we make and the good or the evil that will come from the various things that we do. And so when they responded to them that in this way, and they said that the evil omen is within yourselves, at the very end they said, you are going too far. Is that you are a people in the Qur'antum, but antum qawmun musrifun. Is that you are people that have that gone astray, that you've gone too far, and that you should have been in the opposite state in accepting what these messengers brought. And again, I wanted to quote this last passage. This comes from the Ishara of the Tafsir of, of Ibn Ajiba that relates to what it is that we have to go through and how it is that we should that view it. And he says here, أحب الخلق لله إن فعم لإياله وأنصحهم لهم the most beloved of Allah's creation to Allah are those that are most beneficial to his dependents and those that give them the most advice. And then in a hadith, لِيَنْ يَهْدِيَ اللَّهُ بِكَ رُجْلًا وَاحِرًا خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنْ حُمْرَ النَّعْمِ For Allah Ta'ala to guide one person through you is better for you than red camels, which was the most beloved form of wealth to the Arab. So he says, فَيَنْبَغِي لِمَنْ أَرَادَ الظَّفَرَ بِمَحَبَّةِ الْحَبِيبِ وَيَنَالَ مِنْهُ الْحَظْوَ وَالتَّقْرِيبِ أن يتحمل المشاق في إرشاد عباد الله ويستعمل الأسفار في ذلك. He said for those that want to that attain the love of the beloved and to draw near to him and to have that close proximity to him is that to accustom themselves to bearing difficulties in helping the servants of Allah. إرشاد literally means to guide in guiding the servants of Allah and that. 
whatever it is that they have to do in order to do that. He mentions specifically here traveling to go about helping people. So that we can attain a great station that with him and closest to him. This is something that the vast majority of great people that you will find is that a good portion of their life was sent that pointing people towards goodness, guiding people towards what is best, teaching people, advising people, being there for people. And that this is the way these people are. And it's the same way that with minor modifications, depending upon where they are, geographically speaking. And if I think about the teachers that I've had in Mauritania and Yemen primarily, and some of the other places that I visited, even though that they're very different geographically speaking, that culturally they're very different. However, is it, it's the same archetype of the great shuyukh. They're doing the same things. They're dedicating their lives to teaching. They're dedicating their lives to helping people and to serving people and to advising people. And they have taken care of their families and they're worshiping and so forth. And so it's the same archetype which that leads us to that have the understanding is that all we have to do is strive to emulate them. To do our best to do what they did in their particular context in our particular context. And that like anything else, when you build an environment, you have to be well aware about the characteristics of that environment so that you can that know what it is it needs to be in place in order for things to thrive and things to grow. But may Allah Ta'ala give us tawfiq and bless us to open up the meanings of these verses to our hearts. And may Allah Ta'ala have everything that we do be deeds that be pleasing to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah Ta'ala make us firm upon the path and bless us to live and die upon the meanings of La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah. Place immense blessings in the month of Ramadan for us and for our families and for our loved ones and for our community and for the Ummah of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah Ta'ala bless us to be a month of relief for Ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad, a month for increase of the Ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad, and a month whereby which he returns them unto him, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Wa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Muhammadan wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa ala nawainu ta'alam wa ta'alim wa nafa'u wa nantifa' wa tadhaka wa tadhkir wa l-ifadu wa l-istifadu wa hata ala tamasik bi kitabillah wa sunat rasulihi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa dua ala al-huda wa dalala ala khair ibtigha'a wa chilai ta'ala wa marratuhi wa kurbi wa thawabi subhanahu wa ta'ala wa ma'alimha allahu min salih al-niyad nas'ala allahu yaj'alana من العلماء العاملين الفائزين بعلم اليقين وعين اليقين وحق اليقين ويزكنا كمال المتابعة لسيد المرسلين. بسم الله. So we have now reached um, that verse number twenty, and Allah سبحانه وتعالى that says in verse twenty وجاء من أقصى المدينة رجل يسعى قال يا قوم تبعوا المرسلين that then from the furthest part of the city, the outskirts, a man came running. He said, my people follow the messengers. And so that keep in mind up until now that the two messengers that came to the people of the Qarya of the city, they disbelieved in them that a third was sent and that the last two verses that we took in verse 18 and verse 19 they switched their tactic. Tactic. They were trying to now find a pretext whereby which that they could get rid of them, and they threatened them with violence. And then they respond to them by saying that, in reality, is that this evil omen you've brought it on your own self, because of your disbelief, and uh, the way that you've chosen to respond to the truth that it is that we've brought. And so now that there is another person that has entered into the story. <clears throat> Allah Ta'ala that speaks of him, that in indefinite, a rajul, a man, that he, that comes from the furthest part of the city, running. And so if you can think about what is taking place now, and as that these three apostles or these three messengers, 
is that they're being threatened, they are on the verge of being punished, then this person who hears about this, that's described as being from the outskirts of the city, that comes into the scene, and he comes running. So you can just imagine this scenario. And generally speaking, the scholars say is that this rajul, although it's left in the indefinite, and some say one of the uh, rhetorical purposes of it being indefinite is to exalt the stature of this man, as we'll see that he indeed is someone special. But many of them identify with someone by the name of Habib and Najjar. And that um, those who say that it's Habib and Najjar say that he was that worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in seclusion when the news of the message bearers came, came and then he that let people know that he was a believer. Um, and uh, there is a hadith and there's different narrations um, that talk about the foremost, this sabq among people, and that they are three. An additional trait of these people who were described as being the foremost is that they didn't disbelieve in Allah for the blinking of an eye. And the first is the great companion of the Prophet, Sayyidina Adi bin Abi Talib, and then that the believer from the people of Pharaoh, and of course the companion of Yasin. And so that in another interpretation it says that this individual Habib al Najjar that followed the two message bearers after they healed his son. And so there is a story, and it's a, a long story that Imam al baghawi that mentions in his tafsir, we're not going to quote the whole story because it's long, but very briefly, that he says here, that the scholars said, is that in relation to, uh, that, that they said that Isa had sent that two of his apostles, and this is according to this position, that it was his apostles, to the city of Antioch. And when they got close to the city, they saw an older man who was tending his sheep. And in the narration it says it's Habib and Najjar. And known as Sahab Yasin. فَسَلَّمَ عَلَيْهِ They greeted him. And then he that said to them, that who are you two? And they said that we are the two message bearers of, of Jesus. Is that we are his apostles. And that we are calling you that from the worshipping of idols to the worshipping of the All-Merciful. And then Habib bin Najjar says, is that, do you have some type of sign? And they said, yes, is that we heal the sick, and that we that cure lepers, and we cure the blind from the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, is that, he says to them, that I have a son who has been sick for years. And they said, that let us go see him. So that he takes him to his home, and that they wipe over his son, and that he was healed instantly. And that, um, that it, some say that, that they were actually healed quite a few people in this village that they went to. And then after this is that they eventually go to the king of that particular area. But this first part is the part that relates to Habib bin Najjar. And that when he saw this is what happened, is it, of course, that he's going to believe in them. And so that whatever the case was, whether it's, this was the truth or whether he was already worshiping God's seclusion and then that announced his faith, is that he heard that these messengers were being persecuted. And so he comes from the outskirts of the city and he's doing his best to help. And so that, again, if you think about this, is that imagine that all of the people that are around in, in, in the pre-modern world and the way that this would have been conducted and this is done that in front of a large number of people and they are threatening these messengers on the verge of punishing them and then this man comes that right into the middle of the scene and the way that Allah Ta'ala says it Allah described him as coming from the furthest part of the city and he was yasa, he was running so just imagine him running into that this situation and this also indicates to us about what type of person this was what was it that motivated this individual who to come from the furthest part of the city and to go stand up for people that were being wrongly treated, knowing is that his life could be on the line. And that 
This is why that it is a hadith that says that أفضل الجهاد كلمة حقا that and the Sultan in Jair. The greatest jihad is to speak a word of truth in front of an oppressive ruler. This is the greatest jihad of all because you are giving victory or you're attempting to give victory to the truth. And so that he runs into the situation and knowing full well is that his life could be on, a, on the line. Knowing full well is that just as that they had persecuted and disbelieved in those messengers, that the chances of them believing in him or taking what he said to be true, that was slim. Despite this, this man was moved. And these type of people are few and far between. The vast majority of people cower away from any conflict. The vast majority of people cower away from the living a life of truth and standing up for the truth. This story should inspire us to be people that if we believe in something, is that we stand by what it is that we believe in. If we have principles, is that we adhere to those principles and we stick to those principles. And if we believe in something, that we do not compromise anything in relation to our belief. And what ends up happening is, usually, is that people slowly start to compromise in small ways. And then a small door opens, and then another door, and then another door, and another door, and another door, until we end up losing everything altogether. There are certain things that are black and white where there is no compromise. And we should be willing to that bear some type of harm to our physical body or to our wealth or something else that pertains to us because we want to stand up for those particular principles. And the vast majority of people in the world respect people, especially in the society, that stand up for their principles. The vast majority of people are like this, even if they disagree with what it is that they're standing up against or standing up for. But they'll respect them. And this is something that a Muslim should know very well, that despite everything that is happening, despite everything that is being said about Islam and Muslims, despite the, the bad reputation that many Muslims have gotten because of a number of, a number of reasons, one of the greatest being is that Muslims themselves making catastrophic mistakes, is that still we have to be people of principle and stand up for truth. And we hope that Allah Ta'ala will give us tawfiq, that if we are in a situation where something needs to be said, that we will say it. If we are in a situation where someone needs to be defended, that we will defend that person. If we are in a situation where someone needs to be protected, that we will protect that person. And this is what we ask Allah Ta'ala for. And this is one of the meanings of the story, is that he came from the furthest part of the city running. And he comes right into the situation, knowing fully well the consequences of what he's doing. And then he says three things. The first thing he says as he comes among them is, Ya He said, My people follow the messengers. And so immediately he comes among them that acknowledges that they are messengers. And that acknowledges is that they are bringing truth because he's telling them to ittabi'u, telling him to follow them. And the idea of that following is that not just believing in those teachings, but embracing them. And that in all of the different aspects and all of the different that things that these teachings pertain to, is that taking those into that their life and putting it into practice. This is the very first thing that he says. And then that, of course, is that the people might be wondering, who is this person that has just come from the edge of the city? And so that the next thing he has to say is to give a reason that why is it he thinks that they should follow him. So he's trying to remind them. The first thing he wants to make his message clear is that by saying follow the messengers, he's also saying that what you're doing is wrong. These are people that need to be followed. These are people that if you follow them, that will open up the doors of goodness for you. But then he says that ittabiu man la yasalukum ajran wa hum Follow those who do not ask you for any reward and who are rightly guided. So these are the other two things that he says. So the first was, 
follow the messengers. The second is, ittabiyu man la yas'alukum ajran. Follow those who do not ask you for any reward. And this is something of the utmost importance. Because a lot of people will wonder when someone is calling to something, what is the ulterior motive? Why are they doing that? There must be some reason. And this is not just in the time of the Prophet and this is in previous times and even to this day. People are very weary of being called to something because they think that there's some type of ulterior motive that the person has behind it. There's something that they're going to get out of it. And people will say, nothing is for free. How could someone give you something for free? Everything has its price. And that when you're being called to something, is that some, most of the time, is that the vast majority of people that actually do have ulterior motives, they have a reason that it, they're doing it, and it's not based upon a sincere intention of truly doing it for the sake of Allah Ta'ala. It's usually something of a worldly nature. And so that he reminds them and he says to them is that these are people that who are that not asking you for any ajr, any reward or any recompense. Meaning is that these are people who are not doing it for the sake of their own selves. These are people that are not calling to themselves. These are people that are not don't have ulterior motives. Is that these are people who truly believe in the oneness of Allah and that He is the only one who deserves to be worshipped, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that if this be the case, and that they're not they're not asking you for any recompense. This is a sign of their sincerity. And that this is why we see also that on the tongue of uh, Sayyidina Nur is that فَإِن تَوَلَّيْتُمْ فَمَا سَأَلْتُكُمْ مِنْ أَجْرٍ إِنْ أَجْرِ إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ وَأُمِرْتُ أَنْ أَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And Noah says, and if you turn your backs, I have not asked of you any recompense. My recompense lies only with Allah. And that I am commanded to be among those who submit. And then that the Prophet وسلم, as it also was that commanded to say this. And Surah Al-An'am, قُلْ لَا أَسْلُكُمَا لِأَجْرًا إِنْ وَإِلَّا ذِكْرًا لِلْعَالَمِينَ Say that I ask you for no ajr, I ask you for no reward, I ask you for no recompense. Indeed, that it is only a reminder for all of the worlds. And then in Surah Al-Shu'ara, that in um, five different places in that Surah, Allah Ta'ala says, وَمَا أَسْلُكُمْ عَلِي مِنْ أَجْرٍ That I ask you for no recompense. إِنْ أَجْرَ إِلَّا عَلَى رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ My recompense, my reward, is that comes from the Lord of the worlds, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this is really of the utmost importance. And this is something that our teachers emphasized time and time again. And how the importance of when we do things for the deen, is that we do them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should have no ulterior motives. And an ulterior motive, what it means by that is, is it something that relates to our own nafs, something that relates to our own desires. If you have desires, desires that aren't necessarily wrong, as long as you are channeling them in a way that is legal, according to the Sharia. So it's nothing, there's nothing wrong with gratifying your desires in a way that the Sharia has permitted it. But the key is to not do that when it comes to the deen. Is that the deen is not there for us to make money. And anyone that is using the deen to make money, that person should stop. And again, there's nothing wrong with making money. Go get a job, start a business, do something and make a lot of money. But don't do it with deen. The deen is not here to make money from. The deen is here that for us to learn, to embrace, and to draw near to Allah Jalla Jalalu. And the teachers that Allah Ta'ala have blessed me to study with, I could say, not knowing, but with full confidence, that they have never accepted an honorarium in their entire life. Ever. It's inconceivable for them to get paid to do a program, or to teach, or to convey the message. Inconceivable. And usually, they actually come out of their own pocket to that uh, take people with them on the trip 
and to take care of their own accommodations and so forth and so on. The most that they will allow is for people to arrange their travel expenses and things of this nature, which is totally understandable. And in many cases, is that they even do that. This is the way they are. And they're very, very cautious. And if someone ever gives them something, is that they just pass it on and they distribute or they give it to someone else. But to that do something for to do a program for the sake of money. And this is something that someone told me recently that there are this is getting out of control with people that are that speaking publicly and conveying the deen and demanding very high honorariums and um, sometimes even percentages for fundraisers that they speak for. And it's, it was kind of hard for me to believe that this is actually even happening. And the deen is not there to be made money off of. We should try to make these teachings as accessible as possible. If you have to charge to cover costs, okay, that's understandable. But once you open up that door, to charge for even future things that you, is that you're going to do, you have to be careful. Because then what ends up happening is, is that you start alienating people that oftentimes need those programs the most. And yes, we live in a difficult time where, what do you do then if you don't charge? Where is the money going to come from? Is that we need to do two things. Deal with the situation that we're in and make the best of it. But then also find other ways. Why can't we be creative moving forward? Well, we find other ways. Ways of making scholarships, ways of creating endowments and so forth and so on. So that we don't have to be trapped in the same that, uh, that cycle that we always find ourselves in. And at least let's start thinking about this. At least let's that not feel comfortable in it is that we're doing. Because the ideal is, is that we want to be able to share the beauty of these teachings with anyone and everyone, wherever they might be, on the face of this earth. And anything that gets in the way of that, we should reject and move out of the way. And that we should be willing to sacrifice so that more people can have access to the truth of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So, that this is really one of the marks of prophethood, is that they don't ask anything from people. All they want is to share the teachings so that people can then follow. And that likewise, those that are representing the deen, those that are teaching the deen, those that are learning the deen, those that are serving the deen, is that this principle has to be at the forefront of our minds. Is that we do this solely for the sake of Allah Ta'ala. Yes, you have needs, but those needs, you should see it as something that's absolutely ne just needs to be taken care of. Once you open up the door for that, saving and, and that, and that uh, um, acquiring large sums and then thinking about all the things that you need to do with that money in the future and so forth and so on, is that it's a very, very slippery slope when we open up that door for ourselves when it comes to the deen. And then in the end, what ends up happening is, is that you lose your ability to truly influence the people who need it the most. So you think that you're helping yourself by doing that, but you are compromising the most important thing about you, which is your own integrity, which if you don't have that, is that how are you really truly going to impact people? How are you truly going to impact people? We do not want to be from the people that are calling to Allah with our tongues and that calling to the fire with our hearts and our reality, the reality of our state. Is that... We want to call to Allah Ta'ala with our tongue and with our state. And may Allah Ta'ala forgive us for all of our shortcomings. And that may Allah Ta'ala forgive us for all of the people that we actually push away from the deen because of how we are. And that is something very sorrowful to really think about and scary at the same time. How many people we pushed away from the deen because of how we are because of our lack of character, because of our lack of living up to the reality of this deen. And that we always like to focus on the people that we've helped. But what about the people that we've pushed away? What about the people we've been unable to reach because of how we are? This should scare us and we should fear being taken into account from it. And that this monetary dimension is one of those one of those things. Once that seeps into the heart of someone, and once they start using the religion that to earn money, it becomes a very slippery slope. 
and that again this is a, a larger issue that also needs to be discussed it doesn't mean that we that force our imams and our community leaders and our religious leaders into poverty and to live so simply that they have no room to have any flexibility in life that's not what I'm referring to at all I'm talking about the level of the intention and the level of detachment and of how we approach the deen. Our focus should be on conveying the message and then everything else will work out and we let other people think about those things. So this is the very first thing that he mentions is that follow those who do not ask you for any reward, which is a sign that they're sincere. They have no ulterior motives. They're, about, they're being persecuted anyway. وَهُمْ muhtadun And they are rightly guided. In other words, is that if you look at their behavior, is that their behavior is formidable. They have good character. They're upon the straight path. Look at the way they deal with people. Look at their traits. Look at their worship, and so forth and so on. In other words, is that the way, whatever it is that we're calling to, has to be reflected in what it is that we're doing in our life. We have to live those realities. muhtadun. <laughs> They are rightly guided, that these are people that if you just look at them and follow them and observe them, is that you will find is that they are practicing what they preach and living the realities of what they are calling to. And then that Allah Ta'ala says, Why should I not worship the one who created me and to whom you will be returned? And what it appears here, as some of the Mufassirin have said, is that when this situation was taking place, the people who were persecuting the message bearers were a bit surprised by this individual all of a sudden coming upon the scene. And then mention these things about the messengers. And what seems to be reasonable to conclude, because they obviously in the end did kill this individual, is that they became very angry and they directed their, they moved their intention and attention from the messengers now to this particular individual. And that there's a conversation it seems to have taken place. And we only know certain details of, those, of that conversation that Allah Ta'ala mentions here. But it seems that there was a little bit of a back and forth. And so some of the scholars have posed what some of those questions might have been. And that as this person comes in and says these things and makes these claims, is that many of them that might have looked at this person and said to him, that, you know, you know, have you believed in these messengers and left the way or the religion or the beliefs of your people? And then if he came in that way, that suddenly was such purpose, he would have likely affirmed that right off the bat. He's indeed saying that he's already saying that they're Mursaleen. And that then that they might have that uh, that then asked him that who he worships and has he left the way of worshiping the idols of their ancestors and he would have probably confirmed this and so that it's here then that once he confirms that he worships that one God and to keep in mind that they were polytheists is that the, the next verse or uh, that uh, then. Um, uh, when Allah Ta'ala says here, in this verse, Why should I not worship the one who created me and to whom will, we will be returned? And so, here, that it's to cause these people to think. Is that why would we not worship the one who created us, subhanahu wa ta'ala? And this was appropriate for this particular situation for people that have that move towards worship the worship of idols and if we look at this word that fatara there is a word that is derived from it that we all know but it's a very important word and it's fitra your fitra is your innate disposition it's your primordial nature and that Allah Ta'ala says faqim wajhaka lid-dini hanifan and that to turn your face towards the deen as a hanif. And then that the primordial nature that Allah Ta'ala has originated a people upon, originated mankind upon. And so the idea of fitrah 
is that this is how we were in the beginning. This is how we were created to be. And that as we enter into the world and we become socialized and through a process of acting upon our inner speech and making decisions, is that we oftentimes move away from the fitrah. But the fitrah is that original state that also indicates our potentiality, our potential as humans. And so the, the idea of the fitrah, one of the ways that we can see it is, is that it's that state that we were in when we were standing before Allah. And it's what we have to recapture once we enter into this lower world. And we fall victim to the pull of it, is that we have to try to rediscover our fitrah. And we have to that try to that purify our hearts so that it can fulfill its purpose, which is to know Allah Taala. So the fitra relates to our uncovering or having uncovered for us the Adamic potential of attaining ma'rifa, of knowledge of Allah Jalla Jalalu, and so that this relates to ultimately the whole purpose of existence, which is to know Allah. Jalla Jalalu. So he's reminding them of the Creator, the Originator, the one who brought us into existence, Subhanahu wa Taala. And then in verse 23, min duni aliyatan in yaridna rahmanu yudurran la tulni anni shafa'adum shayin wa la yunkidun. Shall I not take? Shall I take a God apart from Him? If the All Merciful desired harm for me, their intercession would not help me nor would they save me. And so he first takes it back to the a knowledge of the Creator, the Originator, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he's going to treat this idea of worshipping other gods. And keep in mind is that they affirmed earlier that Allah was the Rahman, so they affirmed the existence of God. But they believed that by worshipping other gods, it could get them closer to that Allah, or to God. And so that he wants to treat this now and say that and put it in the form of a question where he's simultaneously rebuking them and the answer is very clear. Shall I take God, uh, take a God apart from him? That why would we do this? Right? When he's the one who's created us, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the, he's bringing a proof to understand how this really works. If the all merciful desired harm for me, their intercession would not help me, nor would they save me. And this is something that is obvious. Is that what is what are they really going to do for you? Nothing. And that he is reminding them of them of this. Now, when we hear these stories about polytheists and people worshipping other than Allah Jalla Jalalu, it is important for us to always remember that there's other types of, of shirk in our time that are very subtle and the days of, of people that worshiping um, idols the way that it was done previously is that less common now than it was before although this still does happen this still does happen but it's less common than it was previously but there's other types of that idols that people have set up for themselves. And one of the greatest is their own hawa, their own desires. And everyone will follow something. Everyone will follow something. And whatever that something is that allows us to make the decisions that it is that, it is that we make, essentially is what we worship as human beings. We are going to have something as a foundation for what it is that we do. And if every decision that we make is based upon what feels good, or what we want to do, or whatever thought comes to our mind, or whatever desire comes to that ourself, then in a sense that we are that worshipping that our desire. That there's another type of shirk, and it is the shirk of the aql, is that if we set up a, a belief system for ourselves whereby which is that we absolutely must understand everything through the intellect and make the intellect the measure whereby which we understand everything 
We don't believe that there's anything super rational. And we've made that decision to understand everything fully through the intellect. Then that's a type of shirk. And this is the essence of what happened to summarize that one of the consequences of a several hundred year process in the West that led us to the situation that we're in today, that chaotic situation we're in today, which is where that the intellect was placed over revelation, where the intellect becomes the criterion whereby which that all matters are judged. And the intellect has an amazing ability. But there are certain things that the intellect cannot fully grasp. The intellect can that is is limited in a sense and what it can fully grasp and this is the way that we've always seen it there are certain things that no matter how much you think about them there's no way for the intellect in and of itself to come to a conclusion about what's going to happen after death that's super rational that's beyond the ability of the intellect to come to that conclusion so that if we say that because my intellect cannot come to the conclusion about what's going to happen in the afterworld. I'm not going to believe in it. That is your decision. And you have accepted that way of thinking. But in a sense, that it is a subtle type of shirk because is that if it prevents you from that accepting prophetic truth, from accepting things that are of a super rational nature, is that because of what you've set up for yourself, in a sense that it's a type of worship of the intellect by putting it in a place that it actually shouldn't be. The intellect has a very lofty station. I don't want to sound like I am that in any way that knocking the intellect. No, it is a very lofty station. But its purpose is to understand revelation. Its purpose is to help you believe in revelation and to put it into practice. And in relation to the purpose of human beings, it's to get you to the door, but it's the heart that gets you in. Knowledge of Allah or Ma'rifah, the locus of that knowledge is the heart. The intellect can get you to the door. The intellect plays a great function and has a great purpose. But we can't that expect it to come to a conclusion that is beyond its scope. And likewise, the senses, you could say the same thing. Is that if you just say, I'm not going to believe in anything unless that it can be scientifically proven. First of all, what does it mean to be scientific? Second of all, what actually is a proof? Which are huge questions in and of themselves. But then, on top of that, you just basically said that unless it can be understood through the sensory, I'm not going to believe in that thing. You've made that decision. And by doing that, this is a type, potentially, of shirk. The because is that you have that forced yourself to see the world through that particular lens, and that you won't accept certain things that based upon the way that you are thinking, but you've chosen to see the world like that. Anyhow, uh, because I, I don't want us to get distracted and say that, oh, that, well, there aren't people that are worshipping idols around me. And um, there are very subtle forms of shirk, and we should always be aware of that. And there are other meanings that if we reflected upon this, that we would be able to find different parallels and different that psychological responses and so forth. And this is really what we want to do to make, to bring the Qur'an uh, into that our lives. And so that the idea of shafa'ah is that something that we believe that Allah Ta'ala will give certain people the ability to intercede. Allah Ta'ala will... Uh, give, certain, give the prophets the ability to intercede. Certain people from their communities, he'll give them the ability to intercede. But that is solely from the will of Allah, if he allows them to intercede. And um, as Allah Ta'ala says uh, in Ayat al-Kursi, مَنْ ذَلَّلْ عِنْدُهُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ Who is it that will intercede that with him except with his permission? If Allah Ta'ala permits someone to intercede, that they'll have the ability to then do so. And so, that he is now that treating this, this fact that these other idols that you're worshipping, they're not going to help you. They're not going to benefit you if the All-Merciful wants to harm me, that they're not going to help, nor are they going to save. And then, 
that after saying this, that in the form of a question, that inni idhan lafi dalalin mubin. If I were to do this, right, take God's that apart from Him, truly then I would be in manifest error, in manifest error. And um, this idea of dalal mubin is the estate whereby which someone's mistakes and the wrong that they do is that causes them to stray from the way of truth. MashaAllah. And then what appears to have happened is that after they're having this conversation and he is saying what is that he's just said, is that it appears is that that now that they have had enough of this person. And the same thing that they had threatened the previous apostles or messengers with, now they want to carry out immediately with this particular individual. And that's why the next verse in 25 is, إِنِّي آمَنْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ فَاسْمَعُونَ لا إله إلا الله That truly I believe in your Lord, so listen to me. So listen to me. And that uh, according to some, that this means is that uh, it's the call to the people. This is his last attempt to call people to following the messengers. And there is another interpretation, uh, which um, it is to um, that asking the message bearers to bear witness on his behalf before Allah. In the amun to birabikum fasmaun. So just Isma'un, listen to what I'm saying so that you can bear witness that for me on the day of judgment that I believe properly and I'm doing what it is that I should do. Or it's his last attempt to call the people uh, to um, the, this truth. And then it was right after this is that they then, that they killed him. And that some of the commentators say is that they started to stone him. Again, if you remember, it, there was a mention of stoning before, is that they started to stone him. And in one narration, is that as they are stoning him, that he's making the dua, Allah mihdi qawmi, O Allah guide my people for in whom la ya'lamun, because indeed that they do not know, which is the dua that our Prophet made, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as they're stoning him, you can imagine, you're not going to die right away. That's a very painful death. Is that? He's praying for them, he's praying for them, and he's praying for them. And others say that they just, that all attacked him and then just beat him to death. And others say that he stoned him. But the, uh, what they do mention though is, is that he was making dua for them, right, as this was happening. And what this tells us is, is that the mercy that we should have towards our people, and that the greatest manifestation of that mercy, which is desiring that a noble end for all people in the hereafter. This is the greatest mercy that we can show towards people, is desiring people to attain eternal salvation. And then another type of mercy is a mercy that we show that relates to all of the worldly needs of people, and that we want everyone to be taken care of. But then, after this, see, so he says, Truly I believe in your Lord, so listen to me. And then they kill him, and he's martyred. And then in verse 26, Jannah. It was said to him, Enter Jannah, enter into the garden. And he said, If only my people knew. He's just wishing that his people would have known. And known what? What it is that he's experiencing. And so that the angels that of mercy is that they said to him after he died. Enter into paradise. Enter into paradise. Udhul Jannah. That enter into paradise. And that as he starts to experience the bliss which starts just as you die, from standing up for the truth and that calling people to the truth and dying for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that he just wishes is that his people that knew. And look at the beauty of this is, is that he's experiencing this bliss. And these are people that did this to him already. But still he's wishing that they knew. 
even after he passes. As he's experiencing the bliss, he still wants his people, his qawm, to know. Where are we from that? To what degree do we want our qawm? We have to see the people that are living here with us, wherever it is that we are. We are living in the United States of America. These are our people. All of them are our people. Whether they are black, white, somewhere in between, whether they have been here for generations, or whether they are newly arrived, whether they speak English that perfectly, or whether they speak with an accent, people that are here in this land are our qawm. These are our people. And we have to see them as our people. And we have to have mercy for our people. If we don't have mercy in our hearts towards our people, how can we ever expect them to accept anything is that we say? How? If we don't have the right state of heart, is that we want to be a mercy for our people. And we should have a deep concern for our people. Not just a surface level concern, a deep concern that motivates us to work day in and day out. And when I say work, don't think that that means that it has to be in that something that you do directly as a form of service of the deen. When I say working day in and day out, it's living these truths, working on yourself. When I say work day, working day in and day out, it's living those truths that at home with your family so that they become inculcated in them living these truths as we interact with people on a daily basis. All of us are interacting with people, whether it's cyber communication or whether it's in person, is that let's remember our duty as Muslims in every single interaction. Let's remember the traits of heart that we are supposed to have so that we can that be from these people that are committed to sharing the greatest beauty with our people. And so that it was said unto him, enter the garden. He said, if only my people knew. How my Lord has forgiven me and placed me among the highly honored. Allahu Akbar. That he attained the forgiveness of Allah Jalla Jalalu. And is that he also was from the Mukrameen. And anyone that Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala would that honor and to show his generosity to, again, you can only imagine what would be the state of that particular individual. And this is why that we have a hadith in Al Bukhari and Muslim that states, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ma ahadun dunya, ma fil min shayn shaheed. Is that no one after entering into paradise will that want to come back to the world, and that wa inna lahu ma fil adi min shayi ghairu shahid, other than the martyr. فإنه يتمنى أن يرجع في وقت العشرة مرات. Is that the one who dies for Allah's sake will wish to come back and to die ten times. لما يرى من الكرامة. Because of what he sees of how he is honored when he returns to Allah. And again, when we speak of that martyrdom, we speak of true martyrdom. We're not speaking of people who that are doing things, that thinking by that their life being taken, that they're somehow going to attain what the Prophet is referring to. The means has to be justified and the ends has to be justified. And unfortunately, as our teachers have said, is that you have people when they that understand a meaning of martyrdom, it's convoluted, and that they are seeking paradise by actions that could potentially take them to hell. What we mean by martyrdom is the true martyr in every civilization, in every society. They honor people that stand up and die for their principles. And this is what we're referring to when we talk about this type of martyrdom, is that people that are standing up for truth, and the people that are living with the highest morals and the highest values and as a result they sacrifice their lives for it and anything that is not worth dying for is definitely not worth living for as MLK Jr. said is that we should that live 
for something that is of meaning. We should be willing to sacrifice the greatest thing of all for that. And so is that he attained forgiveness and of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is that Allah ta'ala that honored him to that be from those who are from the mukrameen that they're going to receive the special bounty of Allah Jalla Jalalu. And again, as if for this act that he did, may Allah Ta'ala bless us to be inspired by uh, these stories of the Qur'an. May these realities that come into our hearts, Ya Rabbil Alameen, when we put them into practice. And that may Allah Ta'ala that bring our hearts to life with his remembrance and to bless us to be living examples to the extent possible as much as we could follow the Prophet in this and so far as he was a Qur'an walking may Allah Ta'ala bless us to implement that and to bless that to be our reality that to the highest degree bi may Allah Ta'ala bless us in these nights and in these days and to forgive all of our sins and to have mercy upon us and upon our communities and to that give us tawfiq in all of our different affairs wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadan وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين صحبه ومن ولا نوينا تعلم والتعليم ونفع الانتفاع وتذكر والتذكير والإفادة والاستفادة والحث على التمسك بكتاب الله وصنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم والدعاء إلى الهدى والدلع على الخير ابتغاء وجه الله تعالى ومن رات وكربه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى so we have reached uh, verse 28 of Surah Yasin, and we left off in the last session in the words of Allah Taala. Ta Qila dhuul jannah. It is said to him, "Enter into paradise." Qali yali ta kumi yaglamun. Oh, were it my people to know, bima ghafar li Rabbi, how my Lord has forgiven me, wa jaalani min al mukarameen, and made me from amongst the honored. And we talked about how the scholars, many of them said that this is Habib bin Najjar, he's the one that came from that the furthest that part of the city and to give victory that to the messengers and then that when he that preoccupied them with what he was saying is that their response was is that they brutally took his life and after he was murdered and he saw what Allah Ta'ala had in store for those who dedicate their lives to the truth is that then he said that he even wished, he wished even then that his people could know what it is that he that was receiving. And then in verse 28, Allah says, وَمَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَى قَوْمِهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مِنْ جُنْدًا مَنْ السَّمَاءِ وَمَا كُنَّا مُنْزِلِينَ after him, we did not send any army from heaven against his people, nor were we about to, or nor would we send down. So, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after this happens, is that he's about to unleash, he's, that because of what happened, and the way that they brutally took the life of Habib bin Najjar, is that they deserve the divine wrath. Rasulullah what afia and that as a result for that their denial of the prophet of the of the messages that were brought to them and then that this what they did to this individual is that this is what it led to and that the way that Allah ta'ala that says this that he presents this in a particular way which we will now analyze but before we do that we want to look at this word jund in the arabic language that is translated here as army and that jund is the basic word that you use for a host, an army, a that set of troops. And it comes from the Arabic word janad, which is a that type of very hard earth that has rocks in it. So it's a difficult type of earth, ard ghalila. And as a result, that you can that see the meaning of how it relates to an army is that because people who are in the army have to have that certain toughness and a hardness to them because their job is to protect and that they might have to go to war. And then it came to be used, this word jun that is, rooted in this meaning of being like hard earth that is very tough, to be used for 
that the gathering of anything, so a that number of people. And so this is why we this is the word that is used in the hadith of the Prophet at Arwahu Junudun Mujannada is that the spirits are Junud, they are armies in the plural. Mujannada set up in ranks. So on the second form when you say Jannada Ijannidu it's to set the jund in ranks, to set the army in ranks. And so, our Prophet is indicating something about the spirits, is that they're like armies set in ranks. You have different divisions, and that division stays together. And likewise, when it comes to the spirit, is that you have certain spirits that were together. And then that manifests here in this world, is that some will feel closer to others, then that you feel closer to some people rather than others. The plural of Jund is either Ajnad or Junud. And so we find that Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Al-Ahzab, أُذْكُرُوا نِعْمْتَ اللَّهِ عَلِيكُمْ إِذْ جَاءَتْكُمْ جُنُودٌ فَأَرْسَلْنَا عَلِيهِمْ رِيحًا وَجُنُودٌ لَمْ تَرَوْهَا Is that remember the blessing of Allah upon you. When an army came to you, so here the word Junud, فَأَرْسَنَ عَلَيْهِمْ رِيحًا And thus that we sent upon them that a wind وَجُنُودًا and an army لَمْ تَرَوْهَا that you did not see. And so the commentators say on this, the first Junud was a, an actual army of disbelievers. The second Junud was an army in the unseen realm of angels that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent. And so that in this idea of host or army, it could have an outward dimension or it could have an inward dimension. And then we see this word further used in Surah Al-Mudathar when Allah Ta'ala says, وَمَا يَعْلَمُ جُنُودَ رَبِّكَ إِلَّا هُو And none know the junood of your Lord except who? Except Him. In other words, is that none truly know the host, the jumu'at khalqah, is that how the divisions of his creation, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and from among them are the angels that were previously mentioned. And then we have a very interesting saying of Imam al-Junaid. Imam al-Junaid al-Baghdadi, this great Imam who is the great Imam of the science of Tasawwuf. He is the one that codified, it, codified the science. So we have this great statement of Imam al-Junaid that when he was asked about stories in particular murids, that is people that were taking the spiritual path seriously and that how should that they view stories. And he responded by saying, Al-Hikayatu Jundun Min Junudi Allahi Ta'ala is that stories are an army from the armies of Allah Ta'ala. Whereby which that he strengthens the hearts of those seeking closeness to Allah. And then he was asked, shahid? Is there any proof of that? And that he responded by saying, Naam, yes. The words of Allah Ta'ala, وَكُلٍ نُقُصُّ مَنْ أَنْبَاءِ رُسَرِي and then the words of Allah Ta'ala that say is that in that we tell you the stories of the messengers in order to make your heart firm. But what he likens this though to that a jund min junudillah, a host from the host of Allah. And so the angels are from the host of Allah, but Allah says, is that that only He knows the host. No one knows the host of your Lord except Him. In other words, that how He wants to that bring about a certain effect, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether it's through the angels or, in this case, is it's through a story of listening to something of the righteous. And so this is the word that we find in this verse. وَمَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَى مِنْ بَعْدِ مِنْ جُنْد After Him, we did not send any army from heaven against his people. And again, this is in reference to Habib bin Najjar after he was brutally killed. And what this, وَمَا كُنَّ مُنْزِلِينَ 
nor were we about to or nor would we send down. And that the reason that he is saying it like this, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that it is an indication of how he punished these people. And we know that according to the tafsir literature, that Allah Ta'ala sent Jibreel alayhi salam and that he that took the two the edges of the city and then he that cried out a that very loud cry fa'idahum khamidun which is coming in the next verse and they fell down lifeless and that there was not a single spirit left in any of them and that in this verse in verse 28 that this is a way of saying is that he punished them in the quickest of ways because of what it is that they did he didn't even have to send down subhanahu wa ta'ala a jund from heaven a host from heaven rather is that he did it quickly in the way that was described and in other words is that almost in this is a type of belittling the people as a result of how they were punished but again, they brought this punishment on themselves by the way they treated the apostles or the messengers, by the way they treated this righteous man who came from the outskirts of the city. <clears throat> and when we read these stories, is that the conclusion that we come to is that actions have consequences. And we read them to understand that our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala has names of beauty and he has names of majesty. And what we want is to live in a way whereby which is that he manifests in us in such that we experience his beautiful name, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the reality is, is that when human beings go astray, is that they bring about the divine wrath upon themselves. And we ask Allah wa ta'ala to protect us. And may he grant us safety, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Fakhari al-Razi that brings up a question, he says, were someone to say is that Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala that sent down a host on the day of Badr, a host of angels, an army of angels to let help the companions, as we find in Surah Tawbah, wa anzala junudan lam taroha, and that he sent an army that you did not see. And why then would, how do we understand this? If that in this case that Allah Ta'ala did not send down an army, but we explain what that was, is that why would he send down an army then in the case of when the Prophet Sallallahu was fighting? Because he subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he wanted to, could have given him victory without those means. But the conclusion that we come to that is, is that biyadihi al-mulk, the dominion belongs solely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He does things as he wants to do. He can either that cause things to happen, whereby which he uses a means, and then it leads to a certain effect, or he subhanahu wa ta'ala could that do something directly. That's up to him. So in the battle of Badr, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending down an army that to assist those that were fighting was there to honor the Prophet Muhammad It was to honor him, to shurifen and to alimen. And so, is that this is why that we understand is that the Prophet وسلم, is the most beloved of all to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the people that live their lives solely for his sake is that they have divine assistance. And Allah wa ta'ala subjugates the asbab, the means to them. He subjugates the means to them so that it's there to help them. And that this is also because is that when the means are subjugated to these people, is that they will only use them in the very best of ways, which will bring about benefit to people. And when we talk about blessings and we talk about the ability to do things and when we talk about whether it be status or wealth or whatever it might be, the key factor that you and I always have to think about is what is going to be of benefit to the people. What is going to be of benefit to the people? That is really the most important thing of all. When we think about decisions that we make and how we use our resources, how we use what Allah Ta'ala has gifted us, what is going to be of benefit to the people? 
And the more benefit that can be brought to someone, the better. And then Allah Ta'ala says, وَمَا كُنَّا مُنْزِلِينَ Nor were we about to. And that this is a way of that expressing subhanahu wa ta'ala is that وَمَا كُنَّا أَيْتْ مَا كَانَ يَنْبَغِي لَنَا أَنْ نُنْزِلَ لِأَنَّ الْأَمْرَ كَانَ يُتِمْ بِدُونَ ذَلِكْ It wasn't that uh, a need for us to do that because that it could be done without that or not a need is that it wasn't befitting because it could be done without that. فَمَا أَنْزَلْنَا وَمَا كُنَّا مُحْتَاجِينَ إِنَّ إِنْزَالَ That there wasn't a need for us to that do that. Nor would we send down. And then Allah Ta'ala says in verse 29, إِنْ كَانَتْ إِلَّا صَيْحَةً وَاحِدَةً فَإِذَا هُمْ خَامِدُونَ It was but one cry. And they fell down lifeless. This word that we first have here that uh, uh, after the exception, illa sayha, um, in the Arabic language, saha yasihu, sayhan, was sayahan, was sayahanan. There's three different masdars. It's to that make a that very loud noise. And so a sayha is a cry to raise your voice. And it comes from a word in Arabic um, that relates to that. What is called Tashqiq as Sot. Mikolihim in Sahal Khashab or with Thob Ithan Shak Fasimya Minhu Fasimya Minhu as Sot. And it comes from the sound of that a piece of wood breaking or that someone tearing a piece of cloth. And so that it kind of separating here either that the two pieces of wood or the cloth and then hearing something that come from that. And it's also used that in relation to the blowing of the horn. In Surah Al-Qaf, as Allah says, يَوْمَ يَسْمَعُنَ السَّيْحَةَ بِالْحَقِّ On the day that they will hear the cry with truth. And it's also used to that indicate punishment. وَأَخَذَ الَّذِينَ الظَّلَمُ السَّيْحَةُ فَأَصْبَحُ فِي دِيَارِهِمْ جَاتِمِينَ And that the sayha that took those who had oppressed and so Allah Ta'ala is saying, إِنْ كَانَتْ إِلَّا صَيْحَةً وَاحِيْتَةً It was but one cry. And this is the way that he, that willed to punish these people, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the result of it, فَإِذَا هُمْ خَامِدُونَ And they fell down lifeless. And the word that خَامِدُونَ خَمَدَ يَخْمُدُ خَمُودًا it's the same word that we use if we talk about the flames dying down of a fire. Khamadat al-nar. Sakana lahubaha. Is that you say that the fire's flames died down. I mean, they weren't of the same intensity, but that they were still hot coals that where the fire was. It's the same word that we use when we talk about someone who is sick. Khamadat maril. That you use this word that either you would translate that is, is that he fell unconscious or that they died. And so the idea here is, is that the life that was in them was taken from them. And this is a very eloquent word if you can imagine, right, that there being a fire and then all of a sudden that the flame no longer being part of that fire. Their bodies were there, but because they became lifeless, as a, they became lifeless as a result of their souls being taken. And that Ibn Ajiba al Hassani that he mentions in his Ishara, a meaning that generalizes this. This particular incident happened to these people who denied those apostles or messengers and that treated that man in the way that they did. But he, he gives it a general application. He says, كل وعيد ورد في مكذب الرسل is that every warning that comes in the Quran in relation to those who deny the messengers يجر ذيله عن مكذب الأولياء is that it also relates to those who treat the awliya in the same way لنهم خلف الأنبياء because they are the inheritors they are the representatives of the Prophets. Illa, except there's a difference. 
أن أقوبة مؤذي الأولياء تارة تكون ظاهرة is that those that harm the awliya is that sometimes their punishment is outward فل أبدان والأموال it could be a physical ailment that they are afflicted with or it could be in their wealth وطارة باطنة but sometimes their affliction is that internally في قسوة القلب والتعويك عن صادر الأعمال it could be like that they're afflicted with hardness of heart or they're prevented from doing deeds of righteousness أو وكسف نور الإيمان والإسلام or that the light of their Iman and their Islam could be eclipsed والبعد وسوء الختام they could be distanced and that have a that bad seal نسأل السلام والعافية which that having bad adab with the awliya is one of the great ways is that we can um, that bring about a surah khatima for ourselves may Allah ta'ala protect us now someone might say is that why do we even talk about these things because in my daily life I don't ever really see the awliya so I don't that know that how am I even going to be in a position where that this even happens to me uh, no um, that this is important for us to know because is that we hear about different types of people all the time. And what's important is that if you don't understand something that's happening, unless it's something blatantly wrong in the religion, is that it's safer for you to have a good opinion. And what we need to know is to how to have a good opinion and when to have a good opinion. But unfortunately, we put things in the improper place at times. But the reality is, is that, that showing enmity towards one of the awliya of Allah, it's one of the two people that Allah wages war against. The one who deals with interest and the one who wage, the one who shows enmity towards one of his awliya. And there's different ways that this is done. But if someone does that, this is one of the quickest ways of all to be afflicted. Whereas the foundational position we should all have is that we love the awliya. We should all have a love for the awliya. And that we are required through the Qur'an to believe that the awliya can have karamat, that they can have breakings of norms on their hands. Because this has come in the Qur'an. You're not required to believe a specific saintly miracle of a specific wali. But that the idea that the awliya can have karamat, you must believe in that. Why? Because we see in the Quran what happened to Sayyidatim Maryam and that, that is from that a, that is a karama is the fact that she had fruits that out of season during the opposite season and that the story of the Prophet Solomon السلام, and the one who brought him the throne of Bilqis the sleepers of the cave the Ashab al-Kahf and remaining in the cave for that extended period of time and so forth and so on is that we know through the Qur'an that the awliya can have breakings of the norms happen at their hands. And this is why we have to that understand that we put everything in its proper place in relation to our deen. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the 30th verse, Ya hasratin ala al-ibad, ma yatihi min rasulin illa kanu bihi yastahzi'oon. Alas for the servants, Whenever a messenger comes to them, they ridicule him. And this word alas in English is not a word we might know readily, but it does do a good job of conveying this meaning. Ya hasratan al ibad. Alas. Alas in English is an expression of grief, an expression of pity or concern. And that's really what this this expression in Arabic is about Ya Hasratan al Ibad. And the word Hasra in Arabic is similar to the word Nadam. Nadam our Prophet said and Nadam and Toba. That Toba is repentance, meaning the essence of Toba is about repenting and having that state whereby which that we have remorse. Uh, we have remorse for what it is that we did. So, hasra is a type of remorse, but it's intense remorse. And it's remorse that comes to someone that based upon that something that they've done or something that they've missed. 
And as a result, is that they have, and this is why it's linguistically related to the word hasir, which is to be wearied out and tired, is that they have experienced so much grief and remorse from something that they did or something that they missed, is that it has tired them out, is that they become hasir. So that it's this extreme grief, pity, and pity. And then if you see here that in the Arabic you're calling, that, that the ya here is what you use to call. So if you say, ya zafaru, Dr. Zafaru, that it's the word that I would, the, the particle that I'd use to call you if someone is on the other side of the room. Ya Abu Bakr, if he's on the other side of the room, if I'm calling Abu Bakr. And um, that here is that you don't normally think of calling hasra, which is how are you going to call hasra, which is again this remorse or this intense remorse or grief. And it's a that way in Arabic of saying that it's as if they are saying by this that these things that aren't aren't don't aren't that um, that don't have an intellect. It's as you as as if that you are. That speaking of it in a way where you're saying is that oh hasra that be present because now here it's your time and so again it's just a way of that indicating the state of grief and the state of intense remorse ya hasratan adad ibad and that the scholars have two opinions about who is actually saying this. Is this Allah Ta'ala saying this in relation to the servants, what will happen to them on the Day of Judgment as a result of their that, uh, denying the believers, uh, denying the messengers, or is it it's those who themselves have fallen into that? Are they the ones saying it um, as a result of their lack of belief? That both opinions that the scholars mention. And then that what was the reason that they have this grief and what it was the reason they have this intense remorse? Whenever a messenger comes to them, they ridicule him. So it's one thing not to believe, and that's a terrible thing, but it's another thing to ridicule. And that's very, very problematic. Allah Ta'ala says, that فَاسْتَعْ بِمَا تُؤْمُرُ وَعَلَدْ عَنِ الْمُشْرِكِينَ That he addresses the Prophet, so proclaim openly what you've been commanded to say and ignore the polytheists. إِنَّا كَفَيْنَاكَ الْمُسْتَهْزِئِينَ Indeed, that we have sufficed you against all of those who ridicule you, who ridicule your message. And then Allah Ta'ala that further describes them. أَلَّذِينَ يَجْعَلُونَ مَا اللَّهِ إِلَىٰ آخَرَ فَسَوْفَ يَعْلَمُونَ who set up another God besides Allah, they will come to know. And then Allah Ta'ala brings solace to the Prophet We are well aware that your heart is weighed down by what they say. That glorify the praises of your Lord and be amongst those who prostrate. Worship your Lord until that death, certainty comes to you. And that's amazing. Because think about all of the people that are poking fun, mocking, ridiculing religious people, and especially the people that are Muslim. And this is happening all throughout the world. This is a one of our, the, it's increasing in our time in general, but the Muslims are at the brunt of this more than other people, it seems to be the case. And that this is the Quranic response to how we're supposed to deal with these situations. And our Prophet was commanded to speak openly about what it is that this is. This was the command that came to him that was now the stage that started where he had to openly convey the da'wah. Because the first stage he was commanded to do it secretly. And now he was commanded to do it openly. And just turn away, Allah says from the mushrikeen. We have sufficed you from the mustahzi'een. 
the ridiculers, the mockers. And that Allah Himself will take care of that. Without you even having to do anything, without you even having to that make dua against them. And despite that, the Prophet had so much concern for his people, he wanted them to accept the message. And this is what happened to a Sadr, which was as vast as it could possibly be. It was expansive as it could possibly be, but and the Yadiq is that your your heart becomes weighed down. It could becomes constricted. Right? Because of what it is that they're saying. Not because of him in and of itself, just for him, but because that he realizes that they're denying what he brought, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? He is going to get their own selves in trouble. But what is the response then? What did Allah Ta'ala command the Prophet to do? And he directed him towards him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Glorify the praises of your Lord. And be from those who prostrate to him. Amazing. Is that preoccupy yourself with the worship of Allah? Focus on your submission to Allah. Prostrate before him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is our main response. Because sometimes people become so preoccupied with what other people are saying, they forget the whole purpose of life. They forget what it is that they're really supposed to be doing. You are going to be bothered by that. If you're not bothered by it, something's wrong with you. You are going to be bothered by it. But we can't let our being bothered by it cause us to only have an outward response where we're trying to eliminate the means of it. Do what you can outwardly. It's not denying either doing what you can outwardly. Do what you can outwardly. Take the means. However, the focus is to preoccupy ourselves in what we should be doing, which is worshiping our Lord, glorifying the praises of our Lord, in being from those who prostrate to Him. And then look at the beauty. Not just, because this is early on. This is early on. After the Prophet received revelation. But from now until the day we die. وَعْبُرْ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَقَ الْيَقِينَ Here's the hatta, the heart of Ghaya. Worship your Lord until certainty comes to you, i.e. death. Meaning, remain like that. No matter what anyone does, no matter what anyone says, no matter what it is that you face through all difficulties and through all adversity, turn to Allah, worship Allah, submit to Allah, establish your servitude to Him, and worship Him until the day that you meet Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu Akbar. And that is the way that we respond. And Allah Himself, inna kifaynaka al-mustahzi'een, Allah Ta'ala will take it upon Himself to deal with them. And the scholars differ about who those mustahzi'een are. Some of them say, is that they were the five, Al-Wali ibn Mughira, Al-Aas ibn Wa'il, Wa'adi ibn Qais, with Aswad ibn Abdul Muttarab, with Aswad ibn Abdi Yaghuth. And um, that others say is that they were those that were that died in the battle of Badr, like Abu Jahl and Utba and Shayba and Umayy ibn Khalaf and Uqba. Uh, and that the first opinion is more correct uh, because is that this was an early ayah. So it relates to those that he was sufficed to them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the early Meccan period. And that there's narrations in the books that talk about certain punishments that each one received as a result of their ridiculing Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is a very, very dangerous thing. And it's one thing, again, to just not believe which again is not something that is desirable, but to go to the extent where you are poking fun and mocking, that is a very dangerous, very dangerous state to be in. And why is it so dangerous? Because that when you mock a messenger, it is as if that you are mocking the one who sent that messenger. And then finally we will close with the uh, ishara of Ibn Ajiba about this verse, is that he gives a spiritual meaning to it as well. Ya hasratan ala al-ibad is that uh, grief, oh, what grief there is to the servants. Ma min da'in yad'u ilallah is that no, that caller 
who is calling to Allah will come to them, who is calling them to that better their character. So again, this applies as well to that later times. People that are calling to the deen, people are calling to a higher realization of the deen. And that if they don't respond to that call, is that it's likely that they're going to remain in their state of ignorance that veiled and not achieve their human potential. And so it applies at later times as well. And that these archetypes is that what we're being taught here in the Quran, right now as we speak for those in our time, is that we need to be very careful of these tendencies. And we need to guard our heart against these stories of the people who came before us and the traits that they had. And the purpose of this is not just so that we can that hear about people being destroyed previously. It's so you and I can learn the lesson. It's not just so that we can that lambast previous communities that denied messages. It's so that you and I can save ourselves from having these same tendencies. And so when we read this and we learn about this, this is the number one thing that you and I must do, is to look at our own selves. What is my state of heart? Am I a person that makes fun of, pokes fun at, mocks, ridicules other people? We should never do that in general. And it's actually one of the maharam al lisan. It's actually one of the sins of the tongue. And that we should that instill in our children from the earliest ages is that this is something that is inappropriate. Just because the way that someone looks, or the way that someone dresses, or the way that someone speaks, and all these types of things, is that you have to be very, very careful with this. Because if you do that in general, it's sinful. But if you do that with the wrong person, you might get tried. That there could be an elderly lady who just moved to the country in which you live, that doesn't speak the language of the people that fluently. They could speak with an accent. And then you make fun of that person and they're from the Olia. And you know what? Boom! You're tried with something. And you messed with the wrong person. May Allah Ta'ala protect us. Mm -hmm. And that not have these lower qualities is that we want to have lofty qualities. Why are we being preoccupied with other people to begin with? That's the whole problem. We should be preoccupying ourselves with the remembrance of Allah. We should be preoccupying ourselves with high things. But if you're not going to attain the ma'ali umur, the lofty things, at least don't fall into the things that's going to that lead you to get yourself in trouble. Right, let's at least just do things that are permissible. There's plenty of things that we can still do that are permissible if you're not going to have the aspiration to do the higher things. At least do the permissible. There's plenty of things that are permissible. Talk about a basketball game or some type of sports game or something like that. Just talk about something permissible. You don't have to talk about that fall into something that would be impermissible. But we should be people that are, are people of purpose, who are lofty, and that people don't realize how destructive these tendencies are. So this is there for you and I to implement and to bring in our lives. And we should really think about that to what degree do we actually do this. And that's just what I mentioned now in general. But then, is that how do we view other people as well? How do we view other religious people? How do we view other teachers? How do we view that, um, that people that we hear that they are very righteous, and that there's various degrees after that of seriousness, of that poking fun, mocking, or ridiculing. May Allah Ta'ala protect us from these, and Alhamdulillah, that we've been given the Qur'an so that we can protect ourselves from it, and so that we can learn what it is that we should be doing. May Allah Ta'ala preoccupy us with good, and may Allah Ta'ala that adorn our tongue, tongues with His remembrance. And may we constantly move from that which is good to that which is better until the day that we meet him subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah ta'ala that bless us to put this verse into practice. May we worship our Lord until we take our last breath, until we meet our Lord, until we die. Death which we are absolute certainty of, may we prepare for it. And we all die with a kama husn khatima. Wa sallallahu ala seedin Muhammadan wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen.
Bismillah ve salatu ve selam ala Resulillah ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve men vala. We have reached uh, verse 31 in our session on Surat Yasin. And previously that we looked at the verses of Allah Ta'ala Ya hasratan adil ibadi ma yatihim min rasulina kanu bihi mustahzi yastahzi'un Alam yarau kam ahlakna qablahum min al-qurun annahum ilayhim la yarji'un Wa in kullun lamma jami'un ladayna muhdurun Um so um actually what we uh, we actually that uh, started from that وَمَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَى قَوْمِهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مِنْ جُنْدِ مِنْ السَّمَاءِ وَمَا كُنَّ مُنْزِينَ إِنْ كَانَتْ إِلَّا سَيْحَةً وَاحِدَةً فَإِذْ هَمْ خَامِدُونَ يَا حَصْرَةً عَلَى الْإِبَادِ مَا يَتِيمُ الْرَسُولِ لَكَانُوا بِهِ يَسْتَهْزِئُونَ So verses 28, 29, and 30. And today that we will start verse 31 بإذن الله تعالى. And so that verse 28 translates, After him we did not send any army from heaven against his people, nor were we about to. It was but one cry, and they fell down lifeless. Alas, for the servants, whenever a messenger comes to them, they ridicule him. So then in verse number 31, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains the state of the awwaleen, the people that came before. And this is why it's very important when we understand the history that appears in the Qur'an, it is sacred history. And the difference between sacred history and that normal history, or if you will, just standard history that we tend to study, is that sacred history, there's meanings that we learn from it. And when it comes to those that are that beloved to Allah, there is emulation involved, we want to be like them. And when it comes to those who that disbelieve, for instance, that we want to avoid it. So sacred history is there to teach us lessons. Whereas many people just study history for the sake of knowing, just to study some type of phenomenon, or this happened or that happened. That sacred history is different because there are lessons of the past that we learn that so that we can in the moment that figure out what is what we can do. And so Allah Ta'ala says in verse number 31, أَلَمْ يَرَوْ كَمْ أَهْلَكْنَا قَبْلَهُمْ مِنِ الْقُرُونِ أَنَّهُمْ إِلَيْهِمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ Do they not see how many generations we have destroyed before them? None of them whom will ever come back to them. And so, what we learn from this verse is that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is clarifying to us the, the state of the people who came before us. And that first and foremost is that this is addressing the people of Mecca who are the ones that said to the Prophet Sallallahu that you are not, you have not been sent. And so it is put in the form of a question that is indicating that this is something that we must know. Do they not see how many generations? And that we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that there are people that He punished and He destroyed people that came before. The people of Ad, the people of even before him, Nuh, the people of Thamud, the people of Lut, Ahl Madian, Pharaoh and his army. There are people who came before. And as a result of their denying and belying the messengers, is that they had a punishment here in this world, let alone in relation to that the next world. And the way that Allah Ta'ala says this, Alam Yaro, do they not see? Even though that you could use this word see for other than actually your physical eye. And that yes, seeing, yes, you see with your physical eye, but also that seeing could come from thinking about something. And that this is what is called a ru'ya fikriya a type of mental type of seeing that comes from knowledge that we have of the past. It's as if that we are seeing the past through this process of study. In other words, the knowledge that, that comes to the surface as a result of that study gives us the clarity of sight about what actually happened. And this is something that we know. 
that there have been people of the past who have been destroyed. Alam yaro kam ahnakna qabla min al-quruni. Do they not see how many generations we have bestowed, destroyed before them? And that this is also to that teach us is that um, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, uh, that the people that did come before is that these are not people that are just going to be left based upon what they did here in this world. There's going to be consequences for what happens to them even in the next world. And so none of them will ever come back to them. In other words, is that they're not going to be able to hear what it is that they said happened to them after they returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse number 32 wants to, indi- to indicate to us the existence of Hisab and Iqab, which is the reckoning and that will take place in the next world and the potential punishment that even happens after this world. In verse 32, وَإِن كُلُّ لَمَّا جَمِيعٌ لَدَيْنَا مُحْضُرُونَ Yet all of them will be brought before us. Yet all of them will be brought before us. And when we study these verses, is that sometimes the meanings are fairly easy to understand. And what it really is about is this process of what you call emotional affectation whereby which every verse that you read is that you want to bring about or have brought about within yourself the correct emotional response to that verse. And for instance, when we that hear verses that relate to Allah wa ta'ala destroying people, that we should that bring to mind the majestic attributes of Allah. And then the emotion that should rise to the heart is one of fear. And trepidation that this could happen to us and so far from getting caught up and wondering why would Allah destroy people and so forth the point is is that how we respond to these verses when we hear these verses about people being destroyed they should bring about fear and instill fear in our hearts and when we hear for instance like in verse 32 yet all of them will be brought before us that reflection requires us to actually imagine that. Imagine our soul being taken and we are being brought forth. What is used here is muhdaron. Hudur is presence. But if you put it in verbal form, ahdara yuhdiru is to make someone present. And if someone is muhdar, they've made to be present. And here, that muhdaron is in the plural is that all of them, جميعٌ لدينا محضرون, all of them will be brought before us. In other words, they will be driven to us, that قهرًا, that, and that by force, and they have no choice in this, and they will be brought to us, so that we can reckon them, and then that to weigh their deeds, the good and the bad alike, and to end, to that give a judgment towards that each every single one of them. And so that all of the Umm, all of the pre- previous nations that came before us, is that every single one of them will be brought to the Hisab, to the reckoning on the Day of Judgment before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And He will that judge every single person's actions. And this is similar to the words of Allah Ta'ala in Surah Tud. وَإِنَّ كُلَّ النَّمَّا لَيُعْفِيَنَّهُمْ رَبُّكَ عَمَالُهُمْ And that translates as, and indeed, that all of them that will be, that um, all of them will be that taken into account by the Lord for their acts. And He will give any every physical person what it is that they deserve. In other words, is that, the consequences here in this world are just one thing. This is where it starts. But the greatest of consequences happen in the next world when we stand before Allah wa ta'ala for the reckoning. And then in verse number 
Allah Ta'ala says, وَآيَةٌ لَهُمُ الْعُبْدُ الْمَيْتِتُ أَحْيَيْنَاهَا وَأَخْرَجْنَا مِنَّا حَبًّا فَمِنْهُ يَأْكُلُونَ There is a sign for them in the lifeless earth, the dead earth. We give it life and we produce grain from it for them to eat. So notice here that Allah Ta'ala was that putting in the form of a question, but for a particular rhetorical purpose, is that do they not see how many generations we have destroyed before them? And then that he mentions after that, yet all of them will be brought before us. And so that the destruction here was in this world and then they were brought before us, and this will happen that in the next world. And then that Allah Ta'ala that wants to give us a sign whereby which that we can come to the conclusion that there is a resurrection. And that he says there is a sign for them in the lifeless dead earth. We give it life and we produce grain from it for them to eat. And that this is a very common uh, Quranic rhetorical device whereby which that we are reminded of the wonders in creation and how they point to the oneness of Allah Ta'ala, that they point to the perfection of Allah Ta'ala and that all of the great attributes of our Lord Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala were called to reflect upon His creation Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and that the result of that reflection is that we come to know certain attributes that He has Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And specifically here, off of the tree, it looks like, and when you first look at it, you can't imagine how something could actually grow again on that leafless tree or on that, that piece of land that has nothing on it. And that then all of a sudden spring comes and the weather starts to get a little bit warmer and everything is prepared, the leaves start to come back upon the trees, is that the flowers start to go out, come out, and that as you plant the seeds shortly that after, is that things start to grow again in that barren earth. And these are signs. Just as those things appeared dead, but were brought back to life in that sense, likewise, the one who caused that to happen can, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that as he wills, cause human beings to also be resurrected. And so this is here for us to that think about the, all of these manifestations that we see here in the world of death and how that they are then turned to life can point to Allah Ta'ala's that ability and He's all-powerful subhanahu wa ta'ala to that create a resurrection and to bring that all human beings who died back to life. And so that so that giving life to this dead earth and we produce grain from it for them to eat and grain of all different sorts whether that's barley or whether that's wheat or whatever it is corn grain of all different sorts Allah Ta'ala brings it forth from the earth subhanahu wa ta'ala and so that this is a clear indication of not only his existence but also his that ability, the power that he has to bring about the resurrection subhanahu wa ta'ala but it requires us to reflect. If we just look at it and we just think that oh it's just something that is happening, this is just the way it is, is that we'll be cut off from that potential meaning. But by witnessing this it indicates to us because everything ultimately is a manifestation of one of the names and attributes of Allah Ta'ala that every act is ultimately an act of God from the standpoint of reality subhanahu wa ta'ala and Imam Fakhrin al-Razi that indicates to us that by form of a question that how does that this relate to the verses that came before and he says that it relates to the, relates to the verses that came before in two ways that one that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَإِن كُلُّ لَمَّا جَمِيعٌ لَدَيْنَا مُحْضِرُونَ Yet all of them will be brought before us. كَانَ ذَلِكَ إِشَارَةً إِلَى الْحَشْرَ This indicates the resurrection. فَذَكَرَ مَا يَضُلُّ عَلَى مِكَانِهِ قَطْعًا لِلْإِنْكَارِهِمْ As it indicates that that meaning, if we reflect upon it, which would indicate to us Allah's ability to that resurrect people. And um, 
that the second aspect of this is, is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the state of the Mursaleen, of the messengers, and that the destruction of those who deny them, is that, وَكَانَ الشُّغُلُ ذَكَرَ مَا يَدُلُ عَلَيْهِ And that this matter was ultimately a matter of that belief in the divine unity, is that he indicated what indicates it. And he began with what was close to them, which was this earth. And so that they're here on the earth, and so I give them an example of here on earth and witnessing that what took place before them should indicate to them attributes of Allah wa ta'ala that would that help them come to that the right conclusion. But this is the nature of disbelief, is that things are covered up. He also points out a another very interesting point that he says here that the earth is ultimately a sign for everyone. And so why does Allah Ta'ala say, Wa ayatun lahum, there is a sign for them, meaning those who that denied the truth. But the earth is really a sign for everyone. And this is really a spiritual point that he points out. Why would Allah Ta'ala specify that it's a sign for them? He says, is that because, is that whoever that knows something, as he says here, that وَأَمَّا مَنْ عَرَفَ الشَّيْءِ بِالطَّرِيكَ الرُّؤْيَةِ لَا يُذْكُرُ لَهُ دَلِيلٌ Whoever knows someone by the path of witnessing, is that they're not in need of a proof of it. So, for instance, the sun, if you're looking at the sun, and you don't have to have anyone prove to you when you see the sun right before your eyes that the sun is actually shining. shining. But what he means here is that a spiritual ru'ya, of having that a strong faith at the level of the heart and seeing with the eye of the heart. Because he says that the Prophet and the righteous servants of Allah they knew Allah before knowing the earth and the heavens. That the earth itself is that not going to that take them to a knowledge of Allah. Because they are knew Allah before the earth. The vast majority of people that do as was mentioned come to know the attributes of Allah through what He has in His creation, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says, and this is like Allah Ta'ala says, so ayatina fil afaqi wa fi we shall surely show them our signs in the horizons and in their own selves, hatta yatabayina lahum and nuhul haq, until it becomes clear to them that this is truth. And then the verses that hit another verse, Awana Nikfi Birabika and Nuala Kudishin Shaheed. And so the whole point here is is that um, that um, this is a subtle indication of this elect group of creation, is that their knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is so strong is that when that is that they see everything that He's created, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that they see it in the way that it's supposed to be seen, as opposed to that having what it is that they see indicate to them the existence of Allah. And there's no doubt that the former is is higher. And then Allah Ta'ala says in verse number 34, We have put gardens of date palms and grapes in the earth, and we have made springs of water gush out of it. So that Allah Ta'ala is describing now that what happens when He subhanahu wa ta'ala brings this earth back to life. And that after the grain that comes forth for it for people to eat. He also puts gardens of date palms and grapes in the earth. And he's made springs of water gush out of it. And um, the reason that uh, Allah, he mentions here date palms and grapevines is that these were the two most precious fruits in the Arabian Peninsula. And that can also that point to all other that point all other that uh, that forms of plant life whereby which is it we are provided for and um, this word ja'ala in the Arabic language is 
uh, very similar to khalaqa, uh, which is to, to create. And he, we translate it here, we have put, but it's similar to the word create. And so Allah Ta'ala has that given us these things here in this earth. And if you really think about it, that think about the blessing of these two fruits, dates and grapes, and everything that, is that you can do with them, and all of their different states, and that you could eat grapes fresh, or is that you could that dry them, and all of the benefits from them, and how they, they can store for a that be stored for a long period of time, and that you just think about the sweetness of these fruits, and that everything it is that they can be used for as well, and that how also is that uh, tamar is even though it's on one hand a fruit, but it's also a type of qut. It's also a type of staple food. And there were times not too long ago that uh, in some of the places that we studied where this was actually what people would get as a wage. They would get their wage in dates. And the staple food that would primarily be uh, bread and dates. That, that's what they would eat that on, on, on many occasions. And then Allah Ta'ala says, لِيَأْكُرُوا مِنْ ثَمْرِهِ وَمَا أَمِنَتُوا أَيْدِيهِمْ أَفَلَا يَشْكُرُونَ So that they could eat its fruit. It was not their own hands that made all this. How then can they not give thanks? So that Allah Ta'ala is that reminding His servants is that He brought these into existence here on earth. And He brought the earth to life and put gardens on it and all different types of trees and bushes that have all different types of plants like that date palms and that um, grape bushes and others. And he subhanahu wa ta'ala has that given us rivers that whereby which that we get water and all of these blessings ultimately is that so that they could eat its fruit and that it was not their hands that made all of this even though outwardly that they're farming and all of that and to doing everything it is that by the way of means for these things to be harvested, the reality is it's from Allah Jalla Jalla. And this is why it's one of the greatest ways to earn a living is agricultural. They actually mention this in the books of Fiqh. It's one of the greatest ways to that earn a living. And there are, were many of the righteous people before us uh, that well beyond the prophetic period that were farmers and many of them were also great scholars but even Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab for instance was a farmer this is a very noble profession and a very noble way to learn to earn money and again like most things in the modern world when it becomes overcomplicated and all of the problems that have arisen from these mega farms and the whole food industry and so forth is an issue nevertheless is that this remains one of the great ways too that earn a living and all of the blessings that come through it by being close to the earth and living close to the earth and seeing the signs of Allah Ta'ala and learning all of these traits that you will naturally learn when you till the earth and care for it and you that grow things and then you harvest them and everything that needs to be there in terms of your that character in order to do that in that can, a way that is consistent um, there's a lot that you learn from it and so, is that so that they could eat uh, its fruit? It was not their hands that made all this. But still, even with all of that human effort, that ultimately, if it were not to be for Allah Ta'ala, they would not be able to eat any of that fruit. None of it would actually grow. And it wouldn't be in existence to begin with. And then, How can they not give thanks? How could we not give thanks? And there's something about a state of heart of kufr that closes the door of true gratitude. How could we not give thanks for everything that is that we have? But the problem is if we live in a time where the average grocery store houses 47,000 products and, and 80,000 square feet, and this is not even getting into the larger stores, and yes, some people shop in smaller ones, you know, but that this is very common to find grocery stores this large and with all the different produce looking that 
almost too good on that shelf and that all the different choices that we have, it's very easy to forget the blessings that we have. Very easy. How can they not give thanks? When we have all of these blessings and we see all of this happen, that our response should be a response of giving thanks and showing true gratitude to Allah. But, the pitfall of blessings is getting used to them, is becoming too accustomed to them. It becomes a pitfall. And sometimes we get deceived because that we're unable to truly that remind ourselves and to be aware of where these blessings are from. And these blessings should take us uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one of the great ways is that we can come to love Allah. Ahibbullah lima yaghdukum bihi min ni'amah. Love Allah for that which He provides you from His blessings. So just think about the blessings upon you in particular, that all the different types of food that we have to eat. And we should give thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. And by giving thanks and recognizing those blessings, how could you not love Allah who has that given you all of these blessed things? That this is indeed one of the great ways that we can come to love Him. And this is why we have to be very, very careful, all of us. And we've said this before, but we always remind ourselves to open up the food pantry and to say, there's no food. To open up the food pantry and to say, oh, there's, there's no food here. Uh, mommy, daddy, that we need food. And sometimes it's not the kids who do it. Sometimes it's adults who will complain, the husband to his wife or the wife to her husband, there's no food. And no food means, like in the story of the Prophet ﷺ about ithar, is that when a man from the Ansar came to the Prophet ﷺ, uh, excuse me, he had a guest come to him, and the, he, he, this man was in need, and the Prophet wanted to help him and serve him some food. So the house he was staying in that night, he asked his wife that if they had any food. And there was no food in the house. All they had was water. So he sent a message to all of his other households, and every single one of them came back with the same response. There is not any food in the house. So we're not talking about not food that our nafs doesn't need. We're not talking about not having potato chips or snacks or sweets or desserts or anything like that. There was no food in the house, in any of the houses. All they had was water. Imagine going to sleep at night and literally having nothing in your house, nothing except water. That's unimaginable for us. If we think about that, this has a different meaning. How can they not give thanks? How can they not give thanks? That is truly not having anything. And then the Prophet ﷺ that sent, asked if there was anyone that would uh, take care of this man. And a man from the Ansar said, I will, Ya Rasulullah. So he takes him back to the house. And just to show you how widespread this phenomenon was, he asked his wife if they have anything at home. And she says, there's just enough food for the kids. So he says, put the kids to sleep. Just try to find a way to get to put them to sleep. And then prepare the food. And so she found a way to put the kids to sleep. Imagine if our kids had to go to sleep without dinner. No dinner. And keep in mind, that they're, they're not snacking all day. The last time they would have eaten would have been morning time, likely. So not having any food. And then not having multiple types of food. Very simple food on top of all of that. And then having to sleep without dinner. And so she puts the kids to sleep, and then the man says to his wife, there's not enough food, ex really, except for our guest. So when we start to eat, turn the lamp off so it's dark in the room, and just pretend like you're eating. So they that serve the food, they turn the lamp off, and um, the husband and wife pretend like they're eating, so their guest can take his fill. And so he finishes the food. And they went to sleep without food. And then the next morning, that Allah Ta'ala, that uh, the Prophet him, that came out to them and said, that your Lord is amazed at what you did last night. Ajiba rabbuk. And the meaning of ajiba here 
is contentment. He is content with what you did. And the verse was revealed that And they prefer others over their own selves, even if they be in absolute need. It's the highest degree of generosity. It's one thing to give charity. It's one thing to give that charity when you don't really have a lot of money. But it's another thing to that prefer others over your own self. But it's yet another thing to prefer others over your own self even when you are actually in need, in absolute need. And they used to mention that when in uh, that there would be times during the com- times of the, the of, uh, of the companions where someone would gift, make a dish and gift it to their neighbor. So they'd make like a nice dish and gift it to their neighbor. And then that neighbor would actually think about other people. Maybe someone else needs this more than me and gift it to another neighbor and to another neighbor until they mentioned that to nine different people and then it actually came back to the one who first gave it. So if that happened in our time, People would be like, oh, what, they didn't like my cooking? What, did I did not do something right? These people were preferring others over their own selves. So it wasn't just, here's a gift, I'm going to dig in and eat. They actually thought before they ate, hmm, does someone need this more than me? And so then they gifted it to their neighbor. Does someone need this more than me? Then they gifted it to their neighbor. Until it, nine people it went to, until it came back to the original person. And this is the way they were. This is why that this is that as close to an ideal society as you're going to have here on planet Earth. And the mistakes of the companions are there for us to know what to do when people make mistakes. But we believe that all the companions have received the contentment of Allah Jalla Jalalu. Afala Yashkurun. How can they not give thanks? We have to give thanks to Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala for what it is that we have. And then that after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that commanded us to have shukr and that part of shukr is that to have ibadah and that then he that tells us subhanahu wa ta'ala after that is that that we need to be people who that preserve the transcendence of our Lord subhanallah khalaqa al-azwaja kullaha mimma tunbitu al-ardu min anfusihim wa mimma la ya'lamun Glory be to him who created all the pairs of things that the earth produces, as well as themselves and other things they do not know about. And so that when we say, subhanAllah, that this is a kalima of tanziyah, that we are that acknowledging the transcendence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, is that glory be to him, transcendent is he. Is it? We as believers only ascribe what is befitting to our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here, subhanallah, glory be to him who khalaqad azwaja kullaha, who created all the pairs of all things. So this word azwaj, you could translate it as pairs, or you could translate it as asnaf, the different types of things. So either the pairs of things like man, woman, heaven, earth, moon, sun, night, day, or that you could say is that it means the asnaf, the different types of things. Both of those um, are valid uh, uh, understandings of this word azwaj and um, that both really that relate to this verse uh, because Allah Ta'ala says that, that the earth produces, as well as themselves and other things, they do not know about. So Allah Ta'ala that created all the different types of things that the earth produces, trees and all the different types of trees and all the different types of fruits and all the different types of foliage and everything of that nature and all the different tastes that each of them have and all the different scents that they all have and the way that they look and all the different leaves and trees and how the different trees look and the different blossoms on all of them and some of them are fruit bearing others are not all of these different that types of things that we see coming from the earth this is all from Allah and the amazing thing is, is that all of them require water. And so water is a single entity. It comes down to the earth 
And then all of these things come from water. And that all multiplicity ultimately comes from Tawheed. And all numbers essentially get back to one and are a that collection of a series of ones. Seven is one seven times. 1,313 is that 1,313 ones added together ultimately. Everything gets back to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah khalaqa al-azwaja kullaha mimma tunbitu al-ardu wa min anfusihim as well as themselves. As well as themselves. Is that, that the that male female pair is one of the that greatest archetypal pairs is that we find and that there are many others and um, that we learn through our knowledge of the pairs a number of meanings and there is deep wisdom in it that one of them being is that everything ultimately in Allah Ta'ala's creation points to his oneness is that everything indicates his oneness subhanahu wa ta'ala and that this is the foundation of all belief the belief in Tawheed and we also know in another verse and he creates that which you don't know there are things that we that Allah Ta'ala has created that none of us will ever 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 know and no matter how much we discover in science and there's nothing wrong with discovering things this is actually a good thing it should strengthen our Iman what we will come to know will never be other than the tiniest, tiniest fraction of what there is to know from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. And then in closing, the ishara that is mentioned and the Bahr al-Madid by Sidi Ahmed ibn Ajiba, he says, You can that say that instead of the physical earth, that is also relates to the nafs, is that when it's dead, through ignorance, Allah Ta'ala can bring it to life with knowledge. And that we bring forth from it that knowledge that comes from our presence. And it is that from that knowledge is that the hearts and the spirits find provision. And that we that place for him then the gardens of Gnosis. From the palm trees of spiritualities and the grapes of that the sacred law. And that we cause to pour forth from there the springs of wisdom. So he can eat from its fruits. And that which their hands have that um, uh, that have made. This relates to the spiritual struggle that they put in and because it get, produces that this spiritual witnessing subhanallah and so that these pairs and types also that we could speak of them in relation to the spiritual states, the ahwal, the stations, the maqamat, the ulum and the ma'arif, and everything of this nature that the scholars of this science do discuss. And there are that many different levels of meaning in the Qur'an. Every verse has an outward meaning, an inward meaning, a limit, and a rising point or a vantage point. And so the Qur'an has different that ways that we can understand it. But access to the inner meanings are always through the outward meanings. And one of the um, prerequisites of a tafsir ishari is that the interpretation does not contradict the outward meaning for it to be valid. And Allah wa ta'ala that uh, make these meanings that alive in our hearts and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq in all of our different affairs and that may He benefit us through the wise Qur'an, benefit us through Surah Yaseen especially in this blessed month of Ramadan. May Allah Ta'ala accept from all of us. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.